Wolf Stories Part 1 The Cabin It wasn't that she expected to be known by all the bank's employees. It was just that she had been lovely once and had never really believed that time would make her faceless. Dennis Johnson, Angels. The wonder, whether you liked it or not, was the choppy surfaces of lakes and the mounds of fire ants and the wild peacocks in the trees. The miracle was the hunger of wild dogs and availability and vulnerability of sheep. Louis Norton, the Sin Eater. They started early though not as early as planned. As always, they tried to let things go, this idea of a certain time, of being ready, the tendency to put things off, balling up at the end like a twine. For all their thoughts of relaxing, of simplifying, for the graceful ease with which they imagined they could slide into this state, it wasn't to be. They were vague, but disappointing implications of being heavied with concerns, with maintenance, with objects. Bob and Helen had recently retired. That is, they had recently made it official. Helen had done it first, several years ago. But it didn't seem real until Bob jumped in too. It did not seem like a thing. It was strange, this choice this retirement, as if one could now enter a period of leisure without care. The concept was, like many things, universally attractive, but at its core confusing, relative, disorienting. They decided last week to go to their cabin today. It was near, about two hours away, but it felt to them different. It felt away. Helen had this European vision of herself rising, running a brush through her hair, boiling coffee, eating nothing but a poached egg or a small wedge of artisan toast. In this vision, she was smiling, warmed and energized by the morning. This did not happen today. There was fatigue, busy work, too little sleep in a conference with Celeste, who trotted over from next door for breakfast, during which Helen somehow ate eight slices of bacon and three slices of toast that were heavily, haphazardly buttered. It gathered in errant pools on the plate. Helen drank some sugared coffee that made her eyes dry and the rest of her feel jumpy and sick. Bob paced through the hall and into the garage while she pointed out to Celeste the container succulents, the bird feeder, the loose spot in the fence where sometimes, at dawn, rabbits appeared. They would push through like little ghosts and sniff about, looking for a garden. Bob kept to himself these mornings and Helen preferred to stay out of his way. He got disorganized and gruff, and it put her off. They'd been married a long time. She knew how things would go. She had things she had to do, and so did Bob. If they didn't overthink it, each thing got done. But if she didn't keep some distance between them during these final hours before taking a trip, he would start to bark questions at her about what had been done, about what hadn't. He would start to suggest additional things to do before they left the house, things that in the past weeks hadn't warranted priority attention, but that now, when they were taxed, anxious to depart, had assumed a greater urgency. A short while later, the town thinned behind them. They took two cars, as Bob liked to go out fishing early and did not like the idea of Helen being stranded at the cabin alone. The buildings grew flatter, 
and more square. Cars with soapy windshield paint were lined up under bright plastic flags, like a string of diseased teeth. They passed a local technical school with its ambitious metal sculpture out front. It was almost Olympic. A man reached painfully, ecstatically, for the sky. Helen forced herself off the invention of forgotten items, of power sources still connected. She had a checklist she confronted before they left the house, all things accounted for. But the concern with that, of course, is that the checklist itself could fail you, could sink you at sea. The late morning was sunny and clear, with a sheet of chilled wind. Bob had always liked the uphill curve that broke away from town. The stretch demanded extra acceleration. He could almost feel a tough, stringy membrane pulling behind him. The image was this, a gray viscosity snapping, molecules escaping in air. He felt strange these days, floating but also weighted. Helen and himself had noticed, in their own separate ways, how aging weighs you. The body, as always, needs trimming, needs to be slowed down. It would just keep growing, keep puffing out. If you let it, the fat, it would just run and run and run. And at their age, they had doctors to tell them. There were actual health reasons now for slimness, for speed. Helen jokingly pointed out as they got even older, they would begin to eat less anyway, the thinning of the old. The bones got hollow, like flutes. Then the weight breaks down and escapes, she said. We'll be stunning in our leisure cottons. Actually, they were in fine shape. Helen walked like a fiend, manic through parks. Her face ruddied, her hair spiked, she looked crazed when she returned, like she could kill with her hands. Sometimes in the evenings she coerced him to go with her. They passed people in track suits, which they themselves were now wearing. Bob was sheepish to admit how nice it felt being zipped up in one. The lining in his navy blue getup was heaven. And then it actually made him think more athletic thoughts. At least he was uniformed, ready for action. The late morning news on the radio thinned and crackled. Helen heard a story of a mass hatching of skinny, insectoid frogs. She stretched the signal as far as it would go, up over the first two sets of dips and rises. The road then relaxed, flattened, and suddenly a vast pond came visible, sinking with the recent dry weather. It lies shallow, raw, dependent on rain. A stumpy butte sat underneath the horizon. Sometimes, just before sunset, Helen came out here to drive. She'd put on Schubert and let her mind flood. At those moments, the land was viciously, shockingly beautiful. Antelope peppered the land. The road wound through a few small towns in succession. They passed tackle shops and tiny groceries and the famous Chinese laundry, long vacant but still standing with its leaning porch. Then they climbed a little more, past a rock wall on one side, past Memorial Falls. The cabin was set back from the road through a gate, which was locked. There were other houses here, off this road. Bob and Helen shared a key with the other people. Some they knew, at least by sight, some they didn't. This was a kind of loose decorum, 
as the surrounding fence extended on each side some fifty-odd feet into the trees. There were also other roads on the hills, from the mountain to the Snaking Creek, which led to this one. All the gate really did was keep some traffic off their particular, if not private, stretch of road. It was an illusion of security, important maybe to their property, or the idea of it. They had found the place as part of a materializing idea that they would go in with another couple, Ben Amos and his wife Nan. Bob knew Ben from work, and Helen was appropriately, secondarily friendly with Nan. She liked her, though. Her hair was soft and feathery, the hue of browned butter, and she regularly told off-color jokes. Though Bob and Ben had the real connection, having worked together for years, the four of them talked giddily over whiskeys and rickies. They looked at properties and began to buy skillets and rustic, chunky quilts. Then Bob and Helen waited for them to show more interest, to move the plan along. But there was a lull. Bob said the word around the office was that the two of them, Nan and Ben, were fighting bitterly. Ben didn't miss work, but he showed up slightly discolored, like a bruised fruit. Then, one day, Bob came home and told her that Ben and Nan were getting a divorce. Doesn't that just beat all, he said. Did something happen, she asked him, amazed. Did they... She realized she wanted to say, isn't divorce for younger people? But of course that was ridiculous these days. People started over. Everyone she knew thought about it. There had certainly been times she had felt a longing for it so sharp, so precise, that her heart spun in her chest. And there were always other considerations. Huh, she ended up saying. And although that was not the end of it, in discussion, in either of their private thoughts. That was all she could say, really, because she wasn't close with them. She didn't talk with either of them after that, although she did spot Nan weaving silently among tubers at a farmer's market, a spray of gladiola in her arms. Feeling guilty about her lack of involvement, of concern, Helen ducked away. As they approached the cabin, Helen always felt a gentle, anticipatory anxiety, like a child. Like the feeling she had when she looked into dollhouses. There was always that chance, the ridiculous thought, that you could see something moving inside. So, because of this tendency, she could not say honestly that she knew something was wrong before she actually saw evidence. Bob never had these thoughts, she was sure. He never thought of dollhouses. In fact, probably had seen few, if any, of them in his lifetime. And if he had, it didn't cross his mind that they were creepy, that there was any possible magic in them. He never thought of things scattering at the sound of their car, bunching into closets behind swung doors. Bob pulled in ahead of her, and she maneuvered in behind him, slightly to the side. He had started to get out and was standing, one foot out of the car. What's that? She could hear Bob asking her as she bent over to the passenger side, gathering limp grocery bags filled with small boxes and cans from the mat. They had spread and lost their shape, it had become a joke of containment. She straightened and looked toward the porch. What is it? There, the front window. What's going on there? Does it look strange? The window to the left of the door was darkened slightly. The curtains there were pale and gauzy. She had fashioned them herself and left them extra long so they broke at the floor like foam. She couldn't tell. Was there... Had they been opened? Helen's heart leapt. 
Was someone here? Was it moving? Was it just the way the sun came down through the trees? They moved toward the cabin. Bob strode up the stairs to the porch. She could hear him breathing. She watched him inspect the screen door, then open it. Helen had an urge to back away from the house, to go to the road, wave someone down. She had a frightening, obscene thought like a slap. Suddenly she was afraid there was blood inside or, or shit. She flushed. Why should she think that? It was a visceral, primitive fear. Bob had opened the door and was peering inside. Maybe, she called to him. Her voice sounded far away, automatic. She had no connection to it. Maybe we should look around the outside first. Bob, don't go in yet. He turned his head toward her but didn't look back. You do that. I'm going in. She thought it best they didn't split up. She thought it best that Bob should think so too. But this was not a time for arguing. He was upset, acting on adrenaline. She didn't want to try to reason with him. He pushed into the cabin. His anger was a presence, or the beginnings of it, the seeds of it. But also there was the protective instinct of making noise. The interloper, if not hungry, if timid enough, would flee. Helen moved to the left of the cabin, around the outside of the car. She had to arc out widely because of low, spiky growth. She looked up at the house. Nothing she saw appeared strange or out of place. She went around back. She saw the discolored spot on the second floor where she, in an effort at shortcut, poured a bucket of oil soap out the bedroom window. She had miscalculated, catching the lip of the bucket on the sill. It soaked into the rough-hewn wood underneath, staining it in a ghost shape. She crossed back around toward the front of the house, then to the other side, which appeared even quieter, even more untouched. This side faced away from the drive, so it was actually the part of the house less seen by she and Bob or by anyone else. This gave it a hint of the unknown, the kind that parts of houses you live in for years can still possess. Like one day you notice a corner in the guest room you neglected, a basement cupboard oddly placed. There is always one of these sides, like a person is aware of certain traits and one's self only in a vague, structural way. Even though these sides hold up a great square portion of the structure itself, without it, everything would fail. The windows here looked harder, more artificial. She could plainly see a film of grime on the outer pane. Helen read a book once by a naturalist who put aside the assumption of knowing the backyard. The author went out there as a scientist equipped with magnifiers, sample jars, and a blade. What she found there was shocking in an odd way. Though she was accustomed to seeing this in neutral, wilder environments, in her own she found these tiny, brutal systems even more violent, more fascinating than she expected. As she rounded the front side, Helen caught the rank, salty smell of something rotting in the weeds, some small kill. Bob, she said, and pushed open the door. Everything okay in here? She heard nothing. She called again. Briefly, she thought the house had swallowed him up. The soft furniture was draped with sheets of different colors and patterns. Helen had started hoarding any cloth she could find for a quilting class years ago. She loved the company and the chatter of the ladies, but as a quiltess, she was pitiful and her fingers bled. She saw the tumbling eyelet hem of a stained bluebird print, 
A garish, fitted sheet with palm trees bunching ungracefully around the legs of a stool. Come look at this, Bob called out from the second floor. He had descended halfway down the stairs. He seemed to have quieted, to have sunk into himself. In a strange way, he looked almost romantic. A painting, Bob descending a staircase. She went to him, and he took her hand, leading her. This gesture, the taking of her hand, so tender, so grave, pushed her fully into terror. It must be bad, really, really bad. She braced herself for a shock. A waft of something reached her from him, some scent of oil, the aftershock of anger, a panic perhaps, unleashed through the skin. He led her into the bedroom and stepped to the side, letting go of her hand. That felt odd, as if he dropped her there. Her eyes darted from one side of the room to the other. At first she couldn't see. The seconds stretched. She felt foolish. She wanted to ask him what she was looking for, but felt embarrassed. Was it a trick? Then her breath caught right at the top of her chest, behind an oversized glittering button. The debris was not immediately visible. It began in a small trail in the middle of the room. It actually resembled, on a tiny scale, the swirl of a galaxy, the outer edges blooming out, thinning to unseen. On the other side of the room, which was mostly obscured by the bed, one of the oversized feather pillows was ruptured, torn through. There was a great, in fact impossibly huge, spill of feathers. Most of them were the white of new snow. Some were shades of gray. There was the occasional shocking bit of black. God, who would do this? She stepped over to inspect the husk of the pillow like a shed skin. It was shredded in one long, jagged rip. There were patches, too, bunchy and stiff, where it was subtly stained. Another pillow puffed invitingly on the bed, smooth and untouched. It seemed a random rogue act. This is so... Do you know what to make of this? Bob chuffed. Well, something broke into our house. That's what I make of it. I mean, she said, her voice rising. Is anything missing? Was this a robbery or what? I didn't see anything gone. Did you? She felt tears coming. No. No, that's what I don't understand. Bob sat down on the edge of the bed. The back door is where they came in. It's broken. Well, what should we do? Do you want to stay? I'll call someone. Who? The police, sheriff, whoever we call. Helen flipped helplessly through the blue pages of an old phone book she found in the kitchen. It was curled, dog-eared, encrypted with doodles. The pages were weak and buttery feeling. As she went desperately back and forth, several pages tore jaggedly across the top. Bob circled, phone in hand, still scanning the room for further aberrants. In the end, Bob called 911. He stepped out onto the porch with his tiny phone, head down. His other hand came up to the side of his head as if to stabilize. Helen herself now looked around the living room. She made a motion at pulling the sheets off the couch. Then she hesitated, drew back. She smoothed it down to its original shape. She had a television watcher's aversion to the 
rumpling of a crime scene, if that was what this was. They didn't keep much here, nothing too valuable. There was the television, a large, scraped-up VCR, a few kitchen appliances, space heaters, some coats. Two cheaply acquired snowmobiles layered with webs in the shed. Nothing was touched there. She could see from the kitchen the heavy padlock still attached at the handle like a bell. She looked out at Bob on the porch. They had just recently obtained a cellular phone, and Helen still got a kick out of watching him use it. He got very serious, and his head tilted forward involuntarily. Sometimes he shut his eyes. He looked conspiratorial. She heard pieces of the call. Entering. No. Well, nothing we've noticed so far. What we can see is someone or something broke in and vandalized our house. Helen thought of the word he chose, house. It seemed forced, overly familiar. Also the other word he chose, the odd, overly dramatic something. The visit from the police was lingering and casual. One of the officers was older, with a round face. It looked laid bare, Helen thought, a face that wanted a mustache. It appeared exposed, this face, in need of cover. The other was younger, blonder, with smoother lines. They approached Bob and Helen with a cool mixture of tenderness and suspicion. It felt strangely intimate, like a lover might be. She supposed that they had learned wherever there was trouble, it fanned out in all directions. It changed shape, and that clues to its later forms could be detected in the first few minutes. Bob walked them through the house. There was nodding, some half-hearted writing in a notebook. There was touching, lightly over the damaged pillow, over the broken lock. Helen trailed behind. Helen thought she saw feigned concern there, or a construction of it. The two men pushed their faces into it, flinching nearly, as if in wind. Bob stood tall, rolling his weight into his heels. He fought against the minimization, however slight, of their trial. He stacked boards against the flow of it, causing it to pool. No, he said. Nothing was taken, nothing we found. But that's kind of beside the point. Well, sure. So, the other one said, definitely breaking and entering, definitely vandalism. Well, definitely. Bob felt patronized. He changed speeds. Has this happened to anyone else nearby? Not recently, no. So should we take this, well, personally? Were we picked out? Helen stepped in. Should we be scared? Should we stay here at all? Look, I'd hate to see this disrupt your lives. I know you feel invaded, and there are lots more questions than there are answers, but I think it's over. It appears to be isolated. The chances of them coming back are low. From what I can see here, whoever did this meant you no harm. It could be a drifter. Probably a kid who needed somewhere to sleep for a few nights. Probably had a dog, too. That explains the bedroom. Or just forget about the kid, said the younger one. Helen looked at Bob, who was pursing his lips. His head bobbed gently. What do you mean? she asked. I mean, probably no need for elaborating. This seems fairly obvious. She waited a moment. What does? You know who did this? I'm confused. I thought you said you didn't. The older one thought for a moment. To be honest, I can't see much real proof of a person. Helen made a strange gesture with her hand. It went flat, paddle-like, and sideways. Uh, the door? I mean, the lock was broken, but... I mean, it was opened. You ever seen raccoons? 
I've seen them open buckles, said the younger one. And bears. Well, you'd be surprised. There, Helen stammered, trying to wrap her mind around their sloppy, imperfect idea. Wouldn't there be a much bigger mess? I mean, it's not really that bad. It's just the most likely thing, Helen, said Bob. This seemed, compared with his earlier territorial reaction, to come from outer space. Is it? she asked. I don't know. Her eyes skipped around the room. She seized on a thing. What about that? A book was lying open on a chair. It seems to have fallen from the shelves above, meagerly stacked with historical time-life volumes, light on text and heavy on visuals, on charts and illustrations, of ruddy, beaming pilgrims, or astronauts, their faces pale and stern behind domes. She walked to it, pointed down. The page that was open was something to do with earthen homes. She saw drawings of blue-shadowed igloos and a squat brown hut. They sat at the kitchen table. There was some paperwork, signatures. So you don't think they'll come back? No, I don't think they'll come back. They do. They see one sign of you here and they keep going. Please don't hesitate, though, to call, injected the younger, less jaded one. We don't want you or your property threatened in any way. She watched them leave. Their backs bent through the shoulders as they reached, strongly, with small, unthinking gestures for the doors of the car. It wasn't until Helen bent to place a cluster of sponges under the sink that she noticed the hair. When she closed the cupboard, a wisp of it, tangled and brown-gray, puffed out from the edge. Borne by air, it lunged softly for a few inches, then settled on the mat. She picked it up and felt it, its coarseness. It was dark brown at the root, and lightened at the end, silvered. It clumped there, as if singed. Bob, she said, look at this. They found this hair all over the cabin. It wasn't, they thought, so surprising that they hadn't noticed it in the previous search. As hair will, it had drifted to the edges, the hollows under chairs, the corners, borders and fringes of throw rugs. Not all in bunches or tufts. In fact, close squinting inspection revealed it embedded in the heavy, flat covering on the stairs, gathered at the limp ends of sheets on the furniture. The dog, said Helen. It must have been huge. Or on chemo. Ha! Huh. She was beginning to feel like it was theirs, an apparition, panting, drooling, with an endless supply of fur. She took a variety of sweeping tools upstairs, a garbage can, the small vacuum with its red plaid bag. She dealt with the feathers piecemeal, trying different things, afraid of overwhelming the poor rattling vacuum which resembled a bagpipe. She swept with the brush and pan in clumsy, stunted patterns. She picked the shredded pillowcase up between her thumb and middle finger. She held it up against the window and looked at it, through it, at the alien rag of it, the assaulted threads. She dropped it in the garbage can. The small plastic grocery bag she had lined it with came loose, fell to the bottom and crumpled in making tiny living sounds, crackling. She walked out of the room and went to the top of the stairs. Bob, she called. Your gun's here, right? He did keep guns, small ones. One at the house and one here. And though he had taken it home with him last time, he'd brought it back, she knew, 
nestled in shirts and briefs. It wasn't a secret, really. Nothing he had to hide from Helen. Though she retained a proper squeamishness when faced with the actual weapon, she held no solid argument against it. There was no question she felt safer knowing it was there somewhere, where they had access to it. It was something Bob had always kept, his father had, and his father before that. That night, they didn't turn on music or try the TV with its anemic signal. After salmon steaks and beer, there was quiet. The deep, solid silence of the woods. Of course, it wasn't complete silence. Like an ancient wall, there were fissures, hollowed out pits. Sounds gathered there. This wall seemed to dwarf a person, to take away his stature. They listened and played a game with pegs and cards, a game of chance. Helen watched Bob's face over the table. Little fighting squints pinched at the corners of it every few seconds. Do you want a scotch? She asked him cautiously. Oh, God, yes. He set his glasses down and rubbed his fingers over his eyes. She went to the kitchen. You know, we can leave here if it's spoiled. What do you mean? She returned to the table and slid his drink to him. I put a little soda in. Do you want to go back home? I want to go on like nothing's happened. I mean, I want to, but I'm not sure how. Bob reached for her hand and examined it. He rubbed the skin there absently, as if he were trying to move it aside to look underneath. That's a problem. I don't want to leave you alone here, he told her. Well, I don't like the idea of getting up to fish with you at five in the morning. We could drive back and come again later. Would it be better later? Is it going to be different? We could wait for the locksmith, get that done, then go. Bob, I think I'll be fine. She inwardly questioned herself a little. She knew that she might feel differently later when she was actually alone not just in consideration. I've got a car, I'll be fine. It's not an option. Can you just maybe refresh me on how to use the gun? Helen, I'm not leaving you alone here. If we're not gonna do the things we want anyway, the things we enjoy, then we might as well go back. You're not scared being here. I'm a little nervous. She sat up. Her hands went flat on the table. But I'm kind of angry, really. You are? Yes! I mean, this is our place. How dare they? She almost giggled at this last part, its dramatic righteousness. She felt the scotch in her, warming her solar plexus. Bob liked this side of her. It was like she grew invisible wings from her skull. Her temples flared. They took their drinks to the porch and sat in the dark. There was a slight creak and rattle as they arranged themselves on the bench swing, the chain taking their weight. They looked out into the trees, past the faint glow of moon. The driveway ruts soaked out into the woods and disappeared. They quieted their breathing, as if suddenly finding it too loud. They listened hard, almost inventing sounds. Are they out there? Helen whispered. No, said Bob. I think they've moved on. They could hear the creek now, behind them. It started low, and then once they found it, grew like a wave. They did stay. A locksmith from the next county drove over to replace the broken one 
which they had stabilized the first couple of nights with a heavy, noise-making cube of drawers. They strung some tin measuring cups on twine and hung them over the door jamb loosely, so that if the door opened, they would rattle and fall. Helen also perched a glass full of silverware right by its edge. They would be sure to wake. She made Bob keep his phone charged for what it was worth, since the reception was strained and unreliable. Even with the unfamiliar factors of their arrival, the first few days were nice. They slept greedily, much later than they usually did. Helen pulled off the sheets and inspected every centimeter of the bed, checking for contaminants. Finding none visually, she then put on three layers of sheets, which made the bed feel uncommonly soft. It felt vaguely clandestine, like napping on the couch. This first part, before their acclimation, was in some ways the best part of coming here. They walked around in a daze, trying to prioritize their desires. They rolled the lack of responsibilities around in their heads. Of course there was lots to do, likely more here than at the other house, since they were not here as much, not regularly even, and the environment was wild, corrosive, and prone to ruin. But it was different, and Bob and Helen insisted on seeing it that way. Here they felt a sense of accomplishment when they went to bed that was unusual. It was physical and earthy, like a coarse hearth bread. Helen even noticed she moved differently out here. Her center of gravity lowered somehow. She pushed from her legs. She felt herself transforming, her hips widening imperceptibly. Her feet, she imagined, grew strong, unshakable, with roots like a tree. She caught herself in certain earth woman moments. She pictured her short hair in long tendrils under a hat. Bob, too, shifted frequencies. Where Helen got earth-like, he adapted the rhythms of water. His routine shifted to make room for the various lakes and streams he visited with a passionate frequency. His gaze lengthened, became distant. It looked far and beneath the surfaces of things. Helen, mm, I'm going now. Okay, you know where the gun is. Uh, in the drawer. In the drawer. In her morning sleep, she was brave and turned her back on fear. Later, when the day faded, she would think this reckless. Are you going to be okay? Yes, she stirred now in the bed. The flannel curtain across the room glowed dimly with first light. Their friends, Darren and Alex, came over. Knowing this might happen, Helen went out to the gate and opened it. They had the habit, when they came, of seeming to accelerate in the driveway, to barrel on in. Helen almost skipped this, this opening of the gate, as she felt she shouldn't be letting down a barrier to anything, no matter the insignificance. But then really, what was this keeping out? She wondered. The Trojan horse? This happened. They came. Alex bounded out of the passenger door, her fuzzy lightning hair flailing. As they walked toward the porch, she put a leather clasp in her mouth and pulled the hair by her temples back behind her head. Hi! She yelled through her clenched teeth. Darren emerged behind her. He was ten years her junior, and had strange vocal patterns drawn out by stretches of quiet, which could be quite lengthy, then followed by bursts of more verbal activity. Apparently, when he was young, he had some problems and received electroshock therapy. Alex, in hushed tones, 
had referred to his parents as savages. They met when he was still damaged. He wandered into the jewelry shop where Alex worked and headed straight for a bowl of blue beads. He was the sexiest thing I'd ever seen in my life, Alex said. So I took him home. They went to the downtrodden Doe, the nearby cabin lounge with a restaurant and bar and strangely gargantuan dance floor. On some Sunday nights, country bands would play, and their pulsy twang could be heard all the way to the creek. Wolves and owls out there hearing it. Two mysterious thoughts. They sat down. Bob leaned back in his chair and reached his arms out and drummed his fingers on the table. It looked odd, like he was pushing away. Helen semi-consciously lined up the silverware on her napkin and squared it on the check vinyl tablecloth. It seemed temporary, stapled roughly underneath. There was a chunky bulb of red glass in the center of the table with an unlit candle stub inside. Helen ordered a cheeseburger with a salad, which was crisp and pale with fat orange filaments of cheddar cheese, thick striped discs of cucumber, and a tough pink wedge of tomato. She chewed it listlessly, sipping on her rum and coke. Bob got a steak. Alex and Darren got ribs, and over the meal their napkins crumpled. They grew oily and brown. Soon, Helen was sure, there would be darts. Across the room there was some sort of commotion involving a spilled beer and a purse. Two large men stood up. Alex drew in a breath. You guys, I almost forgot. Pick up your plates. Bob wrinkled his brow. We're going to throw them at those guys? No, just check underneath. Helen and Bob continued to look dumbfounded. I'll explain. Here, I'll do it first. She hoisted the ribs platter above her head and peered at it. Hmm, not on this one. Here, let me check the dishes. Here's one. She moved her plate over Helen's head. See? Helen squinted at it. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Feel then. Here. Alex took Helen's hand and ran it along the bottom of the plate. It feels scratchy in one place. Is that the brand imprint? No, not that. Here, this will make it easier. She lowered her plate and scraped the remnants off onto Darren's. She held the sides with her palms and turned it over. There, scratched deeply into the surface, was a shape. What is that? Helen asked, leaning back so Bob could see. It's black magic. Alex put some space between the words for emphasis. She told them how Pat, the owner, had hired some kids from out of the area, travelers, to wash dishes and do some line cooking. They were staying at Buck's campground and needed work. He wouldn't usually agree to such a temporary setup, but they seemed like nice kids, two boys and a girl in their 20s. They were quiet and showed deference to authority, rare in young people these days, he said. But then he started finding strange things by the garbage cans, little piles of stones. And further back, behind the creek, there was a tree where they hung bones ribs mostly, and the pale pink knob of a beef joint in a kind of man shape. One morning he found a forgotten soup bowl in the dishwasher and saw a pentagram or some such thing scratched in the bottom of it. So anyway, said Darren, chiming in, he got rid of them, and he ordered new dishes, but there was some problem with the order, so he's still stuck with these. Bob chuckled. He's hoping in the meantime no one will notice. Uh, yes, excuse me, Alex added. Oh no, there's no problem with my meal except, well, I could do without the symbol of Satan on my plate. So they were witches or something? Asked Helen. Yeah, I guess. Did they admit to it? I don't know. I assumed he talked to them. 
He didn't have much time when he was telling us the story. What were they doing, you think? Casting spells or something? I don't know. Something. Alex turned the plate again and inspected the marks. I mean, how do we know it was something bad? Maybe they were good witches. Or just ambitious Wiccans, you know, really into the forest goddess. When they returned that night, Helen felt strange. In the dark, the cabin's structure seemed mysterious, its lines blurred. She considered the anxiety of knowing someone had breached their walls, had crossed that skin, that barrier. It was really very thin, she thought, only an idea of protection. Bob undressed with gusto and hit the bed, not even bothering with his reading. He laid an arm over his eyes. Oh, those people wear me out, he declared. The underside of his arm looked pale and smooth. They are pretty intense. Still, I like seeing them. Yeah, just when we come here, though, I don't know if I could take them year-round. Hmm, repeated Helen. Her mind chewed circles around itself. But it was getting nowhere and her fatigue was piled up. She shut her eyes, picturing fires, tiny ones, behind each tree. Images came and went, Bob through the smoke, unshaven, soot powdering his beard. Helen went fishing with Bob in the morning. She pulled herself carefully to sitting, there was a mild white pain grazing her calf, as if in the night she had tried to run. She had slept poorly. A large part of her wanted to stay in bed, to catch up on the sleep and the blanket of dawn, its comfort. But she wanted to be with him today, she felt. Her dreams had rattled her, maybe. She didn't want to be alone here. She wanted him to pull her with him into the lights. She puttered in the kitchen, cutting an apple and melting cheese on toast. Instead of coffee, she wanted tea, and she filled two mugs with dark, oily Earl Grey. Upstairs, Bob was singing strains of the love boat, gliding over the words he didn't know. Set a course for adventure, your mind's on a new room. da da da, -da the love boat. Soon we'll be making another uh, The love boat promises something for every He bounded down the stairs. God, what's going on? She said. The fish are not safe. That's what's going on. Do I have to bait my own hook? No, cooed Bob. I'll do it for you, my delicate one. Catch and release? No. That's cruel, and it's against the rules. Cruel? Yes. Why? It hurts. Killing them doesn't hurt them. You know it does. Then, oh, you really are such a delicate thing. He kissed her forehead sweetly and with fully hidden condescension. They drove to a lake. Bob maneuvered the car around the ridges and pits in the dirt road, the snake-like trenches washed through from the spring rain. Bob loved this lake, the relative slowness of it. It was set off the main road, with subtle markers of minimal size announcing its presence. In fact, this was a chief complaint of travelers, its elusiveness. It was tucked silently, shyly away. Guidebooks proved misleading in the pursuit of this body of water, naming vaguely the wide arc around its eastern shore and the misleading downhill turn that shot up again, endangering front ends. They took the little boat from its dock. Bob rented it from a man who lived nearby, an Irishman with a suspect path. He was small and strong, and he held the world heavy on his back. 
He liked Bob and Helen, or he seemed to in his gruff way. He sometimes went with Bob in the mornings, though he seemed to fight a tremble in his hands that made the fishing difficult for him. They moved out over the lake. The small motor was quiet, though in the early morning stillness it sounded intrusive. Helen winced involuntarily. Out here, Bob changed. He became, to Helen, like one of those old movie stars, someone with studied, easy movement. He grew grace. Everything seemed effortless. He read the water like a palm, the beds of creeks and lakes. He saw tiny ripples of tiny fish coming up for food, that slight change in wind over the surface. He respected the resistant prey. He turned his fish over to Helen with reverence and pride. He talked of how water life adapted to accommodate change, how the gills and scales of fish rapidly altered themselves in new hatches to adjust for the rising annual heat, for the gradual seep of detergents and chemicals, the changing pH. He admired their malleability, how they became different, stronger, as anything does, I guess, but he trailed off, giving up on it. He prepared their hooks. Though Bob believed in God, he also believed we all came from the water. We had crawled up onto the dirt. With the way things were, how nobody really knew what was what, he didn't see how things were incompatible. I just think we're from the sea. God came in some time after that, he would say, once to Helen's father, before an argument. My Aquarius, she said, watching him. I'm not. Bob raised his head from his work and shook it a little, adjusting his neck. Some tiny crackles escaped. His hands, occupied with hooks, stayed still. She reached out and touched the top of his hat. You may as well be. The morning was gray, but still transitioning. Helen cast too carefully, and it fell laughably close to the boat. She looked up at the forest rising above the lake. You can see it from here, but on the nearby horizon, the overlap of several mountain tops from the east looked like a man in repose. What's that smell? She asked suddenly. What? She sniffed again. It was too pronged, with a high, silvery note like a whistle. Then a deep, earthy bass, mossy and damp. An animal? She swayed her body, leaning out toward the water, careful not to upset the boat too much. It's stronger when I lean in. Maybe it's the bait. Do you smell it? No. She sat up straight. Then I'm crazy. Probably, yep. He cast confidently out in an arc. She bent to him. Hey, it's not me. Just checking. She cast again. She watched the small ripples fan out. On a far shore, a few people with yellow vests moved among one another. A fist of small birds burst above the trees. You sure slept last night. I must have. I don't remember waking up once. The sleep of the dead. I feel just great today. Funny. I wish I'd slept like that. I feel awful. You didn't need to come. I know, I just felt... No, I wanted to. She would have spoken about the night before, about wanting to be with him, about her being upset somehow. But it was obviously far from his mind. It hadn't occurred to him. He felt great today, as he said. 
and she would just sound fussy. They drove to Rick's Point for lunch. Bob ate ravenously, devouring a huge omelet and sausage and toast. After half her waffle, Helen became drowsy, dumbed down. She sipped her unhelpful coffee. The next day, Bob bounded out of bed and immediately started whistling. Helen felt a strange sort of smile pull across her face. He was uncharacteristically boisterous. Off to the fish, she called sleepily, rubbing her face. No, actually, I'm going to drive over to Alan's. Want to come? No, go ahead. She turned and leaned up onto her elbow. That's pretty far. He pulled the shirt on roughly. I need some stuff for the shop, and I need a saw blade sharpened. Is it going to be open this early? Oh, yeah, he'll be there. If he's not, I'll just go next door and see his brother. Isn't he in prison? No, that's the other brother. He bent to kiss her. She scratched his sandpaper chin. Their trip was turning out like this. She started the day slow, quiet, while Bob bounded off. He was always a little different when they came out here, relaxed, more open. But this time there was something else. Funny, since this trip had started off so badly, so unpredictably. Perhaps he had bounced back, overcompensated, like a rebound relationship or a tight rubber ball. She was quietly baffled. She doubled the cool pillow high under the nape of her neck for pressure. It slipped up slowly, twanging the small hairs at the base of her scalp. She liked it. It gave her the vague feeling of motion, of water. She tried to drift back off again, but her mind kept going, following tracks. There was something else she couldn't reconcile with this new man. In the last year, Bob's joints had begun to complain. There was a little arthritis in his family, but there were also ulcers, though the looming anti-inflammatory prescriptions, with their corrosive natures, had been avoided so far. Although at certain times his face showed the triumphing strain. She wondered at the ways the two of them would become more dependent on each other physically. Now it would happen. Now they were supposedly ready. Their son was grown. He had children too. They had freed themselves from work and now, apparently, this was the final show. The last trimester, said her friend Janine. Helen liked that, the thought of death as being born. Not that she dwelled on it, dying. She wasn't usually morbid, and perhaps it was in a conscious defiance of morbidity itself that she sought out things like that, things to tell herself. She supposed everyone did that in their way. In college, Bob had balanced his business studies with a bit of running, hiking, and field hockey. Light sport, he would call it, which made Helen laugh because it sounded so English so thoroughbred. For another thing, it wasn't so light. Bob had always pushed himself. He had a brief romance with boxing. He showed her a couple of pictures in which his young, handsome face was distorted by a huge resin mouthpiece, giving him a bulldog's jaw. In one, he was attempting to smile through the clear plastic. His teeth just suggested through it magnified in a weird smear. Another was more tranquil as he held up his wrists for taping. It looked vaguely medical, with a round white light behind him, the serene, resigned expression. He seemed disembodied from his hands, as if they were tools. And there had been an injury, after which Bob became depressed. 
He told Helen he had been strangely guilty about it. It wasn't as if he had some sort of career writing, he said. Not as if he had been some sort of athlete, someone very serious about his body. But he had been shocked by the abruptness of the accident, which was merely a slip, an oddly sitting rock on a trail, and the quick devastation of a wrong step. For the first time in his life, he said, he felt at odds with his body, as if he stood outside it, looking in. He saw it as an object, something flawed, and he was a slave to its flaws. Helen herself had played a little tennis in high school, so at the time she supposed she vaguely knew the feeling, the separation of body and spirit. But she was young then and had never really experienced much resistance, much argument from her muscles or bones. Of course, she knew now, intimately. She had begun to have those dreams of her teeth crumbling, falling out of her mouth. She could not remember blood in those dreams, only shards of enamel and distressingly painless forfeit of the roots as they gave way snapping softly. Dream books indicated similar things, the fear of disease and illness, deteriorating health. Not necessarily prophetic, but of course the body is wise, light years ahead of the mind. She always woke from these dreams dismantled, with relief coming slowly, the pieces of a thing to be assembled. One afternoon, Bob returned, clutching a clump of flowering weeds behind his back. They had small, yellow-green blossoms that clung weakly to the stalk. His expression was a paradoxical combination of poker face and coy. He whipped them round his side and thrust them at her, bits of fluff scattered onto the floor. "'What's this? Look at you,' she said, taking them awkwardly brushing off his belly, the front of his shirt. She'd sweep later, the shake. She felt the tough, knobby stems, a little sticky, with a few sharp, spiny parts. You shouldn't have, really. She nudged the fluff on the floor with her foot. She turned carefully toward the sink. How was Alan? Really good. He was really sick, I guess, over the spring. Pneumonia and some kind of skin rash. He had to be in the hospital for a while. Huh. She filled a plastic beer cup halfway and lowered the weeds into it. But he's good now. God, yeah, chipper as ever. More so, even. Says he never felt better in his whole life. And you know how people say that, kind of throw it down. But I think he honestly meant it. How's Nancy? He said she was good. I didn't see her. He came up behind her and reached in front of her under the sink. He was snug up against her back, and she watched his hands. He turned on the sink, washed them around her. It was an odd sight, like surrogate limbs. She had quickly, briefly, the experience of vertigo. She watched the gray soap leather, the color of stone. He rinsed and clutched at the towel and put his warm, damp hands across her belly. She felt him kiss the back of her neck softly. Hi there, she said. She was suddenly shy. He was so rarely affectionate like this. A warmth rose slowly in her chest. But it seemed scientific, curious, held away from her somehow. But that was familiar, the distance. She knew its ways. She now noticed that the tiles on the walls, with the usual appearance of something solid, actually contained many things, many greens, the undulating colors of the sea. Helen chopped dill. She chopped it as fine as she could, leaving thin, smeary green lines on the cutting board. 
Planning for lots of fish, she had brought many lemons, the firmest she could find to allow for further ripening, so they would last. Bob came down the stairs pulling on a shirt. His feet danced quickly next to each other. Alan invited me to go night fishing, he said, pulling out a kitchen chair noisily. Then he changed his mind and went to the fridge, removing a can of beer. What do you mean? You can't see at night. Haven't you heard of night fishing with lights and stuff? Well, I guess. Maybe in the ocean. Yeah, well, I guess you can do it in lakes too, if they're pretty deep, but nobody ever thinks to do it. Are you making this up? No, he says he's done it a lot. Hmm. She lays some trout in a pan. Hey, will you smoke some of this tomorrow? Yeah. Now all kidding aside, are you okay with me leaving for a while at night? Would you rather I stayed here? Uh, she stopped what she was doing. She stood at the counter and tried to decide what she felt. There was something in her mind, in her chest. She couldn't place it. She took a slow breath and crossed her arms, leaning. I won't go. You don't feel safe. No, I was just thinking. She went to him and put her hands on his shoulders. I think it's okay. I'm good. Let's try it. I want you to go. Since he wasn't going fishing until evening, Bob stuck around in the morning. He did leave once, driving to the store to get them each a morning paper, too, so they could read what parts they wanted over breakfast. It was a long trip. Unnecessary, but a treat. While he was gone, she made them pancakes and eggs and brewed the coffee strong. They spread out over the table, reaching occasionally for cups and forks over the tops of pages. Bob went to work in his shop, in effect the garage, and Helen went to work with buckets and shears. She wanted to tackle the growth around the yard's edge. Each year it advanced ferociously, and so she would work many days, concentrating on small areas, making them as reasonable as she could. The brambles were aggressive, sharp, tangled things, and she knew that the more she struggled and wielded her little saw, the more seeds she scattered, and the heavier they would return in the circle of it, the magnificent defense. The roots were very difficult to find, and if you did, to remove. She had herself seen some that were huge, with arm-like protrusions extending to the size of a chair. She imagined them reaching deep into the earth, through the soil and the bedrock and into the hottest, softest parts of the world. As she hacked and pulled, she found the small body of a frog on the ground. Then two more, spaced a few feet away from each other, they were beginning to shrivel, but not showing any real signs of decomposition. They were preserved, just a little smaller and stiff, and with a concentrated color, as when you boil the liquid off of something, reduce it in a pan. She peered at them. What were they doing? The pond was nearby, but were they going to it? Coming from it? What? She thought maybe they had crawled or wriggled through and were unable to get out. But that seemed unlikely, given how small they were, even considering the density of the brambles. Then she thought maybe an animal dragged them there, something that ate them. A fox? An owl? But the bodies didn't appear to be marred by teeth messed up in any way. She supposed something could have carried one carefully, then dropped it along the way. But three of them? She dumped out one of her pails and placed the frogs in the bottom, lifting them gingerly around the middle with her canvas gloves. They were light and rigid, and she set them carefully in the bottom of her orange bucket. She approached the shed where she heard the whir of machinery, 
Bob was cutting something or other to fit. She thought briefly, reflexively, of bone. Bob frequently worked with the garage door opened, unless he had to do a lot of loud work when he felt self-conscious about the noise, felt he was polluting the quiet air. Right now he had it closed, and when she opened the side door softly, she saw Bob sawing. She didn't want to frighten him, so she hung back, hovering silently at the door. She watched him. There was something strong and solid about his stance, something unfamiliar. It didn't seem to belong to him, to the lore of his body. Though the lifting wasn't always heavy, he generally wore a hard leather carpenter's brace, a wide belt, he wasn't wearing it now. All the energy seemed to be coming from his legs, which looked ready to spring. They looked muscular, weight-bearing, like a haunch. His hips seemed pronounced like back legs, as if he had four. She set her bucket down. Bob stopped sawing. Why aren't you wearing your brace? she asked sternly. She heard her own mother in her voice. She had moments like this now. Things collided. I don't like it anymore. It restricts my movement. He hung the saw up carefully on a peg. I thought it helped your movement to stabilize. Ugh. He moved his hand in a dismissive gesture. What are you making? she asked deliberately softening her voice. Boards of different sizes were piling up on a side table. Rocket ship, he said, raising his eyebrows. She scooped her hand toward herself. I'm going to show you something. Bob stepped outside and she pointed. What do you make of this? He looked. Frogs? No, I mean, look at them. He leaned over. I found these under the bushes. Bob still looked at them. His cheeks furrowed, a few thin folds beneath his chin. Do you see what I mean? Well, they're dead. Yes, but they're not... Don't they look funny? They're dried. Well, how long have they been dead? I don't know. I found them in the dirt. Well, I don't know anything about how frogs decompose. He sounded annoyed. Maybe they don't right away. He took an awl from his overall pocket. They have different bodies than other animals, different chemicals. They're in water all the time. Yeah. She looked down into the bucket again, tilting it. It's just weird where I found them. One wouldn't be so strange, but three... I don't know what's so strange about it. I think you're overreacting. It seems sensible to me. She stepped away, taking the bucket carefully, setting it down. She reached for another smaller one that she spied on a tall shelf and took it out to the yard with her, setting it, the frogs, near her where she worked. Her gloves had stiffened a little with something from the vines, a thick, dark green juice like a sap. She knelt and looked around her. She was up against a new thing, something wild and unseen. She grabbed a curving length of stalk and pulled. When Alan arrived that night to pick Bob up, he didn't come in. He just hovered in the dark around the truck. His headlights were on, and from the window, Helen saw the flickering shapes of moths around them. Behind her, up the stairs, Bob thumped around with quickening feet, getting ready to leave. She waited for Alan to come in, to come to the door, but he didn't. He had given a small tap of the horn when he pulled up next to the house. Why didn't he come in? What was wrong with people? When it was clear that he had no intention of doing this, she grabbed the box sitting on the table and went outside, letting the screen door snap shut behind her. She saw the shape of him turn quickly, 
saw the cigarette glow between his fingers. Alan, should you be smoking? I heard you were sick. Her voice sounded flat and a little accusatory instead of playful like she had intended. What this? It's not mine, he bent sideways, stubbing it out on the thick sole of his boot. This is for Nancy, she said, pushing the box toward him. And you too, of course. Could you give it to her for me? Do you have room? No, oh, sure. Thanks, Helen. What is it? Some lemons. There's some dried lavender in there. Some jars I don't need. I know she likes to use them for things. Oh, she'll be thrilled. He took it around the side of the truck and opened the door. He seemed to be moving things around, removing and replacing them behind the seat. She walked around near him. How is she? He straightened and looked back at her through the window of the open door. Pardon? How's Nancy? She's terrific. Last time we were here, she came over to visit. Yeah, well, she always keeps herself busy. Tell her I'd like to see her. Maybe I'll come by. Oh, well, I'd sure call first, seeing as how she's taken on lots of things. Okay. She wrapped her arms around herself. I'll call. Bob came from around back, carrying his fishing gear. Hey, do I just bring my normal stuff? I've never done this before. Helen smiled. Take care of him, Alan. He's a novice. And don't get swallowed up by the lake monster. She stepped toward the porch, then turned. What time will you guys be back? She saw Bob turn toward Alan inside the truck. Then he rolled down the window. No way to know, but don't wait up. The dogs came first that night. They approached from different sides and moved slowly, silently, sniffing toward the house. They found the lawn and kept to its edges. They varied in size and color. The smallest was a house cat sized thing with tall pointed ears and a strange smashed bat-like face. The largest a loping Dane with a sharp, curved spine. They were all different colors, not from each other, but within themselves. They lacked the crisp breeding of pronounced color lines, neat manes or shading. They found where the trees ended, gave way to the yard, and wandered awkwardly there. They looked toward the house expectantly, but without apparent knowledge or purpose, without tension. They did not readily move in, just sniffed about and waited. Helen heard them upstairs and peered down with her heart pounding. She had left the outer light on for Bob's return, and this illuminated a few of them, their heads down in the grass, defining some invisible perimeter. Her blood jumped. They've come back. They came and brought all their dogs with them. The dogs that shed and scratched and chewed in this house. They know we're here now. And they don't care. She rolled her weight onto the front of her foot to silence her movement and went for the bedside drawer where the gun was. This small effort seemed agonizingly loud. Suddenly she could hear everything, each pop in the floor. Each time her arms moved against her body, her breath laboring to slow itself, becoming shallow. And beyond herself, the house like an instrument. The leaves shattered against one another. The needles on the trees combed the air. Her head spun. Could she call someone? She thought of Bob struggling with the cellular. It sat on the dresser, a dark lump. She held the gun in one hand and picked it up with the other. This felt odd, the opposing weights. She put it, unsure, in the pocket on her nightgown. She had a sense of feeling foolish in it, the frill ruffle like a pinched edge of a pie, flattened from wear, and its raised stitch pattern of tints, bears, and pine cones. 
she felt, suddenly, costumed. She was unprepared for anything real. Approaching the stairs took gargantuan effort and faith. She was still uncommitted to descending. She thought she would rather hide in the bedroom, waiting. But then she didn't want to be trapped there, without anywhere to go but out the window, the steep jump below. The light from the porch bulb lit the windows down there, and she watched for shapes moving, for shadows. She descended the first few steps. She was so conscious of the window she could almost feel them. They nearly vibrated. It was where she could see out, and whatever was out there could see in. They could also be broken. She made herself take a breath, rechecked the gun in the dark. Her blood was loud. Her chest seemed to become useless. All the air she took in had nowhere to go, and it did no good. When she was four steps from the bottom, she stopped there and crouched tensely, trying to make herself as small as possible. She listened, her eyes wide. She wondered about the back door, which from here she could not see. Many minutes passed. Then she moved. Her knees protested as she rose from the step, but she barely felt it. Once she had decided, she moved rather quickly. She told herself about the light, that she could conceal herself looking out. She looked out, first without moving the thin cloth there. She saw the white light from the side of the door, the trees straight out from the house, the unclear dark there and the top of the front porch, lit by the bulb. She thought of the car keys. She moved the cloth and looked again. Nothing. She crossed the floor quietly and went toward the kitchen, the back door. When she passed the car keys on their hook, she took them off and hesitated. Her first thought was to put them in her pocket with the phone, but she thought they might rattle there, so she just set them down on the counter. It was dark out the back door, though there was the suggestion of light coming around from the front. This time she did see something, something that moved near the edge of the brambles. It was low and of uncertain shape. She focused where she perceived it, and flipped the light switch with a sudden movement. It was then she saw them. Three of them. No, four. They flinched dramatically in the sudden light and turned, shrank. But they stayed. She looked for a person above them. To the side, she watched where the dogs looked to see if they would turn toward a master. But their eyes adjusted and they held their ground, looking toward the house. She crossed and returned to the front. Here now she did see them. Where were they before? There were five or six here, just standing, sitting. She sat on the floor against the door for an uncertain time, maybe 15 minutes, half an hour. She still held the gun, and she could now smell it. The heat and moisture of her hands around it unleashed a cool scent. The scent of coin, wood, and blood. She had decided to go outside. Her blood still traveled noisily in her, and the long muscle tension had let up some, leaving her shaky. She reached up and shut off the exterior light. She didn't want to be in the light, didn't want to limit her vision, didn't want to be seen. She sank down again after that, waited a few more minutes in the dark, listened desperately, finally, for a scrambling, for a movement in the change, a retreat, an approach. She opened the door, she held the gun up in front of her and stood there, widening her eyes. Her sight darted 
grabbed for purchase. The dogs stood. Their eyes glinted in the moon. She lifted her foot to stomp at them. But as she did, she realized she had no shoes. She grabbed a plank of wood Bob had been carving into a man shape and swung it to the right. It hit the porch swing and shattered, making a sharp sound that reverberated up the swing's chains, rattling them, giving the dull sound of plucked cables. She heard pieces of the whittled man scattering over the porch. She sat with them now. She had retrieved a coat and sat with it fastened up around her, high at her neck. She still held the gun, but had loosened her grip on it. She looked out at them. The ones from the back had come around to the front, and they looked back at her. It was not threatening. They didn't approach. They didn't seem to want anything. Or if they did, they hadn't figured out what it was. They were interested in her. They watched her. They watched each other. They stood or sat, and some even lay on the ground. She was unsure how many of them there were. Seven to ten she would see. But then there was some movement, and her tired eyes might have doubled some, and the dogs were the same colors and shades as her shadows around the trees that splayed over the ground in an uneven lace under the moon. At times, she could hear them breathing. She had tried making some sounds. She cooed and clicked. She was struck with the strong insensible urge to sing. She didn't know when she made the decision not to tell Bob. There was something here, some connection to other things. She wasn't sure. He would likely see them anyway, another night or when he got home, and they could discuss it then. Tonight was for her. It was like the bodies of the frogs that Bob dismissed as meaningless. Speaking of Bob, where the devil was he? A kernel of worry appeared in her mind. She felt herself brush it back. Enough of that tonight. She wanted to feel peace again and sleep. Then she went back. Back inside, she got a tall glass of water and drank it greedily with a deep thirst. Then she returned to the front door. She had nearly forgotten the light to turn it on, to welcome him home. When Bob returned, there was no sign of the dogs. They were gone. He placed his things on the ground at the side of the house and let himself in the back to use the light to get to the shed. He tried to be quiet going in, but he knew that it would make some noise. That was inevitable. He had not planned well for this. He wound up taking off his clothes in the kitchen and putting them in a heavy black garbage bag. The smell of the woods had followed him in, clung to him, a thick invisible moss of it. He could smell the lake, the dank weeds coming apart by the dock. Near the south shore, mushrooms grew thick and wild. He smelled them still in his skin, on his hands, the shocking, fleshy scent of them. Though it was late, he found he was not tired, and he wrapped himself in the blanket on the couch. After a time, he went upstairs. Helen was in bed with the covers drawn up, covering her chin. The hall light was on, and he saw her eyes open. It was all he could see of her from the bridge of her nose up. She looked as if she were trying to discern his shape against the light, to recognize him, to give him a name. So how was it? Did you catch anything? Yeah, lots. Good. She reached her hands out to him under the quilt. What's this? What? On your arm. It feels rough. I scraped it on a tree. 
He turned from her and snuggled backwards. She put the palms of her hands against his back. She waited for more, for him to acknowledge the dogs. He didn't, just fell into breathing. As she drifted off again, she wondered gently about them, willing herself calm. In the morning, Helen rose alone and left Bob to sleep and hurried outside. She found no immediate signs of the dogs. She thought for a moment she'd imagined it all, but did not decide that, did not believe it. She stepped back into the house, ate quickly, joylessly, then went back outside to her work. Though the light in the yard was not optimum yet, she started some detailing, trimming fronds, warring with vines and roots. Her hands complained deep inside, in the bones, the connective tissue there. No matter. She wanted to do this. She needed to. She heard the front door snap. Bob came out on the porch, yawning like a bear. His fists went to the sky. Why didn't you wake me, woman? He thumped his bald hands a few times lightly on his chest. Why aren't you asleep is the better question. Ach. He pulled the shirt he slept in away from himself, twisting it. Bob, really, you must be exhausted. You're not a young thing anymore. Get the hell back to bed. And miss the crack of morning? No, thank you. He'd bent from side to side like an athlete warming up. What is wrong with you these days? You were much too vivacious for me. She stood up and felt her knees complaining, slowly unlocking. The blood moved so slow these days from one area to another, it was forgetting how to multitask. I'll make you a deal. You go back to bed for three more hours, and I'll make you an amazing big breakfast. Her hands hung in her stiff, heavy gloves at her side. So, where's your fish? Did you freeze him when he got home? No, Alan took him home. Did he catch them all? Hell no! Who do you think you're talking to? Oh, I forgot. The experienced night fisherman. She smiled, scrunching up her face. They walked along a trail on the creek side. The path had grown anemic, unkempt, grown over with grasses. Helen was looking low, her eyes scanning the ground. She was watching for dogs, for signs of dogs, for anything. Bob was paying a lot of attention to her today, she noticed. It made her feel lazy, confused. We should move up here said Bob suddenly. Yeah, we could be mountain people. Hey, I'm serious. You're not serious. Sell the house. We come up here whenever we want. I know. I know it's dumb. He seemed briefly sad. She heard its breath change pitch and he hung his head a little like a dog's. I just, it feels so great out here. Don't you think part of that is that we're not here always? That it's still a getaway? It doesn't have to be. Do you? I'm not sure I want that. I'm not sure either. I just thought it and I thought I'd say it. They were quiet then for a while. The creek moved beside them, making a vague noise, moving for years ceaselessly over rocks. Bob moved ahead of her. Over the next few minutes, he quickened his step. It was gradual. She almost didn't notice it was happening. But then suddenly she felt her ankles straining. She tried to keep up, then suddenly didn't. She just slowed and watched him go ahead. She wondered when he would notice she wasn't there. But he probably knew already, 
with his ears these days. They were sharp as pins. Some things that happened and continued happening. The dew, the eyes of the sun, the hanging of day. The road where people drove looking for something. An ill-marked address, a trailhead to the cliffs. The falls, a few miles away, inexplicably cold, colder than any water around. Geologists said it was something to do with glaciers, with underground masses, with caves, with ancient deep ice. The tiny lake beneath, where only one fish could live, a small silver thing with half-moon fins that had no digestive system, no intestines, but processed food through a gland near its eyes. It was on a few maps, this place, and the schools in town would make day trips and come out, gather noisily in front of the explanatory placard, and finger their beakers. The next night, they went to visit Alex and Darren. Alex was making dream catchers. In their living room, a folding table was set up with bits of them spread over it. There were rings, beads, feathers, nerve-like filaments of twine. Actually, Alex said to Bob and Helen, I guess you're not supposed to let people see them before they're done. I mean, no one but the crafter is supposed to see it during construction. It can be very disruptive to the subconscious. Someone told me that. She twirled a feather absentmindedly and then put it down. Alex seemed to look around to contemplate covering them. Instead, she shrugged. You've been warned, she said sleepily, stretching. They had steaks that night by the fireplace. Alex and Darren had it going a little. Though it was summer, it was cool at night. In these mountains, the temperature fell as if from a cliff, the light and heat dissolving together, an abrupt desertion. There were many incidents of hypothermia here among unprepared hikers caught in the fall. They had big, thick German stouts and big, thick, chunky glasses. It was heavy, like a second meal. There was a lived-in feel here at their friend's home, which Helen sometimes craved. At their own cabin, hers and Bob's, they hadn't really dug in. They had not filled the house with their scent, had not pulled their objects in around them like a nest. For all their enjoyment of the house, there remained a distance between the two of them and its comforts. It was something mildly prophylactic, like a curfew. Though Helen kind of liked it, the invisible line, she needed reining in. Maybe that was why, ultimately, they'd been able to move on from the break-in. There was distance. Helen knew, with ownership, with attachment, came great risk. It came with so many things. All day long she had grappled with visions. Helen had a picture of she and Bob, each night playing cribbage on a naughty homemade board. She saw their faces made ruddy and tougher with winter air. She saw large shovels and snow machinery humongous bags of de-icer stacked in the shed. She saw Bob gutting a hanging deer, the snow beneath it a red, steaming pit, while she struggled with the rabbit ears on the television and swept wet snow off the porch. She imagined his smug, oblivious snoring. Under the fatigue of physical work, he would no doubt see as honest as romantic as all that. Things were becoming strange. The men went to look at something. Darren, too, had a room like Bob's and was also interested in wood and the various things he could make it do. He also did things with metal. Bending, reshaping, entwining, the mastery of thin cuts of it, its possibilities, its 
limitations. Darren's room was attached to the house through a little hallway. It was an extension of the house, really, with its own heat and water source, its own minor sustenance. All right, they're gone. Now we can tell secrets. Alex drained the chocolatey beer in her mug and settled back onto the couch. Helen could see Alex's knuckles stretch her fist skin white. She wore a gaudy ring with a moonstone and a lizard coiled round the edge. Helen wondered briefly why Alex bothered with jewelry out here. But then, of course, the question wasn't fair, and of course she knew the answer. You can't let go of everything, she thought. You can't stop. Are you all right, love? Alex reached out and touched the side of her head. She let her hand linger there and then stroked her cheek gently near her ear. You gotta wait here. It was the sort of intrusion that was typical of Alex. She claimed people were too rigid, too many boundaries. As she snuggled up to you or grabbed your hand, it rattled Helen usually, as it really meant she was testing you, testing your reaction to her. It was really her way of dominating, taking over. Here, she moved closer to Helen and nudged her forward off the couch. Sit down there on the floor. Alex arranged herself behind Helen, her knees on either side of her. She pulled and pinched at Helen's shoulders rolled her fingers around her neck. Helen listened. From the direction of the tiny hallway, she heard some sort of clacking sound and an echo. There were no sounds of approach. Helen's body tightened from her walks and her battles with the brambles. Her shoulders pushed indignantly upward. She noticed now the colors in the vines she sought to destroy. They were quite beautiful, really. Rich browns and reds. The occasional streak of a gauche, infectious green. At the bends and snaps and tiny tears, there oozed a sticky, white, discoloring milk. She dipped her gloved finger in it and smeared the side of her bucket with a swirl. It had a pungent smell, like juniper or blood. One morning, she waited until Bob had been gone a while, enough time to go to Allen's for them to be on their way. She locked up, got in the car, and drove to Allen and Nancy's. She did it suddenly, almost without thinking. She hadn't driven much out here except to go to the store and to the falls with Bob and fishing with Bob, and to Darren and Alex's with Bob. She drove leisurely, unhurried, as if to prove her mission was honorable, was natural even. To whom? To herself? Besides, she didn't expect to make any discoveries. She believed they were fishing. It wasn't as if she were paranoid or spying. She had to see Nancy. She just had to. She knew this somehow. The road passed a meadow. She had seen it bare like a tundra and she had seen it furred with bright flowers in late spring. Now, summer, the flowers were still there, but gentler. The other growth had caught up to them, had softened the shocking hues. At dusk, the field was a riot of deer. Sometimes she and Bob came with low ground chairs along the edge of the trees and peered through binoculars until it got too dark. The creatures emerged silently from somewhere. They were never sure where. One would materialize in the high weeds on the far side. How long it had been there, they couldn't guess. And then upon further inspection of the meadow, they might find two more, then three than twenty. She thought she should try to do this with Bob soon. Get him out of his damned water, his consciousness. He'd been staring at the water too much this trip. He'd forgotten other things. The earth, 
Tara, for God's sake. She thought of her dogs, born from the forest itself, from the bellies of trees. She passed the lake on the left. It was down below about a hundred feet, and then the road climbed. She was careful here. She passed the lodge with the grotesque humanoid moose out front. Its brown outer paint was chipped and revealed an older, inappropriate orange. She approached the house's drive. On top of the mailbox was a carved, perched bird. Nancy loved these cute little touches, little carvings and creatures, corn cob cup holders and crocheted tea cozies. She loved unicorns and collected them in a chest in the hallway. She was so sincere about her delight in these crafts, these objects, that instead of being annoying or coming off as nutty, her intensity was sweet and you caught it like a bug. Helen thought about these women, Alex and Nan. Both lived out here. Both did things with their hands, made things, put energy into these things. But where Alex was hot-blooded, in touch with the goddess moon, or so she aspired, Nancy was small in posture, exacting, doting. Alex always liked to visualize her world as larger, wilder. When she slept, her cells expanded. She reached for the sky. She reached into the earth, into caves, into volcanic stuff that glowed like hell. Nancy seemed, on the other hand, to crave a smaller world, to miniaturize her own. She was a solid woman, actually quite strong, but her body was beginning to show the effects of hunching, of a habitual slouch. The yard had a narrow drive lined with thick bushes, which she miscalculated a little, scraping the driver's side of the car. She winced. When the passage widened, she saw their yard, remembered it. There was a wooden picnic table and a little garden with twine runners and a ceramic bunny sitting up on its haunch. Their car was there, the car Bob drove here, but Alan's truck was gone. She went to the door and knocked softly. Then louder, although she tried to give it a jaunty rhythm, to keep it friendly, to not scare Nancy. Out here, she thought, there were too many frightening visitations. There was nothing. She tilted her head toward the door. After trying the knob, she moved around the side of the house. The sound of her feet over the grass the pieces of bark, the tiny rocks, seemed intense, almost comically exaggerated to her ears. There was a side window, through which she could not see, only the covering, a wide speckled cloth, white or cream or yellow. She knocked in the familiar morse to signal a friend. Still nothing, so quiet. She walked around back, repeating the same with the door there, first opening the creaky screen, then wrapping her knuckles against the wood. Still nothing. She tried the handle, which turned, hesitating just a little. Her face flushed. She knew if she were going to do it, she should do it quickly, without shyness. The longer she waited, she knew the more likely she would be discovered, lingering there, looking strange. Once inside, she wasted no time. She called out. Nancy? Is anyone here? She moved into the kitchen and glanced around the counters. The pot in the sink, the faint sour of cold coffee on the stove, a can of beer partly, gently crushed. Hello? The house was ranch style, no stairs. She moved into the living room. There was a gauzy afghan and a plaid cotton blanket balled together on the couch. A large cast iron ashtray was filled with the broken shells of nuts. 
She went toward the bedrooms nervously, making noise all the way. She saw the bathroom door was open. She flipped the switch. The lemon yellow towels were gaudy and suburban for the woods, but they reminded her in a second of Nancy. The guest bedroom was empty. On the bed there, three rolled up sleeping bags rested fatly, bulging at their strings like roasts. The other bedroom, the master, had a soft skin oil smell. People's bedrooms usually did, to some degree anyway. Here it was mixed with something floral and light, probably some of Nancy's poopery or stitched sachets. The bed was not made exactly. The quilt and sheet were turned down in a wide, sloppy fold, appearing thrown. There were blinds here, and there was a dented, bent spot where something had fallen against them or stuck. She left the house quickly then, without touching anything. She was starting to feel a bit foolish, sneaking around like this. Everything was fine. She should go home and nap. She needed more sleep. That was all. Nancy had gone somewhere. That was all. She went around the other side of the house toward the car and heard a wild, panicked sound as several squirrels scampered away from the shed. She thought they had been frightened by her, by her approach, but then two large black birds landed on the shed's roof. They flared their wings. They must be prey, the squirrels, she thought. One of the birds bent over the side of the roof and pecked gently at the wood. She went toward the shed and pulled at the handle. It was solid, unyielding. The shed was small, seemingly meant for garden things, for outdoor tools. She tried to peer in between the boards, but couldn't see. The birds squawked and flew away. There was a jagged trench along the bottom of the boards, most pronounced in two places, as if something had begun to dig from the outside in. The next day, she was nauseous and achy. She had thrown up in the night. She'd stumbled into the bathroom and slapped at the light switch desperately. Her stomach surrendered, and in those few seconds before, she saw the toilet bowl was full of hair. She recovered, still sitting on the floor, feeling the slight adrenaline surge in the shaky hands, watery eyes. They focused in on the bathroom light, and she saw more of it on the floor. The hair, short and straight, not long, but coarse and thick. She might have missed it if she were not peering at the floor so intently, with the renewed, jagged concentration of the ill. Are you okay? Bob held the door frame in his big hands. She looked up at him, at his near-transparent v-neck, his eyes rapidly blinking in the light, his hair poked up in a small white crown. Though the hair on his head was predominantly gray, his body still wore its dark, gentle fur, the way some men's eyebrows lag behind, resisting seasons. Bob, what is this hair? Are you shedding? For a moment, he looked confused. Oh, I cleaned out the compartment in my shaver. Did I spill? Bob, there was so much of it. I... She had flushed and her evidence was gone. She pointed feebly at some strands on the floor. Helen, focus on the issue at hand. Are you sick? He took her to bed, pulling an extra blanket from the hall closet. He stayed with her that next day and made her toast and played music very softly on a radio in the hall. This idea seemed to fluff him up, to move him. He explained it to her. That way you can hear it, but it won't be in the room with you, so it won't disturb you. If it was in the room with you, you would have an urge to turn it off. 
even though it will be quiet, even though you may like the sound. But it will be removed from you and it will be muffled. So you'll give yourself permission to enjoy it. She looked at him incredulously. I read that somewhere. He shrugged softly. Well, darling, you've... She got up on one elbow and scrunched the pillow around. Thought of everything. She sank down, folding her elbow underneath her. She heard it out there softly. It was a mild classical sampler CD they'd picked up at a checkout in a department store. You weren't dying, are you? Hmm, maybe sometime, but not today. How can you be sure? It's not that bad, just my tummy hates me. Was it my fish? What fish? I haven't seen any in a week. I don't believe you're even catching them. I've decided you're rendezvousing with someone over in Widow's Cove. That sounds dirty. Which parts? Rendezvousing? Of course it's dirty. No, Widow's Cove. He snickered. She rolled her eyes and turned away from him, groaning. He got up to leave. What do you want for dinner? Fish? Ugh. I can't talk about food now. It's a non-issue. See me in a few hours and we'll talk. She tossed in a violent sleep, kicking and pushing at blankets and sheets until they twisted round her knees and arms. In her dreams, she kept approaching the shed at Alan and Nancy's, but each time she got near enough to touch it, her pulse elevated and woke her up. Each time there seemed to be a different sound emanating from it, something frightening, unidentifiable. In her moments awake, she was alternately cold and hot enough to sweat. She woke in the dark suddenly. The moon was bright and pushing through the curtains. She listened for Bob. She leaned on her elbow, testing her neck. She pushed herself up and without turning on the light, went downstairs. The lights were off. That was the first thing. There was a little bit coming from the kitchen, from the soft light over the stove that they often left on. She could see the front door was open. The air seemed excited, electric, as if something had just caught fire. She went to the screen door and touched it, looking out. The smell here, too, more powerful coming from outside. Not a smell, really. Just a feeling. The air was wild around her with no wind. She looked back at the living room. A crumpled shirt on the floor. She didn't bother going to look at the kitchen. She knew he was outside. Bob? Some rustling. The trees shaking. Bob! She went to the porch. Bob emerged from the curb where the driveway disappeared into the trees, into dark. He had no shirt. He was bare-chested. In fact, he looked like he had been running. But this was not what she noticed first. What she noticed was his hands, held out in front of him, turned upward and cupped a little, as if to catch rain. I... He pointed at the trees. Helen had the urge to run down to him, but wouldn't. She was so overwhelmed, and she was afraid of him. What did you do? That's what she thought, what came to her. Not what happened, but what did you do? He moved forward toward the porch, but didn't ascend. She panicked suddenly. She ran toward the screen door, reaching hurriedly inside and slapped the switch. This stopped Bob. She saw that his eyes were not adjusted. He'd been in the dark. She could see in the new light, see the shocking halo silver of his hair, his lined face. The light came from behind her, so she was better off than he, 
squinting and lifting his hand to his face. I killed a dog, I think. She had not told him about the dogs. She was unsure if they would come again when Bob was here. What do you mean? A dog attacked me. I hit it. I think it's dead. It attacked you? It came at me, yeah. Well, first of all, what, what were you doing out here? Where is it? It's back there. I don't, I don't think you should look. Why? The skull, it's... He made a gesture at his own head. I'll bury it in the morning. So why were you out here? I heard something. She saw the gun sitting on the porch swing. It tried to hurt you? I told you yes, that's why it's dead. Bob, I don't... Her chest pounded. She couldn't keep in what was coming. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. What is going on? Why will you tell me? What is happening? Her voice rose in the quiet light. It shook loudly upward. She stepped back, stumbled. She put her head down and went inside. Bob followed her in. He wasn't moving quickly, but this seemed on purpose, as if to keep from scaring her any further. She was sitting on the couch, her fingers digging aimlessly, ruthlessly into her knees. As he came through the door, the porch bulb behind him lit the hair on his arms. He looked colorlessly furred, like a silvery peach. It seemed suddenly vulgar and disrespectful. She thought of the dogs that had come, that she had seen. They'd not seemed aggressive at all. She felt protective of them. Bob, she was sure, was to blame. He must have provoked one of them, frightened it. And how could he have overpowered it? Killed it? He came to her and sat down next to her on the couch. She handed him his shirt pointedly and he put it on. While his arms were up, she saw his abdomen, which was more compact, more formidable than she remembered. They talked through the night. Bob was gentle. He touched her frequently. Helen felt shaky and sick. She said she felt the need to go home to check on things there. Something was bothering her, she said. She felt uneasy. Bob was silent, deciding how to say what he wanted, and then finally just did. He wanted to stay, he said. He didn't want to go back now. Would it be okay if he didn't go with her, he asked. Yes, she said. Yes, I understand. They decided she would return to the house and that Bob would stay at the cabin. Instead of being concerned that Bob was not going with her, she was convinced at this time that it was the right thing. It seemed the very logic of nature. Plus, she wanted to be away from him for a while. She knew that she could no sooner force him into the orbit of her obvious captivity, her harbor of domesticity, then she could chain him to her, put a fence there around the marriage, as if it were a yard with its own systems to maintain, an ever-circling thing. Besides, she wasn't sure if she wanted to see, if she was ready to see what would turn up in the yard. She left most of what they came with, for she planned to return here. She wasn't sure she trusted Bob with objects, with all the little things she maintained, all the little comforts she made sure they had. As she prepared the car, fatigue and anxiousness tugged at her, seemed to permeate her skull. She had the notion that if she left him now, she would lose him, would lose him to the trees and the alpine swamps, 
and the lake with its weeds and snakes, to the murky speckled bottom feeders and their imperceptible sounds. She could lose him to the battle with the dogs and their mysterious justice and purpose, to the forest's concealment of thieves and witches who break into summer homes and curse your nourishment with blood, a carved star. She could lose him to his changing, his growing wildness. On the drive home, she thought of their son. He'd gone to graduate school in the Midwest, studying mathematics, taking perhaps his calculatory skills from Bob and the teaching gene from her. Though that was a crude oversimplification, she supposed, she knew no one ever really knew about these things. She herself had never possessed the talent nor a passion for the maths. With an investment banker for a husband and a mathematician for a son, this was often a source of shame, something to keep hidden. She frequently forgot how to figure percentages, for instance, even on a calculator, and she allowed herself a wide berth while balancing her bank book for her bizarre and plentiful mistakes. She remembered as a grade school teacher that allotted time of day was the most challenging to get through, the most removed from the world, like trying to teach a made-up language, a language of dolls. She remembered their little faces screwed down on themselves, their heads nearly shrinking. At the level she taught, there was little more to do than memorization, mostly multiplication tables and the barest, most minor touchings of long division. Even so, she went through the motions, trying to appear sure of the importance of numbers, convinced that they would need them someday. She thought of him now, their son, David. How she had, throughout his life, felt like a semi-functional set of lights, trying weakly to furnish some glow. The house looked small when she approached it, the paint gentler, less vibrant than she assumed it was. It was because she had been away, she thought. She had been away and idolized the house, had made it, and her choices for it, more important, more interesting than they were. She sat in the car for a minute before opening the garage. She thought she could identify uneven shades of green where the neighbors hadn't properly watered the lawn. But then she blinked and this effect had shifted, had lessened, or was gone. And she didn't trust her eyes, and at the moment she didn't care. She took her things inside and shut the door. The silence here was like a desert, but with appliances. There was the just perceptible whir of the refrigerator that piped up every couple of hours. There was the clock. In the bathroom, she touched all the towels, feeling their textures, slightly different, like the differences on a beach in the sand's grain. She crawled into bed in her clothes, her knees up toward her body, and fell asleep. She woke in the fading light. Her eyes were sticky and dry. She shouldn't have left her lenses in. She felt like a new kitten ineffectually pawing her lids. She thought of the lizards she saw on television who bathed their eyeballs with their long tongues. She vaguely remembered stirring at one point during the night as if to rise, but ultimately, apparently, could not. She had been folded in so deep and so strangely into her sleep, like a fat into flour. Folding, the process by which cold fats are introduced into flour, also for blending items of delicate or differing textures. Her cooking class text resurfacing. She took this class with a couple of friends and had memorized this passage, for it seemed to her it said so many things about life. She had tried to tell them this afterwards when they had glasses of wine at a local bistro where dark wood pillars made a labyrinth of the dining room where bold, startling paintings of flowers lined the walls. 
They laughed at her a little, at her and her romance. She went to the phone and called Bob. She had meant to do this right away when she arrived home. She hoped he wasn't worrying or fussing. Or maybe she hoped he was. She didn't expect to necessarily reach him, given the reception. She had also thought during the drive home that they needed to restart the landline. She suddenly saw the arrogance of their neglect. At their age, what were they doing without a reliable phone for weeks at a time? Hello. Sorry. I made it. Sorry I didn't call when I got here. I fell asleep, if you can believe it. Maybe you can go down to the store tomorrow and call me there. I've been thinking that we really need a phone out there. It's silly we don't have one, don't you think? It's not safe. Especially... Well, anyhow, let's change that, okay? I hope you're okay. I love you. Call me tomorrow. Bye. She called her neighbors. She needed to. They would be wondering. Might even come and talk to her, which in the morning would be fine, but tonight she didn't want. She said she would come over for coffee tomorrow or the next day. She thanked them. There were no questions. She kept it contained. She called her son. She wasn't sure why she wanted to talk to him so badly. He was leaving for a dinner party soon, so she didn't keep him. But she considered the call a triumph because in his voice she heard a disappointment and she heard that instead of going, he would rather be talking to her. She nearly cried with this offering this kindness. Your dad's at the cabin, she said. I just came back to check on some things here. That was all she found herself saying. And it was the truth, wasn't it? For now, her version of the world, of the face of things, was intact. She went to the grocery store just before midnight. She had slept earlier, and she was not tired again yet. She wandered disconnected through the aisles. At the back of the store there was a long tank with sluggish insectoid lobsters on the bottom. With the tank lights turned off they were dappled and dark like stones. Though the display cases had been emptied for the night she saw some errant bits of ice left scattered on the astroturf lining. It looked as if there had been a party Tiny people walking about in there, tripping over the seams and curled green edges. The lingering scent of seafood made her gag. On television that night, there were many shows about abduction. Abduction, apparently, was hot. There was the removal of one's will and the replacing of it, by necessity or circumstance, with another's. Helen removed her clothes and stood in front of the bathroom mirror. The light was best in here, but she could not see all of herself. She went to the bathroom, took the full-length mirror from the wall, and leaned it softly against the back of the door, against hanging robes. She turned, moving her weight from one foot to the other. She tried, being still, to approximate walking. This gave her the look of a drawing in a science book, some stage of evolution. She changed weight, watching the muscles in her thigh, around her knee, take the burden. There were small purplish discolorations on her legs, which she supposed she knew were there, but she never really got used to seeing. Small filaments like bursts of vein, like patches of frost reaching out. The shapes reminded her, though she wouldn't be able to detail their shapes if she tried, of the bits of matter in the fluid of one's eye. She angled to see the back of her left leg. She rotated out at the hip like in ballet, the outturned stance. The back of her leg was speckled with them. 
She looked in a clinical way, removed. Thanks to her walks, her legs remained taut, with some slackening around her hips, at the very top of her thighs. The haunch. She thought she remembered vaguely the slow shock in her early thirties when her metabolism changed. Then her body grew generous. She swelled at the hips and upper arms. She remembered her shirts became tight there, taut, and wrinkled over her collarbone, the tops of her shoulders. Maybe the body now was like her own personal patch of earth, now drying and thinning, like a garden, like till. She felt small changes in temperature, the air moving nearly imperceptible over her skin, the soles of her feet sending separate messages, one on the rug and one on the cooler floor. She looked intently at her body, trying to see beneath the skin, to fathom her frame, her flesh once covering her body evenly, now had begun to abandon her shoulders, chest and ribs. She looked thinner now, with all of it cushioning her pelvis. She thought of old people and their broken hips, wondered if nature was preparing her. Still, she thought her body still looked ready, looked capable. She pinched a large section of herself and pulled. It was strangely without sensation. When Bob was a boy, he went camping with his uncle and cousin at the base of a mountain in their state. A hundred years ago, the mountain had erupted and it burned the earth for miles. The growth had returned fast with a terrifying vengeance as if up from hell. They took food and tents and hiked seven miles into the site. His uncle was a scout leader. He knew the ways in which the woods would get into a boy's lungs, would get under his fingernails, would make him a man. His cousin was younger by a year, but had the advantage of more time outdoors and was relaxed, agile, and full of facts. Sometime during the second night, his uncle disappeared. He was in his own tent, separate from the boys, and they woke without him. Assuming he was nearby, he had perhaps gone to the creek, they waited. They waited an hour, then two, then took turns walking the area and calling. Bob tried to be helpful, nudging through brambles a short way off the path, calling out, trying the whistle his uncle had given him before they set out. He spent more time crouched watchfully at the site, imagining his cousin not returning and leaving Bob to find his way back to the road, imagining bears, murderers, rogue species of ape. At dusk, his uncle wandered back, thirsty and disoriented. A swatch of hair was missing at the nape of his neck. He never could, or would, answer the questions posed to him about what had happened. He claimed not to remember, claimed he was walking and must have fallen, must have hit his head, though he also said he was in no pain, no wounds or bumps graced him, and there was no evidence on his clothing, no dampness, no dirt, of lying on the ground for many consecutive hours. After the trip, his uncle withdrew, he started subscribing to strange magazines with exposés on secret military operations. Gradually, he began to refuse to eat the same food as the rest of his family. He would stew big utilitarian pots of beans and rice and eat off them for weeks, freezing big ziplocks with dates. He was suspected of starting a fire in the field out of town, though no one could prove it. He became a ghost in his own house, a basement dweller. Bob had told Helen this after she went home with him for a holiday gathering as a way of explaining his uncle's thin, drawn face, his choppy, asylum-cut hair, the way his hands shook, the way he constantly monitored windows. 
She left at nightfall. She drove out of her neighborhood and approached the highway entrance they rarely used, the one near the tracks, the secret one. The one Bob always said was dangerous, its sudden narrowness. Every summer it seemed someone was killed there from some accident, some unawareness, some miscalculation. Bob said it reminded him of that hole cut through the giant redwood in California, the one smaller cars could get through, the one from brochures. She slipped out onto the road, trying to will the car quiet. She had the idea that she was conspicuous. For the first minute, she saw no one else, no other car on the road. But then she saw a small line of trucks coming from the direction of the forest. She wondered what they were carrying. She supposed it could be anything. She drove. She had not heard from Bob. Not at all. That fact had changed the last few days. In fact, she was a little unclear about how long she'd been home. It had been a succession of nights and the days, the blinds drawn, the sleep like a shroud. She had the thought she was going to confront something, but she didn't know what. Along the sides of the roads, she saw the twinkling eyes of animals, probably deer. She slowed a bit, becoming afraid. It was pitch dark as she approached the cabin. She turned the lights off, going up the driveway. She saw no light out front, nothing. She stopped the car and stared. The car was there. She could see its dark shape. She had the sharp, stabbing hope that he was sleeping. She got out of the car and listened to the new sounds here, the night. She moved toward the house, picking her feet up, feeling her way. As she went to the door, she felt for the key and put it gently in the lock. She could see from here the tiny light above the stove was on. She could see no others. The door swung gently open. The smell hit her immediately. She recoiled and raised her hand to her face. Something bumped in the kitchen. A gigantic thing. She heard the back door fly open and snap. She screamed, Bob! She ran frantically back out to the front porch, stumbling back into the yard. She wanted to run, but she didn't know where. She ran to the car, got inside, and flooded the yard with high beams. Where should she go? Should she get someone, the police, Alex? She nearly fainted in her panic and indecision. She stared frantically around the illuminated trees and let the hard knowledge of it sink in. She had to face it, and she wasn't sure she could. She got out of the car leaving the lights on. Bob, she called it forward, to the wall of light against the house, against the trees. Bob. There was a slight sound, the faintest thing in the trees to the left. She stopped breathing, careful to not change her appearance, her steady face. She held it and strained her ears to the point where they could bleed. Then she stopped. She knew he was there. Come out. The trees fanned in a tiny night breeze. The high, thin smell was there, carried on it like a thought. It's okay. Bob. The sound terrified her. It was choked garbled. It broke her heart. Helen. There was a slowing in the voice. It became softer, more like him. She felt she would break. She moved toward the trees. She heard scrambling, branches breaking. Go, no! Are you hurt? No. The world thinned and spun. There was a lump of shadow as something flew across its surface, something large and winged, a 
a bat, a gigantic wild moth. Can I wait for you inside? No. There was a choking sound, like a sob. Go. Leave me. Why? You know. Don't. I'll see you again. Just go now. She went back to the car. She hadn't known what to do, but he had told her. He had decided for her. Someone had made a decision. That's what mattered right now. Right now, at this moment. When she got in, she started the car and turned off the lights. She willed her eyes to adjust, and they did, slowly, with her wild blinking. She watched for some minutes, and actually then it seemed bright. The moon was bright. When he finally showed himself, he moved to the center of the yard, slowly. She saw his hunched back and great sharp ears. She could not see his face, and for this she was glad. The last thing she thought before she left was, he was beautiful, really, in this new shape. He would start again. He looked like a king. Wolf Stories, Part 2, Mac the Knife The city represents law and order. The word police derives from Greek polis, town, while the villains dwell in the lawless wild nature outside. The word villain, a Middle English variant of villain, peasant, once meant a rustic, and the root of the word is in villa. Originally, the word was merely a simple description of where someone dwelt. The word shifted, coming to mean criminal. J. Griffiths, wild. First of all, she says, I want to tell you that I'm honored to be here. Your group has become, in the world of new theater, a name to emulate, to aspire to. And to be doing what you've been doing on such tight budgets, that is very tricky. I've seen many of your productions, and I've been very surprised by your choices and very interested. You have a way of Underlining aspects of text without distracting from them. I love words, as you probably know, and I like to be faithful. But that said, there is still so much that can be done within that structure. What do you like most, if I may ask? This is Ray. He is a natural stage manager. She pauses. Orpheus descending. And possibly fool for love. There is a strangeness about those plays. An eerie quality. A spookiness, I guess, that you captured. You played with the layers. Sometimes they were, were added, sometimes taken away, made simple. Her French accent is thick. So... When was the last time you attempted a musical? We look at each other. A little bulge of dread rolls among us. She catches this. Now s stay with me. Laughs. I would like to do some Brecht with you. I would like to do the Three Penny Opera. She is the only person who would dare smoke in here, and she does. She reaches into her pocket. Now, I have to step into my role here. I am the guest director, 
and I must get my... She shifts. The hat on, you know. So don't hate me from this moment, okay? We will talk about the play more. How does it sound? Are you up for it? Of course, if you have strong ideas against it, well, that is fine. But allow me to try and persuade you. Milena Dolan is small, with swept and lightening hair. A slight roundness from age appearing around her middle, where certain areas separate from your body, seem to not belong. Square glasses in front of her large eyes. She wears gray and brown mostly, and black. She does not need to put her beauty forward anymore to prove anything. She has earned her faith. Some of us sit on the floor. She sits on a piano bench, though she isn't thinking of playing. We share a piano with a dance hall half a block away. They have one, but sometimes need two, depending on performers. The street where our theater is has a barber shop, needle fin with just enough room for a row of seats and mirrors. There's a thick sink nestled on the back wall. Through the basement of the shop, you can enter the tunnels underneath this part of the city. This is the most direct route, and it's visible if you go on the high price tour, which takes you through a fraction of the originals, widened, reinforced, and lined with boardwalk and gentle stairs. There are differing stories and accounts of the exact use of these tunnels or the dates they were dug. The most prominent is that they were built for the purpose of crime, and during Prohibition they were used for smuggling barrels into the businesses of the street. There are darker stories with a more medical bent, tales of the organ trade. Teresa who comes at night, has placed little objects in places along our floors, in the corners there. She claims these talismans will keep them away, the things seeping up from the earth. We do some reading the next day, some treating. Those of us not playing parts will do many other things. We all do everything. We can't hire out. We have to pay our rent here. We have to pay each other. The first line of the prologue is, Beggars are begging, thieves thieving, whores whoring. A ballad singer sings a moritat. We will start with this each day. When we come to work, she insists we say it together. It makes us laugh. It is our preparation. I do not know when she makes the decision about me. Sometime during these few days. When we talk about the play, its histories, its origins. About the singing, she says. We will do some vocal games, some visualization. This play is funny, exaggerated, a little grotesque. So I think those of us who are not... Singers will nonetheless be able to use our weakness to our advantage, yeah? Have fun and don't be afraid. We watch a recording of a production. Though we are warned not to internalize our first impressions, not to reproduce. We know this instinctively. We see what is built and think how to tear down, how to rend, to sew its parts together. She finds me during this and says, You are to be the gangster, McKeith. My apartment looks out over a narrow street, into the wan brown bricks of the opposite one. Behind my building is a garden. It began in weeds long before. A greedy landlord let it go and would not let anything happen to it. Not with good intentions, not in protection, but in stubborn laziness. A show of ownership. It grew wild and harbored squirrels and long, clicking, many-legged insects. Mice relaxed there and then were hunted, torn apart by cats. Then the landlord died. He was killed in the hallway fighting with someone, disgraceful in his undershirt, 
which had pulled up his body and left his belly white and exposed and round like a bag of sand. His killer packed some clothes and left in the night. No one gave this person up. Everyone hated him, the landlord. He was always in the hallways when they came home, no matter the time. He would invent things to do. You'd come home at three in the morning and he'd be out there, they would say, fiddling with wallpaper, checking a seam. After he died, the garden flourished. It was nearly ridiculous, like a children's book. It was like a village under tyranny suddenly freed. Of course, that was not exactly true. It would never be like that exactly. But the garden was tended, and it was shaped and used, and things were planted there. From a little window in my kitchen, I can see some of it. In the mornings, Mr. Fowler goes out there to meditate. He crouches next to the tomatoes, in the aggressive fronds of rosemary, by the frothy carrots. Sometimes he makes a sound, a low hum. From my window on the third floor, it is impossible to hear. It is indistinguishable from the sounds of the city, from the cars on the street. Will is Peachum. Jane is Mrs. Peachum. Fania is Polly. Forrest is Brown, the police chief. He has wide shoulders that look strong under clothing, but they are thin like wings. Kate is Lucy. She is the funniest of us all. She is the kind of funny that frightens. When you think she may have a breakdown, you think she may burn up. Smith, Filch, Dale and Errol. Marla is playing Reverend Kimball, and Tom is Jenny Jenny. That last bit, I think, is inspired. The rest are on design, costumes, everything else. Lighting... Everyone knows lighting. Some are better at it than others. Some are in need of help. But we all do it. We all have to be ready. We need to illuminate each other. I remember when I was little, my parents took me to a community theater production. It was summer. We were on vacation. The town was small and engorged with tourists. The play was a musical, and there were several children in it that must have been my own age or close enough to seem it. I hardly remember noticing them on stage. Their job was to run around, I believe, and make expressions, nothing intrusive. At the break, it was still light, though it was fading. And as everyone gathered outside to smoke near the stage door and the benches by the elk statue, I could see a thin slip of a lake behind the print shop and the lodge restaurant porch. Of course, I don't remember those things. Not about the smoking. I just assumed they were because everyone did. Everyone's parents, it seems. Or about the visible sunset. Though I am sure that it was. I saw the children outside during intermission. They still wore their stage costumes and makeup, as they were needed in the second half of the show. They were dressed as ragamuffins, with cheeks smeared dark with a put-on grubbiness. I assume now, as I think of this, that they just had too much energy to stay inside with the rest of the cast, being so young. They ran among people, giggling. They were a strange combination of out of place and completely natural. I felt a strange thing then, which I recognized as envy. It came gently, and it stayed with me for a long time. It sounds superficial, the image, but it's how I came at it first, from the exterior. The outer first, then the inner response. I have been back there to that town. I have stood on the bridge with the no jumping sign and I did not jump. I ate dinner above the town's main street with a girl I did not love while the sky turned the color of a bruise. A river skirts the town and an immense lake rumored to harbor a serpent or a monstrous fish of some kind, as they all are, all lakes of considerable depth. There are deep passages, some say, to the sea. 
When we returned from our trip that summer, I wanted to be involved in something theatrical, anything on stage. My mother must have helped me, looked around. There was a youth center putting on a play that fall. Anyone could come. I don't remember auditions. They must have waited to see the turnout and then selected something with an appropriate cast. There was one girl who played a man's part, even. There were irrepressible titters whenever she hugged her onstage wife, proclaiming, Darling! The play was a fairy tale of some sort. Nothing serious about it. There were witches and forest dwellers, the approximation of a dark wood. I remember during some scripted struggle, a flat painted tree fell down with a snap. I have a writer friend who's expressed to me his jealousy of performing as an outlet. What I do, he says, there is no physical element, no release. There is sitting in a room. And then, much later, there's a public reading of some sort, either arranged by you or by someone else, and that's the closest it gets. Once, he said, when I was reading, I came close. I was reading poetry. The room was quiet. It was in a bar, so people had drinks, which is sometimes a bad thing, but that night it was good. I could hear the silence, the breath of the audience. After I uttered a last line, I heard someone exhale like they'd been pushed in the stomach. Someone else clapped, and it was very out of place. I was so in touch, I was leading the room. It was the most grateful I have ever felt before or since, and also the most assured of my own power. She tells me early in the day, says we need to have a talk. I go with Milena to a bar. It is late afternoon and the streets are becoming striped with shade. She asks me to choose the place, but seeing my cautious indecision, she does it for me. It's down some stairs that appear to have been recently sprayed. The stairwell is damp and smells of a high, thin human dirt and the earthy smell of wet concrete. We take a seat at a lacquered booth next to an old drink advertisement, which is so large it's been segmented in shards like a puzzle and dispersed about the bar, faded and mysterious in its antique boisterousness. I go up to the bar and get us whiskeys. I place one awkwardly upon a thin square napkin in front of her. You know how an improperly chosen word can change everything? She asks. Think about that in your performance physically. I wanted to talk to you a bit about McKeith. I have seen other portrayals, and I wondered if you had any ideas. Well, I know the song, a starting point. I smile. Do you know how the song came to be written? I shake my head. She lights a cigarette and gives me one. The first man to play Mackie Messer in the original creation of the opera was concerned that his entrance was not dramatic enough. He suggested that there be a song just for him to introduce the character. He was terribly vain, but Brecht must have thought that the idea was at least worth something, because that night he wrote out some verses, and Kurt Weill took them and set them. This type of song existed, this kind of dark, funereal-sounding thing, a dirge, the moritat. These tunes described criminals, you know. So you see, it was not the original, not at first, but it has become one of the most recognized pieces of music in history. Cleaned up, then, by Louis Armstrong. And Bobby Darren's version, which I quite like, there's something about that big band sound that suits it modernizes the swagger, you know? But of course the lyrics are trimmed. So you had this in mind for a while. Well, it came to me recently. There were some personal things happening, you know. I suppose I just felt like, like all of a sudden I would look at something and see facades and people and things. 
nothing had just one layer. There was no honesty. There was not even a possibility of honesty. It was as if it couldn't exist. It was like a creature too delicate to live, which has now become legend. And then this play surfaced. You know, they did that big production on Broadway. I read an article about the costume designer, all the edgy materials, his leathers, fishnets, what have you. And I remember thinking that there's something still kind of a punk about it, some protest spirit. There is nothing sweet about the Three Penny Opera. Even its creation was a charade of sorts. You know, it was Brecht's secretary who had the idea and got the copy of the Beggar's Opera and translated it into German for him. They say he stole with genius. Well, this is definitely a case of that. Lottie Lenya, Kurt Weil's wife, said that she learned a friend attempted to distill the very nature of Brecht. He said there was a copy of Das Kapital in his bedside table with a cheap thriller tucked inside. So, of course, it doesn't sound like I really like it. I don't mean to talk like that, but I don't know that it moved me until I started to go through these things, you know? Then the wickedness of it reached me. She tells me, Now I cannot approach telling you how to make your interpretation. I wouldn't do it. I respect all of you too much to do that. But there are certain things I might like to see that I might not have seen before. In our production? Yes, specifically in your interactions. She sat forward a bit. She reached up under the corner of her glasses and rubbed her temple. The play is pretty much like a cartoon, you know? Usually, McKeith is like a smooth gangster. He's fairly undisturbable, always in control. But I find that it's very difficult to feel tension or fear about such a character. How can you be captivated by someone who has no fear himself, who will never be thrown off course? Who can be afraid of such a man? I suppose it's the idea of evil and it's being unstoppable, unable to be conquered. But it's not. Because then all you would need to fight it would be good, which is not difficult and boring besides. In my neighborhood, there's a restaurant that continuously advertises its most challenging specials on a board outside the door. There are innards, extremities, over spetzel and grits, under strange gravies and breadings. The diner itself is odd physical colors as well. The colors of bruise, the sign, the reds and blues of blood. Lately, it's been low creatures, the specials, snakes or frogs, or at least the parts of animals that touch the earth. In the morning, bear claw and bottomless well of coffee. At lunchtime, pork belly sandwich. And for supper, frog legs with root vegetables in a fragrant mushroom sauce. I read Paul Johnson's essay on Bertold Brecht. It is called Heart of Ice. He writes, I have striven in this account to find something to be said in Brecht's favor. But apart from the fact that he always worked very hard and sent food parcels to people in Europe during and just after the war, but this may have been Weigel's doing, there is nothing to be said for him. He is the only intellectual among those I have studied who appears to be without a soul-redeeming feature. He describes the lack of warmth in Brecht's relationship of his lack of interest in people as individuals. This was probably why he couldn't create characters, he writes, only types. His personality and appearance was pieced together with scraps like a quilt. His favorite color was gray, and he devised costumes for himself, usually workers' shirts and proletarian leather waistcoats. His detractors claimed 
He wore silk underneath his Marxist creations. The woman Milena told me about, the one who sent for and translated the manuscript of the beggar's opera, was a devoted secretary and lover to Brecht for years. When he selected another woman for marriage arrangement, she tried to commit suicide. These are things I am learning slowly. Some things stick to me, and some things slip away. And some reach a part of me, of my mind, that are out of reach, that I have no access to. And the shark, he has teeth, and there they are for all to see. And my Keith, he has his knife, but no one knows where it may be. When the shark has had his dinner, there is blood upon his fins. But my Keith, he has his gloves on. They say nothing of his sins. One morning, James comes in to paint some backdrops. There is much happening visually behind us on stage. There are slogans and sayings, or what appear to be. There is a direct line to the audience. This is essential to the humor and the stamp of Brecht, this idea here of the fourth wall, of the breach. He is to begin this morning working on this. Teresa, who cleans for us twice a week, is there. She usually does night rounds and is at the theater when it's dark. This morning she stayed here, has lingered to talk to the first person to arrive. There's a phone number she has, Dale's, I think, which she has tried. She says there were things going on last night up on the roof. She went up to look but became afraid to open the door. But the sound stopped. She said. When she approached the door to the roof, they stopped. James sits her down on a folding chair in the ticket office and fishes in a desk to find her a drink. He has no trouble finding one. There are bottles placed strategically all around the rooms. One never knows when the nerves will be short. Milena sits in our seats. We are dismantled at this point. Honeycombs of chairs pushed back and to the side. Occasionally, one of our lights will catch her big glasses. There's a roundish flash from her lens there in the dark, like an animal at night by the side of the road. We are working on a scene. We are beginning to find our body language. Molina calls to us. Will, you need to sort of come forward with that, you know? It should be more exaggerated, I think. Yes. Yes, come towards us. And you. She addresses me. You know a little bit what will be going on behind you here, right? You should be an extension of it. But you need to be like a wolf. You are a wolf. We begin rehearsals in earnest. We read... We take it slow. We make ourselves sick with coffee, with our racing hearts. This is our favorite part, everything open ahead of us. Nothing has been pinned down, nothing decided. So the ideas swirl. They keep you awake. They fly past your head, taking nips like carnivorous, murdering birds. How Milena came to us. She did not live in town. She had come to see a friend she became close to while making a film. Sasha. Sasha had been married five times and would have been married more, but two of her prospective fiancés had died. She told Milena, I guess they couldn't wait. On this night, Milena was spending time with a man who claimed to love her beyond all reasonable means. He was married. His wife was in Baritz. He said she went crazy and would never come back. Milena knew this to be false. She knew it was false, though she wanted company in this town at that time. Her year, though just halfway through, 
had left her often sleepless, instilled with fear. If she pictured it as a thing, an object, it was a sharp, threatening mass. They went to a play. She had been curious about a particular theater group. They were doing Fool for Love, the Sam Shepard piece. The man she was with expressed reservation. He was unnecessarily dismissive of American playwrights, but she insisted. I am going anyway, she said. Why not come with me? When they arrived in the theater, she became aware of a light odor. It was just there, barely present, then grew as the first scene unfolded. It was a low, earthy green scent, like sage perhaps, like a desert flower. She began to turn to Leon, this man she was with, and then didn't. She caught a side view of the pale puff of his face and couldn't. She turned back. She realized she really didn't want him there. In fact, she was overwhelmed with distaste. At that moment, she willed her mind to detach from his field of energy, to dispel it like a rain off wax. She willed him gone, he and his ideas about American plays. And for a while he was. The character May wandered around on stage. There is a transformation scene where she moves about, taking off this, placing this and that on herself. And the intent is that, without the audience realizing it, she has metamorphosized before their eyes. Hidden in her quick, nervous movements, she has changed herself into something else, another creature, to get ready for a date. Stage lights fade. I picked you up out of the back seat there and carried you into this field. Thought the cold air might quiet you down a little bit. But you just kept howling away. Then, all of a sudden, I saw something move out there. Something bigger than both of us put together. And it started to move toward us kind of slow. And then it started to get joined up by some other things just like it. Same shape and everything. It was so black out there I could barely make out my own hands. But these things started to kind of move in on us from all directions in a big circle. And I stopped dead still and turned back to the car to see if your mother was all right. But I couldn't see the car anymore. Melina felt the skin lift right off her arms and neck. It just rose and brushed past her ears, where it grazed the tops. What she knew. I played the old man that night, my face made furrowed with pencils. Instead of the rocking chair suggested, we had a horseshoe pit low in the front of the stage, and one of those little creatures with the spring underneath, with the handles in their heads, found in playgrounds. What she did not know, that my hand was broken then. I pushed through the evening without pills or wrapping. When I described the child crying in the field in its darkness, I felt my bones shifting in my sleeve. The first line of description in the play's notes reads, this play is to be performed relentlessly without a break. When I was younger, in my 20s, and when I had grown that group of friends that you grow when you leave home, and they become your family, we would often take drugs and put ourselves into vulnerable situations. I don't mean dangerous ones, physically at least, but situations where it took all of our energy not to be discovered. I suppose it was a way to gauge how far off the road we were, how magnified or compromised were our minds and eyes and thoughts. If we could do things we would normally do in an evening, walk down the street, go to a bar or a grocery store, if we could experience the wildness hidden and lurking in those everyday activities, then we might learn something. Plus, there was the challenge, the concealment of our fraud. Even if you could hide your overwhelming disorientation and speak normally, 
somehow get yourself through a conversation or transaction. There were always the things you couldn't help, namely in the eyes. They grew wide and watery, the pupils big as peas. The bravest and calmest of us with a car would take us to an all-night grocery store, the one with the odd carpeting throughout, a dingy, inexplicable pink. We'd head straight for the toy aisle, incredulous at the chintzy plastic contraptions, the whiz-bang seductions. We'd marvel at how these things came to be, how the materials were shaped and glued, dyed, the focus in payroll and waste. I think about going to a doctor. My body is doing strange things. I will occasionally have trouble with balance, or I will be standing, and I'll feel the ground shake. I know this area of the state is prone to tremors, small ones barely perceptible, but which over time take their toll on sidewalks, on the streets. But I don't know that I trust my suddenly being able to feel these shifts, and with such a frequency. Milena grows impatient with us today. We are trying to find our voices specifically for singing. There are notes on this, on not falsifying the act of it, of not pretending as if the flight from speech to song does not exist. So it is not an extension. It's a different thing altogether. The body must show this. Do you agree? Remember, you don't have to agree. We are feeling tested today with no mastery, no grace. We look at each other. Well, we're not sure what she is asking. Fania asks me to leave while she works one day. Considering her character's relationship to mine, the foolish way she goes, she is just figuring out these things, the ways this happens. She doesn't want me there. I have to do some stuff in the back, I'll go do that. No, I mean, I need you to leave. I can't have you here. She reaches out strangely and grasps my forearm. As if then unsure what to do, she squeezes it. I pull away and take her hand. Whatever you need, but are we okay? Of course. Did I do something? No, no nothing. Just character stuff. Yeah, I mean, you become really different, you know, when you're him. I just don't know what I'm doing yet, I guess. And, you know, I have to love you, or I have to believe that I do, and then I have to be humiliated by you. Does any of this make sense? It does. You guys work. I'll leave for a couple hours. I say this quickly. I bend and give her hand a little kiss. On my way out, I touch her picture in the hall. I mean to do this gently, but I miscalculate, knocking it sideways. My brother comes to town. He is in sales. There are some classes, some meetings. I'm sure keynote speakers will be involved. He lives in Denver, like the omelet. He's a robust, jocular sort. We can have a good time together if both of us suspend something, some part of ourselves. He is, I suppose, a good man. The key is, we need to start drinking right away. I arrange to meet him somewhere I know we can. I'd offered to pick him up from the airport to go to his hotel, but he refused. Hey, I get reimbursed for that stuff. No use wearing out that piece of shit car if it still runs. Hey, I have a different car now. Is it a piece of shit? Of course. I take a big swallow of beer and smile. Cars have always come to me through others. Their charity or necessity. I've never owned a new car. Occasionally this bothers me. Like when I want to get in it and drive for a long while. I don't usually trust whatever vehicle I have to get me there, to not break down. It is costly taking that chance. 
I don't really drive it much, though. It serves my needs. I look out the window. The light is fading, and there's a strange blue glow in the streets. A woman in a white coat passes the window and looks up, her hood tumbling down her back. She reaches back for it absently, slowing her pace. Speaking of, his eyes widen but do not glint. Seeing any ladies? Ah, uh, I wonder what to say. Not really. I go out, but nothing lasts. So what's wrong with you? I shrug. Lots of things, I guess. Working too much? Whatever, I suppose. How's Wendy? Oh, she's good. He turns his glass back and forth. She wants to have a kid. Don't you? Yeah, sure. You don't sound too convincing. Well, shit, sure I want one. It's just, well, you know how it is. Though I guess you don't. He laughs. I think I can guess. Guess what? Well, it's stressful, right? Shit, yeah, it's a whole big thing. It's, he sat back and waved his hands. Everything. Yeah. It could be really great, though, you know. Oh, yeah, I am sure it will be. It'll be very cool. What are you going to name it? Shut up. He drains his glass. Ed. Either way, Ed. We both laugh. My brother asks me what my group is working on. A German musical, I say. No shit, he says. You sing? Yup, I say. Can I come and see it? No, we're just in rehearsals. What is it? I tell him. Never heard of it, he says. Well, it's something occurs to me. Do you know Mac the Knife, I ask him? Huh, the who? Mac the Knife, you know, the song, Oh, the shepherds with his teeth. Yeah, yeah, that's from it. Cool. Do you sing that? No, but someone sings it about me. I'm that guy, Mac the Knife. I take a big drink. There's all these different versions of the song. The Bobby Darren one, the one that most people know, or Louis Armstrong's maybe too, they're cleaned up a lot. He changed the words. How come? Well, I mean, he's a killer, you know, and the song's pretty violent. But it's sung sort of in this way that makes it funny. So you're the killer. Yeah, I say. I'm the ultimate badass. The neighborhood endures an escalating cautiousness and paranoia as the regular episodes of theft change to bloody physical attacks. There are two of them, and they happen when it is very late, after two in the morning. One is a woman, and then, unusually, there is a man. They are separate, save for the fact that they happen on the same night. They are walking in a dark area, and this gives them a diminished amount of sympathy from a few, especially the woman, because, of course, everyone knows what could happen to you when you do that, when you have no boundaries, when you ignore the night. Neither of them saw clearly what came at them, but they felt they were being tailed for some blocks. The lack of sound or sight, of concrete reason for this a non-issue, as logic, as their confidence dissolved. They felt rather than heard the presence of breath. They were aware of their own sins, the fear from their skin. The woman admitted to this, but not the man. Overall, his account was meat and potatoes, the business as he passed, the hard luck and crazy trick of it, of this crazy thing. He wondered about money, about insurance, the work lost from it, the pain. Will he get medicine, he asked, and who would pay? Her thoughts were different. 
She chose the transformation she endured and the thought of how little an impact her will made in the scheme of it, in the voracious need of her attacker to do some harm. If it were personal, she told the police, at least I could wrap my mind around it. All along the Thames embankment, people fall down with a smack. And it is not plague or cholera, words around that Mac is back. On a blue and balmy Sunday, someone drops dead in the strand, and a man slips around the corner. People say, Macheath's on hand. In my neighborhood, there are murmurs, speculations. The storekeeper where I buy sandwiches is adding a new thing to his repertoire. He usually comments briefly on each of the things he puts on. Lettuce, got your roughage there, cheddar, the king of cheese, mustard, good for the head. Be careful out there, he says now. The thin cellophane of his gloves makes a strange, loose, extra skin over his fingers, wrinkling up over the knuckles. I watch him layer pastrami. He closes it up. Wait, double that, I say. Here we go, a real meat lover, he says. But then I'm going to give you a pickle, too. You've got to have something green. Oh, hell, here's two, he says. Be careful out there. We are all sitting, circled in the morning. A small clump of our stage lights have gone dark, and things look uneven and confused. Milena has brought three flat boxes of bright Danish, and we eat them, sticky-fingered, off of thin, inadequate napkins. There is also coffee, a cardboard cask of it. It's drained quickly like a sacrifice. This morning, we try to talk about how things are going. Milena has unearthed a big black pillow from somewhere and sits on it, slowly crossing her legs. Her back straightens, unfurling. How are you feeling? Do we want to talk anything over? I assume the answer is yes, it must be. How are you feeling? Asks Jane. Now, I have some thoughts, of course, but I'm not now all of a sudden your boss. It's your company. I'm a guest. You know each other very well. I want you to talk. It's brought up first how we've never done anything like this. Not just the obvious point of the musical, but the slipperiness of the satire. I feel like some things aren't getting from the page to the room. Certain points have to be made very obviously, and I feel like they're not getting very far. It's like throwing something that's really heavy, says Daryl. Or too light, so it won't travel. Like a Kleenex? That's Kate. Have you done Oscar Wilde? Asks Melina. That's completely different, says Forrest. I mean, you have to watch your delivery, but it's much easier to get. It's smooth. And a lot of it's in the language, which is different here. There have been many translations, Melina says with a nod. What I mean is, there's not as much attention paid to the words themselves here. It's more the concept. Do you feel any connection to the material at all? Did I choose poorly? No, it's a good challenge. And there's lots of interest in it. It's good for our group. But there's a sense of play that I've been having a little trouble finding. Errol's hands brushed nervously at each other. I can't speak for anyone else, but it doesn't feel like it's in the words, like it sometimes is. You know how you just get the tone of it right away? I just feel like I'm going to find it, and from everything then on, everything will click, but I think it has to happen in animation, like in movement. Well, yes, it's a big, dark joke. That's just it, says Errol. I know it's funny in my head. I can see it's intense, 
but I don't feel it physically. So, okay, let's work on this wicked, slippery thing. Melina pushes herself up. She makes a funny, sudden sound out of the side of her teeth. Sonia lives above a bar on a broken street. This can be said because the street is actually literally broken. The street has a warp like a formidable scar down its back. She lives alone above a bar with a constant thump-thump in the evening hours. Occasionally, there is a decorous live band with enough hostile swagger to light her apartment with strange colors, with bad air. But the jukebox is preferable. It is a more constant sound and, after a while, a recognizable one. You could be surprised with the hundreds of selections, the same ten or fifteen repeated, as if a significant universal force, previously debated and denied, existed in the gathering of strangers. She has strategies to deal with this, the nightly assault. She longs for a new address, a new placement on the earth. But she tries to appreciate her aloneness, and she likes having a strategy. It involves various things. Earplugs, faraway radio stations, and piles of big, soft rugs. Out her window, there's a big parking lot with industrial, still-painted white rectangles with green, yellow, and white tufts of weeds. Something happened with the lot. A woman waiting to open up a bird-watching shop decided she needed it for herself. This big pond expanse and bought it and built her shop there. It was comical, a small square dwarfed by the parking field. She spent two fevered, passionate years there and then died, leaving the lot in limbo between masters to fall to ruin. It has turned into a criminal flatland, a moor of tricks. From her window, Fania witnesses many shady dealings. Things change hands. Groups of people stand there and communicate via one ambling tough between themselves. There are fights, the specifics of which you can never see. Just a huddle, just a quickly raised arm. Someone stumbles away. There are times when she feels as if she were looking out across a vast step, just watching nature, its ruthless stage. Knowing no true week, no Monday through Friday sensibilities, we have decided to take a couple of days off. We hope to rest, to think, to get some distance. My experience with this period of time is that the first day one sleeps, greedily, past morning. There is a revulsion, an attempted avoidance of work, the role, the set, the endless adjustments in architecture. There are errands, the taking care of oneself. There is television, perhaps, a gentler pursuit. I go to a clinic to see a doctor. I came to this one because I can see a doctor for very little money and because the bills usually come exquisitely late, sometimes as late as four months. The consequence is that there is always a long, strange wait. I stare for a while at the small, obligatory fish tank. I see from my seat a few gentle orange smears and some sharper ones, darker, smaller, like birds on a sky. I take a men's magazine with a white and red cover. These are the colors that are supposed to appeal to me as a man, especially red. It is supposed to trigger something primal in me, or so I've read. Something connected to my consumer spirit, my predatory nature. I flip through and see a chart about what shoe shape means about your work and sexual habits. Then skim an actor's profile... I'm not afraid of getting down in the dirt, a large quote in the center of the page tells me, or to show my darker side. He has recently become respectable after his child performer days by playing the role of a married cop who falls in love with his partner, a man. There are, 
according to him, many make-out scenes. So, to underline his new edgy vibe, he is smoking in the picture. A woman takes me into a room where I answer questions perfunctorily. Medications, family, sickness, and death. She fastens a pulse cuff around my arm. When she leaves, I stare at the pink shapes of organs on the wall, which look decidedly like sea creatures, like something tidal, briny, and exposed. I have a dream that I am walking, and a woman and her dog come up to me. The dog is little and black like Toto, and bounds to me and wags its tail. The woman apologizes. She says, with the cemetery nearby, she comes across many ghosts. As they, to her, look like regular people, she watches the dog. She can tell by its reaction if they are made of flesh. She says she has family in the cemetery. Grandmothers and fathers are buried there. And their parents, too. We are suddenly upon it. It is startlingly small, taking up only half the space of a front lawn. I assume she lives in this house with the cemetery in its yard, but I don't know. Does it bother you? I ask. There are hills beside us, covered with grass. There's the birdmen, she says. They come in the evening. The worst thing, she tells me, is knowing that they will just come back the next night and the night after that. Someone is found dead behind a grocery store. There's fear around the neighborhood and then a certain quiet acceptance. After all, this is a city and people kill each other. And that even if we hadn't heard of it lately, even if the news has been good, it has been happening anyway. All the time, surely someone didn't make good on something from someone and was made to pay. And there were probably disappearances, those not showing up for work, those with few friends who just stop answering the phone, stop appearing at all. Whether you think things are better or worse than they used to be, whether you think evil is born or made into itself by the dull and vicious things in the world, you know they have always been there and always will be. For we know each of us deep down, that we have no grasp on this idea, this number, this ratio of safety. It is a man, this victim, who they initially estimate to be in his late 30s. He has no wallet, no identification. He is covered with trash, but sloppily, incompletely, as if buried by an animal, using what it could find. The estimated time of death is 3 a.m. There's some hair torn from his head on the left side and some lesions there, some scratches as if from claws. Because of the theft of the wallet and the activity in the area, there is talk of continuation, of escalation, of the original thief or thieves. We are given animal cards by Melina, each one of us, I suppose she knows us well enough by now, or thinks she does. Someone asks her if they're all different, and she says, no, that some are repeated. She says she realizes that this may be an impossible request, considering us. She asks us not to share them with each other, to keep them secret. They are for you, she tells us. They are not to be self-conscious about they are not personal in the way that we are able to take them out of here and into our lives. They are specific to this time, to our time together, to our roles in this production. There's a ceremonial feel as she hands them to us. She does this with the card facing her, and she seems to give one last glance, checking her choice. His head nods appreciatively. Milena does a quick sidestep and hands Jane hers. Then Fania. Fania makes a little sound, a little exhale, and seems to consider it. She looks troubled by it. She looks very pretty today, I think. Just come in from the wind. 
Her hair is gathered sloppily around the back of her head, and this gives her a wild crown like some kind of bird. I wonder about this, how I've started to notice her again recently. Some years ago, we spent a lot of time together. I'm not sure what happened. One night, things turned, and we seemed to see each other beyond that first rush. It frightened us away. I put my card in my pocket with the animal facing my body. I had spent a horrible morning with itching skin and the afterburn of a nightmare. But for the rest of the day, my voice is on its best behavior, strong and clear. Before we leave that day, Melina gathers us together and asks us to be careful. Things are getting violent, she says. Account for this and protect yourselves and each other. I have a dream. I am in the house I grew up in, and there are voluminous amounts of food. This will happen occasionally. When I'm hungry in the night, I will dream of food and eating food, eating and eating. This also happens sometimes with cocaine, as I dreamed frequently, almost nightly, for years after I curbed its use. In this dream, there's a strange, pale-colored food everywhere. And there are also dogs to eat. Live ones running around that you can select and kill right there like lobster. I select a black dog and begin to kill it, then decide I cannot, that I don't need it. With all this food, I don't need to kill this dog. I don't need to eat it too. A troubled Panicked feeling comes over me. Can you finish this for me? I say to someone else in the house. I can't do it. I have to get out of here. I mean, can they finish the job I started? The job of killing. I know I can't just leave the dog like this. It is up and walking, but there seems to be skin missing from its neck. As I see pink flesh and yellow ropey tendon running from its head to its back. I go out the front door toward my godparents' house across the street, a place that used to be comforting to me, but in my adult years has become a place of sad mystery, as their own children, forever flailing in the world, are repeatedly fetched from the house by cops. I see my godmother there tonight on the lawn in the moon. She looks to be dancing there on the flat, bare space, bearing no small fence. No bush, just a thin skin of grass. Someone else is found. This time it's in a parked car. It appears the window was smashed and the man is hanging half out of the car, scraped by shards. His left shoulder has been dislocated. There's a large gash on his chest. He's discovered on a side street by an insomniac dog walker whose first sign of terror is the straining of his whip-thin greyhound on a leash. He does not see the man at first, just the mostly closed passenger door and something dark on the sidewalk. He looks at this. The dog gasps and pulls. It's not something he would normally be jarred by, this concrete discoloration living in the city. Stains are everywhere, on everything. The car is white, with a jagged hitch on the back bumper. He catches his pants leg as he walks around to the driver's side. The shattered glass on the pavement looks like stars. This blood, going the other direction, leading from the passenger side, is someone else's. It looks like someone dragged themselves, then got up to run. There's a smear of shoe print. The drops end at the foot of a pulled-down fire escape. The inhabitants of the building provide the authorities no information, said nothing was heard. We hear things all the time, they say. How to pick out what's wrong from what's right. There is one exception. A man who lives alone. A man in a thin shirt with years of times stacked in his corners, gently sloping around his walls. He tells police of moon cycles, 
of the patterns of strikes among dock workers and the rising incidence of injuries among garbage collectors. It's their bones, the compounds, he says knowingly, his eyes lowering to the table. It's no surprise they're getting weaker, more brittle. He also said that the night in question he was inconsolable after the beast ran up the side of the building. I return to the doctor to discuss blood tests. My symptoms are joint pain, itching skin, and paradoxically, going against logic, sleep so fast and heavy that it is incredibly difficult to move when I wake, to extricate myself from its grasp. But the biggest thing is the constant obsession with the idea that I've become anemic. My blood tests prove that this is not the case, they prove my blood is iron-rich, that I'm not deficient. It is, then, an irrational fear. If it's just the constant craving of something, then that in itself can be a medical problem. The doctor tells me of people who will, for example, drink fluids until their stomachs burst. What I want to further articulate but simply cannot is that rather than a craving, it feels slightly different as if just to the side of that. It feels a step away. It feels like a compulsion to avoid craving. It feels like a necessary separation. I tell the doctor I've eliminated all vegetation from my diet, that anything plant-like turns my stomach somehow, that I think of dirt, of worms. I tell her about the visions that come, the new ones. It's like when you're a child, I say, and someone tells you your food looks like something terrible and you can't shake it, even though you know it's silly. She gives me a prescription for two pills. One I take just for a little while, the other I will take longer, with an increasing dose, to see what comes. She gives me the number of a nutritionist. It's a referral she says, so insurance should cover it. Also, she tells me, here's the number of a therapist. Take the pills like it says and make an appointment to come back. I am concerned, but I'm not sure there's much else I can do for you now. I dream I live in a house somewhere rural, somewhere with wild green trees and an indeterminate number of cars lining the plummeting yard. There are white bears roaming the area, and I'm trying to get everybody inside, all the pets and people. I do not know who lives in the house, how many humans or animals, but I know as soon as I shut and lock the door, I have to open it again because someone is invariably left out, a cat, a dog, a young guy wearing boots who is evidently working outside. I don't even know who lives in the house and who is just inside temporarily, taking shelter because of the bears. I tell Dale this in the morning while he's smoking out back. I am brief, as it is well known that people hate listening to other people's dreams. But he doesn't seem to mind. He even asks me a question about it. What did the bears look like? They were white. They sound pretty. Yeah, I guess they were. I feel derailed. But the point is more that it was an anxiety dream, and we were afraid of them. They were probably more afraid of you, he says, stubbing his cigarette laterally on the wall. It's like we thought we were helping each other, Fania and I, making a calm place in the world, but it was the opposite. We were actually fighting each other. We still are, I suppose. It maybe never stopped. One night when it started, I walked her home. This was before, before anything. We passed newsstands and dark shoe stores and a tailor shop where pale naked mannequins stood in a window atop their stands like owls. We passed a man sitting on the ground against the wall. His head was down. He was quiet, but then when we passed him, 
just as we did. He screamed like a demon. It was an inhuman rattling sound. I remember afterwards I kept thinking of a piece of hard flesh rattling in a scream like a, the beat of a whistle, like a giblet, like a tiny filtering organ rattling there, like a piece of tongue. We gasped. For the next half block, our hearts pounded. We felt like running, and we held ourselves back. She started, actually, with a little fast laugh. I grabbed her elbow. In that moment, everything seemed to change. I think that's what did it, that gesture. It broke something between us, some possibility, some barrier. I'm not sure if it was an assertion of my will or merely a cowardice. The fear of being alone there, on the wild, frightening street. Blocks later, at her front steps, there was a miscalculation. We took them too fast. One of us tripped, and then that was enough. We were all over each other. We could not cope. We realized how little we actually like each other. We became cruel. Or really... What's true, what's worse, I became cruel. There are those relationships with mutual strikes, where you feel justified in yours, when you hold on to them and let them stew until it's your turn. You wait for it like a check. I was needlessly insulting. Not overtly, but I took her down. I don't know why. Even worse than this is I don't believe she saw the situation clearly. I think I thought she did things too, things that made no sense and that frightened me, made me think she took my attention for granted. But she didn't. I remember her so clearly, the smell of her, her taste. Always something startling about it, something astringent like a juniper berry or a blade. We creep toward opening night. Costuming comes together. There are fittings, tape around bodies, pins in the mouth. Lane and Mary have worked with us for a while. Lane is especially young, but has a lot of range and is always able to clothe the entire cast for a pittance, usually under budget. He seems to know which materials ape other ones, what falls well or stays in place, what can appear and disappear under stage lights? Mary is the history of genius. She can evoke any time with what she's given. She also knows bodies well, not just to fit costumes, not just to measure, but how people should hold themselves, what their carriage should be. Lane is just obsessed by the cloth, by stitching and pleats. My clothing is quite something. There's a suit like a great triangle, huge shoulders tapering down. This is good for him, me, for Mackie Messer, because he is not a large man. He's a thug, but not physically imposing. He should rely heavily on appearances. There are closely fitting shirts, one 1930s suit, there are medallions. I remember hearing a comedian interviewed, a man who is very slight but who talks tough and has a big personality. He said he wears many layers when he performs on stage. He needs, if not really to look big, to feel it. He needs it to perform. Milena has spent a good deal of time with the costumes. Some days I see her sketching rudimentary shapes. Lane is adoring of her seductive reputation and her knack for reducing the complications in people's lives into pithy slogans. Also, her being French helps. So he lets her in. He allows her hand. We brought some extras from the university to fill out the stage in our street scenes. They bring us energy. They bustle around respectfully, awaiting instruction. One night, Melina borrows an apartment and has us all over for dinner. 
There are big pots that seem to have been baked for an eternity somewhere until the contents of them dissolved into one another and became a third thing, something melted. Though I appreciate this, the idea of it, the vast, deep spices, I cannot eat. I swallow some obligatory bites. Though I gratefully find large pieces of meat in one of the pots, there are too many other things surrounding it, choking it. After we've moved away from food, I sit against the wall on the floor by the window. Fania is taking dishes to the kitchen, and I want to go do that, to be next to her. But I'm afraid of the smell of the food. The discarded remnants of it on plates will make me sick. Anticipating this, the loss of appetite, I drank two big sugary drinks earlier to give me a spark, and now they've yanked the rug from me, played havoc on my nerves, and left them for dead. I watch Malena in the candlelight. Strangely, I try to picture her brain there, behind her eyes. I attempt to deconstruct her eye sockets, the curve of her jaw. She wrote a book about her family when she was young. Its bluntness and simple cruelty took readers by surprise. I have wanted badly to ask her about this, to have occasion to. If only I did not think she had been asked these things so many times. If only I did not fear her offense. Since none of her family is still living, I want to ask her how it felt to devour them while they could see while they could react. Though I suppose she may say it's no worse than anything they did to her, anything they did to each other. It's like us, our group. It feels like a family feels. There's no hope, no possibility of extracting. Fanya has a song in the play, a song against character, a song of defiance. It springs from an imitation, her imagining of another woman. Shortly after we are married, she and I, we are celebrating with witty songs and banter at the visit of Reverend Kimball. She sets a scene by describing the sight of a bar wench, weary in the brunt of laughter and abuse. She imagines the vision that sustains her, this woman, in a song called Pirate Jenny, she sings of the day a ship with 50 cannons approaches in the harbor and smashes up the town. A hundred men come ashore and drag those they find to Jenny to ask her which they should kill. All of them, she declares, cheering with glee as their heads are lopped off, and then she sails off in the ship. It is a strange Time for her character, Polly, to do this. For instance, as I've said, we've just been married, and she is very happy, as she loves me, her rebel husband. And just after her song, I'm a bit disturbed, and I'm quick to discourage her. Anyway, says Mackie the Knife, I don't approve of you doing this play acting. Kindly drop it in the future. A nutritionist wants me to eat lots of a special round grain and dark fruits with vitamin C. There are seeds encased in a pucker of gel. Avocados, too. I don't especially want to eat any of these things, but I find ways to try. I find the grain in bulk bins at the store. I fill a limp bag with it halfway and chew it dry, the smashed hulls filling the crevices in my teeth. My bite made strange by its paste. With the fruit, I have some luck with juicing. The expensive, special effort of it, I find a way to make a few times a week, then get some of it quickly, nauseously, joylessly down. The avocados are too often brown and just unbelievably vegetal. I try them smashed up and spread over meat, which works for a while. When I visit her office, she asks me how I feel about seaweed. And my stomach turns in on itself, turns down as if to hide in the rest of me. 
and the soft nest tangle of my gut. I wake up one night. It's not suddenly, but slow, like I'm dragging myself with stiff leaden clothes upstairs. Or, perhaps, I'm running through knee-high mud or water. Some dream thing, a thickening agent, covering the ground. As I wake, I have many sensations, the most persistent being that the room is on fire, a coldness across my chest and arms. I have kicked off bedding, an orange light bathing my apartment. The door to the hallway is open. I know this, though next to my pillow, blocking my view, is the door that swings open when I pull the bed down. I wish wildly for a moment to knock it aside. My heart seizes. Someone is coming in. I sit up and shout, Hello? It seems ridiculous. The only thing that comes to mind is hello. I have another urge then, to throw something. Throw something and scare whoever might be there, at the dark, in the door, here with me. I throw my glass of water. The sound of breaking glass and a rattle as the pieces scatter on the floor. I try to pull any other sounds apart from that. Any new sounds of feet, of the intake of breath. I try desperately to find them, panning for them in a dark stream. Nothing. I move my legs toward the floor, placing feet. I notice now that I'm also naked. This has been happening lately, this removal in the night. I take the top blanket in the heap and wrap it dully, dumbly around me. Scratchy wool tangles around my legs. As I approach the door, I have the sense of walking out of one cave and into another, more brightly lit one, no less frightening than the one I'm in, perhaps more so even, with the ease of seeing. The hallway is thinly lit by a brownish-hued bulb appearing stained, as if by some flash or brulaying over time under its own weak heat. Things take on a sepia tone here, which sounds romantic like the thud of old photographs, where everything's quiet and alive. But it's really ugly, this light. Wan. Toxic. It is the light of insects. The light of low things. Nothing in the hallway. I stand for a minute peering out. I turn the lights on in my apartment and go throughout it, corner to corner, after bolting the door. I try to remember if I did that earlier and can't. Some things on a small table have fallen over. My baseball with a loosening hide is on the floor. But this table is in the way. I tell myself. And in the dark, it's nearly directly in the path to the bathroom. I likely did that in my haze. I end up in the kitchen taking belts of freezing vodka. I lean against the counter and feel the melting in my solar plexus, the confused feeling of the frozen liquid hitting me in the stomach. I stare at the pale refrigerator at a photo of myself from many years ago that I feel slightly embarrassed to have up, and it causes me some pain. It is the closest I have been, perhaps, in my life to being truly, actually handsome. It is Halloween. I am at a party at my friend's house. I have removed my mask and am clutching it in front of me like a rag. There's a mop of wild, spiky hair spraying from it, brown and gray and white, and a single pointed ear jutting out to the side. I look new, thin. My skin looks almost peeled. There is an energy there, a constant searching. I've lost much of that urge, the urge to search. The mask was a cheap latex creature from a discount store, and it reeked. Thinking of this as the tipping point, this scraped-up, pushed-up sense memory, my body rejects the strong cold vodka determinedly. I lean over the sink, 
My inside's taking over. When I go back to bed, I turn on the radio and listen to faraway voices discussing lights in the sky above Chicago. People call from driveways and rooftops and the sides of roads. I fall asleep as people from universities assemble over phone lines, united in the burning night. I notice it during my song, ballad in which McKeith begs pardon of all. As I am making the unlikely, round word, overnourish, it's there. A strange tingle at the side of my mouth. It appears in the gum over an incisor. It is partly painful, as when a limb becomes separate from circulation, when it tries and fails to secede. In two days, I have a small, pale nub like a white stone peeking out the side of my gum. It is a dully, choking sight. At first, I suppose... I think it's a bone. There's no blood, but a pinking around it, a redness from pushing through. But it's not the angry red of infection or injury, a sign of trauma. To accommodate this, the tooth beneath it appears to be nudging back slightly. My bite has shifted. I can feel it when I chew. I don't know how this can happen. My brain grasps. It's on my right side. I remember this is the side of aggression, the reaching out side, the male side. I am not going to the doctor right now, not again. I keep it as an idea, a later possibility. I have this feeling that has been forming, that is congealing, becoming more solid. What is happening to me is like a knot undoing, worked at by hands. There is another body found, only this time it's not intact. There is a little Italian restaurant with a courtyard that catches the overflow of diners each night, which is to say the majority of the diners, since their space is so small. This is possible throughout the year, barring heavy snow because of industrial heat lamps in the shape of torches and a thick network of umbrellas. The owner showed up in the morning to prep and make stock and noticed something indescribable and strange out the window. There's a brick wall of relative height, eight feet tall, that surrounds the area and shields it from the alleyway behind. There has been no need for security in this area since... There's nothing of real value kept in this closed-in section, and the back door is fully protected by an alarm, as is the front. They did have two of their metal tables stolen once, years ago. But it seemed apparent that the substantial effort required to lift the heavy tables and hoist them over the wall without creating a disturbance was too great, and the operation was abandoned. After this, they thought of securing chains to the legs, but this was cumbersome and ugly, and they would have to be removed before servants each night, as the thought of having chains and locks visible to her customers was unthinkable to Lydiana. There are shapes on one of the tables, and shapes underneath. For a few minutes, she just looks. She takes in what she can, what she is able. She opens the back door and starts to go out, then stops. Something in her tells her she's not ready for this. Her vision bounces back, glances back, as if from a blow. When the police come, her mind has begun to somersault and her thoughts are forming a loop. She has become fixated on the idea that she must keep this from her customers, who will not want to come here if they knew what was out there, what lay there this morning. She's focused on contaminants on stains. She keeps saying to the police, no one needs to know, and does anyone need to know? It will hurt me, this business, she tells them. No one will want to take a meal here if they know.
There's an agency that comes to clean things up. They are kind and quiet and equipped with biohazard containers and full body suits. They come later, after the police are finished. After Lydiana has made a little sign and stuck it to the door, she puts it on pink paper for lightness. She found some in the office, and she wanted that, that small touch. Though the jig is up, really, by this point, with the stream of official vehicles and the news showing up. But she needed to do what she could. The agency has big brushes and wet wax in the van. It's lined with solutions and concentrates, and there are regulation decals everywhere. The woman who started the service found out herself the hard way that there's no one to clean up after such things, that removal is not the end of the story. There's much more work to do, work that, without their intervention, would fall square onto the distraught, the victimized, not that this company doesn't bring a healthy invoice or some closely guarded trade secrets. Just overall, it is a good and a noble thing they do. Jenny Taller was discovered with a jackknife in her breast, and MacKeith strolls down the dockside, knows no more than all the rest. Where is Alphonse Gleet, the coachman? Was he stabbed or drowned or shot? Maybe someone knows the answer. As for Mackie, he does not. My body is beyond me. It is, somehow, strengthening in certain places. My shoulders, my hips. There's an unusual definition around my ribcage. As if something visible, the pouch carrying my organs around, is hung off the hook of my spine. The movement I have settled into, for my character, for my Keith, is best explained as a sort of combination between a strut and a skulk. I cannot strut, by this I mean I suppose I could, but I, I don't like that. The instinct in him is to blend into the scene, to be invisible. I believe that this instinct must always slightly overpower his show-off elements, though these two things are obviously at war. You are all looking great, Elena tells us. Keep it dark. Sing like you talk. She has been visited by friends. We see them moving around the edges, never really emerging. This makes us feel, quite possibly, a mixture of pride and a little insulted, too. She couldn't stop to introduce us, make it more human. But we understand. She is like us. We know the awkward compartmentalization. We have been around many of these people with genius. There's been someone else coming around, too. I've seen him lurking outside and approaching the building, walking with her, with Fania. It is ridiculous. It's like school. Does he carry your books for you? I ask her one day. She makes a little noise through her teeth. Sure, she says. Someone has to. Out in front of my apartment building, there's a man who has been sitting on the sidewalk most nights, his chin pointed underneath a beard. He spends his time arranging stones in intricate shapes on the pavement. The first few times I saw him, I braced for some sort of approach, a beg or attempted conversation, but nothing. He just gazes down, slowly turning and sliding the rock. He will stop and contemplate them. He will put on gloves or a hat from a stiff blue cloth bag he keeps behind him. But he doesn't speak. At least not to me. Once I see him produce some chalk and add lines around the arrangements, which are strange and a little asymmetrical, 
not circles or pyramid shapes, the shapes of traditional power and surrender, the shapes you would likely see someone like this working on, expounding. He baffles me. But I feel exposed somehow. I feel like if I were right, if my body and mind were not in question now, I might feel comforted by his presence. I dream I leave the building and go and buy a steak. I tear through the thin plastic and eat it right there in the street. The feel of the blood, the raw juice on my neck is exaggerated. It feels like a cascade. Even when I throw it down, the uneaten portion and the packaging, it still flows. My nerves are confusing the sensations in my sleep. I must be sweating. He becomes the man that frightened Fania and I the night we ran. When I go past him, I hear him say a word. Lobo. This sounds familiar, but I can't figure it out. When I wake, it's half gone. I remember a television show I saw a year or so back. I was in a hotel. We were touring with a play. Some of us roomed together, but I wanted to be alone. The room was small and brown and had a cracked sink. On the television, there was this show about the police, about the police and lawyers and how they worked together, about the handling of information, of evidence. The show had grown like a small, cellular creature into different shows, which were essentially the same, but which dealt with special factions of law enforcement. I was watching because it was the best of the night choices, and I've always found the rhythm of this particular show comforting. Plus, I had to play a police detective in this thing we were doing, trying to get this guy to confess to killing children. In this episode... That's exactly come to find out what was happening. The cops go to talk with someone who was hurt by this man many years ago when he was a boy. The thing that got me was this. The vagueness that all of a sudden came. A boy, now a man, describing his encounter with the killer. His awakening. I never knew that someone could do that to a body he says. This is juxtaposed with the killer in therapy, remembering. And it's amazing how much blood could come out of one little boy, he says. We go back to the first boy man, describing his life as an adult, his coping. I don't leave here, you know. I haven't been out of this apartment in years. He smiles a little, looks around. His pale skin suddenly making sense. His eyes with a new blackness. It's not a bad life. One day I follow Fania. I don't know what I am doing. I hear some part of myself telling some other part that I want her to get home safely. That I'm just exhibiting my own selfless concern. All around, there are posted flyers to avoid being in the streets, to be in by dark. I wonder who is making these. They bear the unsophisticated fonts of print shops, the 8 by 11 affordability. I picture a lone crusader, a woman with a hat. She is not with her boyfriend today, this guy hanging around. I find myself deducing some flaw in character, some protective bone missing from him. Already in low esteem, he is reduced to a jellyfish consistency in my mind, something tidal and low, feeding off trash. She walks with her hands stuffed in pockets, and I can see her hair swinging back and forth, her metronome. She goes into a store, I stand against a wall across the street, appearing to wait for something. I ridicule myself in my head. The wind picks up, and I want to shiver, and I fight my body's urge. I 
relax into it. I am hungry in some distant way. There is a cut on my hand. My wrists ache, too. As if I've been holding my hands at some bad angle. I wait. I wait until she comes out. And then I follow her home. There is a good day. We can see it, the thread. I have heard talk of this. It's like leaving one's body. It is a good day, and we all feel like we're doing something worthwhile. I'm wired when I leave, and I go home and then leave again, my pulse racing. I go to Malena's house. I expect not to be let in, but this is not what happens. There is something going on with you, she says, sitting me down. I would offer you a drink, but I don't think that would be the best thing for you. Can I have one anyway? I ask. I want not to pretend. She places one in front of me. Do you know what is happening? She asks. I shake my head. She reaches out and touches me, my shoulder, and the shock that runs through me is immediate and I feel ashamed. How have I gotten this way that one touch unpeels me? I look at her, alarmed. Her face, lined and beautiful, astonishes me. I stand up and kiss her. She lets it happen then pulls back. I don't think you want that, she says. Really, you're very fascinating. I wanted you all along, of course, but, but that's not what I'm for, she smiles. Something's happening to my body, I tell her. I don't know what to do. Having me won't solve anything for you. She says gently, nor me. In fact, it would make things worse. I grab her arms just below the shoulders. She is strong. I feel her muscles tense. I smell her, some light, dusty perfume. Cigarettes. She's been drinking, too, I think. Not too much, but I can smell it on her. Not her breath, but coming from her skin, aspirating. Here, she says. She signals for me to let go of her arms by raising her chin a little, as if pointing with it. I move my hands, but still feel the wool, little bright fibers of stitch in my palms. They hang dumbly at my sides. Lay down, she says. I don't move. Please, she said. We go to the couch. I still have my coat on, but I don't want to take it off. I clutch it around me. She puts a blanket on me, too. It doesn't seem like enough. I shiver, then remember my shoes are still on. This I set up for to remove them, because I should. She sees this and smiles. She goes out of the room, brings me a pill and some water. I take it, swallowing without question. She brings a chair over and sits near me. She reaches out and touches my head. You're doing wonderful work, she says. You should be proud of that. I notice I haven't been breathing. I will it to happen. My heart does painless, frightening jumps. It skips beats and then lurches to life. When I lie down, this happens, or maybe I just don't notice until then. My muscles through my ribs relax. I feel the organs shifting. Tell me, she says, when you're walking at night, do you feel afraid? I think about the question.
the answer is complete. No. Do you think that this violence could not hurt you? Has nothing to do with you? No, I don't think that. Where do you think it comes from? She asks. The walls here seem tilted in. I fall asleep fast and without control, like I'm fainting. People come forward with stories. There are neighbors given up. Strange, nocturnal happenings in the parks. There's someone with a co-worker who they caught naked in the storeroom with a bottle of gin. There are people with secrets. The temperature drops. Someone finds a pool of dark, frozen substance on his porch. He is sure his blood. There is... A talk in some of the lower rags about a man that is half animal, who shifts like the moon. He turns his skin inside out. He is a wolf underneath, exclaims a yellow-haired psychic, who claims she has made drawings while she is half conscious in a fugue state. This usually does not happen in the city, she declares on the news, shaking her head. People hurry home with their cuts of meat after work, wrapping them extra thick. Superstitions abound. Teresa, our cleaning lady, quits. She does not say anything, just stops showing up. This is not noticed at first, but what is noticed is that objects keep appearing on walls and surfaces of tables on little uneven spots on the floor. She must have placed them around, little rosaries and trinkets. There's a locket with half a picture in it, and all you can see is the little white gash of a smile. The slant, perhaps, of a chin. We notice she hasn't come anymore when things start to build up backstage. Little waste baskets fill with scrap and continue filling. Hair and glitter bits make rings around the chairs and the flat gray carpet as well as the lightly treaded trails of pale tan powder like a dusting of snow. What could any of this have meant to her, we wondered. Us in our home that was becoming something else was becoming at odds. We imagined she was at odds with her god, her Catholic fearsome god, over something we had unleashed into the world. But this may have been all wrong. She might not have blamed us at all. But with her leaving like that and placing objects meant to ward off, meant to transform, we came to think that, to conclude. What did she know about what went on here? When we could not see. A couple of years back, we had an actor who had no home and stayed here. Slept in the cranny above stage, left in a sleeping bag. After a couple of weeks, he showed up at James's door, completely drunk. And when James let him lie down on the couch for the night, he mentioned the theater. He placed his hands over his forehead, as if exasperated. I can't go back there right now, he said softly. I saw something. I mean, he added. I have bad dreams. The nature of these dreams he did not share. But we all know what that means, really. Dreams. It means things that are actually going on. Things that are actually happening. Things you can't face up to. To their very ridiculousness. Or their terror. All he would say was that his bag kept getting opened. His clothes scattered around. They teasingly seemed to lead in a trail, off into the seats. One night he turned on the stage lights and looked out there, expecting to see half-visible shapes scattered or huddled low in the aisles, maybe. The top of their dark heads visible. He didn't know what to make of it, but he left town on a bus late at night and no one ever heard from him again. He was a quiet person, and we all knew him for his explosively strange characterization. 
the unusual way he would read lines with unexpected patterns. There was one I remembered. One line that he uttered that took everyone on stage with him completely by surprise. He was asked a question by someone. Why did he become something, I believe, in this play it was a writer, but it doesn't really matter. It could have been a mathematician or a zookeeper, as this particular play was about the hazards of profession. What happens to you when you give yourself over to something? What happens when you expect that thing to be your all? It is not possible. Anyhow, he was asked why he became this particular thing, his thing. Why did you become this? He was asked. His eyes clouded. He looked down. He said, with a mastery of emotion and slipping control, I don't remember. When I was a boy, well, not a boy really, but 15, I had a friend who had just received a new kitten. I was over at his house. We had discovered the joys of running through the sprinkler when we were feeling a little too old to be doing so. There was something childish about it that we liked. We'd lost interest in games. I mean the kind of games like you play when you're a kid, with balls, with silly rules, with marked safe places where the aggressions of your opponents were rendered impotent. On this day... The sprinkler proved distracting enough to tear us away from the licorice and the video games inside, into the yard. Its promise of a smooth green lawn, but in actuality was a mess of lumps and budding dandelion sharps. So here's what happened. We were running in and out, not paying too much mind, letting the door snap behind us. Once when I moved through the door, it snapped on their new kitten, on its head. And it did not die right away, but bled and made noise and was unbearable. I had to leave. They gathered the thing up to take it to the vet, to have it put down. And I should have gone with them, but I just couldn't. I ran so hard and so fast that I twisted my ankle and threw up in the grass. I remember lying there in the tall, pale weeds, the ants discovering me and crawling up my arms. I looked at the sky and forced myself to stare there, to stare into it. Telephone wires sliced the air. After that, I expected not to see my friend, to have him avoid me at all costs. But it wasn't like that. He showed up by where I parked my car at school. He, in fact, spent more time with me than usual. I wondered how this could be, and it seemed wrong to me, but at the same time I was so grateful, more grateful than I had ever been in my life. We didn't talk about it, ever. I had dreams about it for months, and still do. The feline shape comes round. I somehow have a house, I have a yard or a space which is mine, and the cat comes back in some form. An actual cat. Or a hybrid dream creature with claws and the legs of a deer. Something suggesting innocence. Or at least the young form of a predator before it has developed its survival instinct. I am in the house and this thing in whatever form it comes to me, crosses the fence and enters the yard or the space around my house. I do not recognize the house I am in. I wander into the wrong rooms, and there are things lying about that do not belong to me. Boxes half full of books and purple frilly fabrics, and each room looks like a basement. And the thing is out there, and it makes little moans and wails with whatever is available to it in its particular throat. And I can't stand the sounds, and I will myself to wake. I will it because I'm aware somehow, 
and it doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen, and then when it does, I don't believe it. I listen for a scratching at the earth outside my window and a wail that is awful, like broken tissues, like brains bent by blows. And perhaps the worst thing is, it is not coming for my life, for revenge, to turn me into what it itself is. It comes for different reasons. I have made a thing, and now I am responsible for it. And it comes to me asking what to do. The butcher is robbed. It's fucked up. They leave all the cash but take the meat. It is decidedly a man, though covered, costumed. The cameras catch him in profile. They catch him from the back. The owner had half-jokingly fitted out the place with one of those peacemaker bats the month before. It is funny, perhaps. One old man and seven children burst to cinders in Soho. And the crowd is Captain Mackey, who is not asked and does not know. And the widow, not yet twenty, everybody calls her Miss, woke up and was violated. What did Mackey pay for this? Opening night. Beggars are begging, thieves thieving, horrors whoring. A ballad singer sings a moritat. We show up, ready to release all of our tension, which won't happen yet, but usually does somewhere in the second act, where we can believe it is actually happening, when it is no longer unreal. I'm not sure who notices first that Fania is not there. I am surprised it is not me. I've been so focused on her. I cannot imagine that I did not know. All day I've been pacing and trying to breathe through certain areas of my body. A ridiculous exercise I know when I read about that athletes and dancers do. I rid my brain of thoughts of Molina. Someone says it and I hear part of it. And then he comes into the room. It's James. He asks if anyone has seen her. The faces in the room change, but slowly, not right away. They are focused on the task at hand. We gather. We fill the dressing room. We are so close. We are like one breathing thing now. One great hungry beast. Wolf Stories, Part 3, The Order There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams. Not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. He was a solitary man. His solitary nature was like an abyss that he was afraid he might one day fall into. He had worked out that the abyss must be at least 40 meters deep, and that he would leap into it head first, so as to be certain of dying. Henning Munkel, Depths. The year before his final endeavor, in the last 
late minutes of the summer. The leaves tumbled early, without a frost. They coated the edges of walks and curbs. Instead of the sharp, vibrant colors they would normally be in the fall, they were a pale, bloodless yellow, like the belly of a frog, the underside of it, a tiny bit of green still remaining. David's more superstitious colleagues, the ones who took the air and sun to mean things coming or things gone, were, by this time in the year, convinced of a flood, an imminent rain. There was something big approaching. He felt it. He felt close to turning something over. That he believed in conspiracies was to say at least something about him, however stunted and simplistic. To say he saw the world around him in these terms as well, the terms of conspiracy, was also a kind of lie. It didn't reveal the whole truth. In fact, it had been the opposite for much of his life, and he had done his best to shake this free. He couldn't conceive of some things, so he didn't try. Others, though, were different. He would go to the place that they required of him, even if he didn't know where that was, even if there was no map. After the fall, the fall with the anemic leaves gumming up the roads, he began to ride the buses. David felt he needed to figure out the ways of crossing town or doing so without a car. He thought it would be a good idea to know the options, the back routes, to be able to disappear in the city. There was another factor in it, and this he did not like to think about too much, but he knew he had to begin adopting utilitarian coping mechanisms for it. It was the fact of his growing poverty the thinning out of things. He didn't really know if a car would be in the picture for him much longer. He had to preserve what he had. As it was, he waited for the occasional tipping point of some repair, large or small, that would render him immobile. He, of course, knew the importance of this, of a continued self-reliance, and realized with a sudden shame that he had grown too far from that. Not that he had been presented with a comfortable life, not that his life had changed that much, but he knew one day, one thin, tired morning after his wife had left, that instead of being fortified by these things, by what in the world he lacked, he had become weak, dependent, clinging to them with a sick and stupid faith. During this time, this retraining, he saw the natural detail in the streets, in the immersion that this brings. Riding from his home, down the gentle hill, he had the feeling of being dipped into something, of being placed as if by a giant into the middle of it, into the palm of the town. Many of the buildings had angels up the sides of them, or on the high gargoyle perches. They leaned from the corners, curls tight at their skulls. They blew concrete trumpets. They made unhearable sounds. He began to notice people getting on the buses with flowers. Some were in small bunches of twos and threes. Some in great sloppy gatherings. He wondered always where they came from. If the flowers were given to these people who bore them, or if they themselves were taking them to someone. Sometimes he thought of asking, but wouldn't. He figured this was someone else's job, some fellow traveler friendlier and more curious than he. At this, he felt a very slight, but certainly present, fiber of resentment. He felt an expectation put upon him somehow to do just that, to ask and he didn't want to satisfy that expectation. 
He saw some historians on television talking about his area of the country, in fact, his very town. They were saying that it had once been underwater. He thought of this, how the street he lived on, before its existence, before the first earthly settlement of any kind, had been at the bottom of the sea. So, of course, the possibilities were endless, as his ideas of a timeline were confused. His income now was variable and inconsistent, but he had learned, for the most part, how to manage it. He spoke regularly at meetings and conferences, and because he was always sensible and well-prepared and did not misbehave afterwards like some of the other guests of honor and keynote speakers, he was invited back. So he did have some events, some things he could plan for, but they were growing sparser, his modest engagements, as flashier and more radical showmen hit the scene. The new blood. These men had the trick of drawing audiences because they knew how to get noticed. So, naturally, for those concerned with such things, those who made the rosters and pieced together the conferences, they promised revenue. David had been studying them for a long time, this group. And this was the year, he thought. This was the year he could have a chance at uncovering them. Of course, he had thought this before, and he had been wrong. It was the year that the Order was meeting here in the U.S. That did not always happen. They met anywhere in the world. And this year was also said to be a particular anniversary, although this, like everything else, was unsure. And according to some, the few he believed, their meetings had grown beyond a single sacrifice of a willing member into something altogether more murderous, like a hunt. There had been an aggressively publicized attempt in the 70s to expose them. The resulting book was outfitted with a gaudy cover. Marcus Grimes, a gutsy, determined young man, had wormed his way into the service staff at a resort where the order was gathering. Something hurried and unusually relaxed surrounded the preparations for the meeting that year. So this was possible, just barely. Grimes' choice was the dining staff because of the perceived opportunities, such as they would be, for intimate observation. This account was not taken seriously by colleagues. In fact, it was treated with scorn. Marcus Grimes was wealthy, for one thing, which caused no small amount of resentment amongst the toilers in the field. Marcus was therefore able to devote a good amount of time and resources to these impassioned endeavors of his, these hyper-extended hobbies. Basically, it was decided that minimal effort was required of him to do this, to penetrate this world. Then, upon the book's release, it caused even more bile, even more outrage, for its conclusions. Marcus Grimes had concluded in his book that these secret gatherings of the world's most powerful men were, despite all kinds of imaginings, nothing really out of the ordinary. Save a little opulence, of course. Save some overgrown toys and egos. There was drunkenness, to be sure, and a mock sword of blood right where the men ran a greater sharp dagger across the tops of their feet. This was a showy spot on the body due to the blood vessels there, which were wide and close to the surface. It was a little like firewalking, which there incidentally also was plenty of that gentle ritual, all flash and surprisingly little pain to go with it. Additionally, the cuts could be concealed by shoes so they could hide their membership in the ominous order. The tone of the book was, finally, one of dismissal and also a touch of daring pity. By the end of the venture, he himself, Marcus Grimes, had gained enough superiority to decide the group as pathetic, 
Granted, they were especially aggressive, the men. Certainly highly achieving. But they were also childish, with bad jokes, with an unmistakable hatred for women. They were aging boys who needed to feel powerful. They needed the idea that they were more complex creatures than they were. They needed the duality, the thought of a double life. Since then, the book had joined the ranks of the healthy group of Howard Hughes tell-alls, various employees coming forward, quick to emphasize their own privileged levels of clearance, hence their breadth of knowledge about the man, his concerns, his nocturnal epiphany. David's friend Charles would often tell him about his son, about his mysterious and familiar adolescent ways. The most recent thing, said Charles, was the quick-forming and startlingly intense worship of musicians and professional athletes. This would come and go as arbitrarily as weather, as wind or sun. Hero worship, said Charles albeit displaced. We were like that, reminded David, before we knew how to resist. He fancies himself such a free thinker, continued Charles, but he eats what they feed him. David used to teach history in high school, then at several small colleges. At some point, he began to stray from the text and started coming up with what he called counterweight ideas. He had always seen the value in what-if scenarios, as he found this to be a good way to bolster students' understandings about historical conclusions. Then, these exercises began to trouble him, their nature being too concrete somehow, too suggestive of gospel. He would look out at their faces, which used to be as wildly varied as the plant life in a tangled forest, all alien and curious and determined to thrive. But they had become unmoved, static, immobile as stone. Then it was silly, or incredible, or both. Notes came to him anonymously. They would appear in strange, unlikely places, or, conversely, in places so obvious as to be shocking. Example of the former. Taped to his car door, not near the window or handle, but the very bottom in the speckles of drying mud. Of the latter, he left a stack of books on the corner of his desk, ran out into the hall to catch a friend, talked for two minutes, and returned to find a white envelope sticking out of the top book. Something he was discussing before the classroom was empty, about the significance of pain and political unrest. He thought a student, or a group of students, hoping for the satisfaction of seeing an authority figure, a toiler in some, it didn't matter what, field, melt down before their eyes. As they took tests, he watched them, their faces, their furrowing brows, their lips forming little words, their lips chewed between teeth. He saw no sign. He watched the faculty, their little packages of lunch, the greasy blue Tupperware lids, the staining whiff of Italian dressing, the smell that would never be washed out the unimaginative tang. He stared at them. He couldn't stand it, what they ate, the pooling moisture in their plastic boxes, and the men with their crumpled foil slabs of last night's pizza or a sinewy meat sandwich they hadn't the creativity to assemble themselves. What did they know, and why? Around that time, his wife began going to bed very early, when the sun was barely down. She was tired and growing thinner, though he didn't notice. He didn't notice many things around him during this period. 
There were several things, though, of which he saw every detail, every small movement, each reverberation. These things were like arrows pointing, coming at him from different directions. When he first developed his little group, they met in basements, churches mostly, which they could use without much hassle, as there would be no money exchange. They did this under the pretense that they were addicts and that their group was an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. They used the coffee machines, which smelled like old burnt salt. They used the folding tables for grocery store cookies, which Gwen could not stand for, so she then brought plates of her own homemade delicacies, which were decidedly an improvement and made her feel good though they were consistently lumpy and over-sugared. At first they numbered ten, then thirteen, then twenty-three. Then the number dropped again at the end. They meant to talk about the world and how many of them had started to see certain things coming full circle, certain things put out in the world, certain things started by history, Things set in motion that were now running rampant, that were making themselves apparent, that were coming around. Full circle, said some of them. But David was never really sure what that meant. In the early meetings, he was not the first to talk. He waited, hoping for a more natural cycle of events. But after a very short while, it became clear that there was some direction needed, some sort of plan, as the people attending, hungry to hear and to tell stories, were eager, but unsure how to begin. Many of these people, it was true, lacked social skills, and those that didn't were still so shocked at the change in their lives, this change that they did not want, that they choked and struggled with great anger. They couldn't help but demand that someone give them the answers, something they could take hold of and begin with, to implement, to cushion, to digest in their minds. But there could not be, for all their wanting, a unified goal that would satisfy every one of them. And beliefs did vary among the group. There were frictions. They clashed and gripped their fists and sometimes cried. One night when Ted Parker told about the creature he saw affixed to the back of one of his sheep, claws wrapped around its head and the poor lamb screaming. Its eyes rolled back and fell to the floor, convulsing. Marietta told of lights over her father's house, racing toward the hills. Jake the custodian of a school in the next town, told of the growing number of children being prescribed tiny green pills. In fact, he was finding these things all over the school, dropped under tables, skittered over the gym floor like crumbs. The children were, he claimed, different now, diminished. I think their parents are involved in something, he said handing out copies of articles cataloging secret military planes of power plants beneath the town. David was putting together a schedule for his upcoming trip. He was going to find them. He had decided this, that this was his time to try. He was headed north. He left with some food and camping gear, a variety of clothing in case he should need to attend functions or restaurants. He had saved a little money, much less than he would have preferred, but he would make do. It was in cash, another way in which he could be vulnerable, but it was the best choice as he didn't want to rely on bank machines and credit cards during the trip, as they were obviously traceable. He had a friend who mapped UFO sightings in the southwest during the winter. 
His strategy was to have cash sent to him along the way, at various stopping points. He warned David against the conspicuous nature of each form of currency, even cash. But he had maintained it is, in most cases, the lesser of several evils. He started driving. He spent many hours, especially on his first day, with a kind of unnatural forced relaxation, telling himself he had a long way to go, willing his nerves quiet. There was a first a familiar succession of wheat fields just outside of town, then rolling hills and lines of crop turning to dirt. Great insectoid lines of sprinkler units slinked up gentle hills. Out here, ten or so years ago, four hours from his apartment, there were dozens of reports of a winged thing, something the size of a man that flew at the windshields of passing cars. Then, too, just after that, the huge tube of a tornado flattened the area, spitting out barns. His mind stretched and grazed. He thought of a painful experience, a few years ago, he had witnessed the on-screen failure of his friend Walt as he allowed a cameraman to follow him, to chronicle his pursuit of the elusive Bilderberg group. This man, the filmmaker, was dogged and friendly, but also primarily interested in exposing Walt's particular madness. Perhaps in the beginning it was different, and then... In the following hours and days, which yielded no result, no sure evidence, it changed. There were scenes in diners and hotel lobbies, Walt ineffectually quizzing storekeepers and desk clerks, an uncomfortable stakeout outside the gates of a ranch. David had seen him that last year, just before Christmas. Walt got drunk and wept like a child. Why do that to me? Because it's easy? The worst thing is, he continued, now they know my face and my name. For God's sake, they know my name. Walt was trying to talk about what all of them did, the toilers in the field. They waited, worried, set up recording equipment, all for very little, if any, reward. Occasionally, a tantalizing lead would float their way, and this would hint at a gorge, a cup running over. He thought of Walt on camera, most of the time with a thin sheen of sweat, panic like a high whistle coming from him somehow like music. He looked foolish, and he did feel sorry for Walt, he really did. It wasn't possible knowing how serious and dedicated and smart Walt was for it not to break your heart. But also, David knew that Walt had made himself vulnerable, as the temptation is there for all of them to do, on the occasion when someone shows your ideas a bit of interest. It is intoxicating, really. Easy to lose control. David had also tried thinking about it from the other place, the guy with the camera. When nothing pans out, when the hours and days go by, you have to take the reins. You have to give it some shape. You have to act like instead of it being about this gathering of men, this shadowy bunch with the power to feed their own hungers and perhaps destroy the world, that the film would instead be about the lone man, the man following them, about his obsession with the other men, the men we don't see. The Order were believed to have been involved in historical events so intimately that they affected their outcomes and shaped the way these events would be remembered and written about and taught. In fact, Anything of resonance since the late 1800s could be connected to them, as really so little about them was known, and so much suspected. 
The members were an unknown and shifting collective of powerful officials and moguls. They had tendrils everywhere, said believers. The order could make things happen. In the 1980s, some social scientists had reached out to the toilers and lent the tracking movement some credibility, establishing a timeline and publishing a paper in a respected journal. But it failed to have any sticking power. And later, the writers made sure to emphasize their lack of seriousness, their sense of fun. After all, it had been the October issue which also had contained a dissection of chemical compounds in the seasonal candies and an exploration of the seismic activity around burial grounds. He stayed in a series of cheap motels. They looked alike, mostly one flat row of rooms, two floors for the fanciest, the most high volume, near the larger towns and tourist destinations. The doors didn't quite fit properly and so scraped over the dull, tight carpet, wearing it down. The screens, if there were any, snapped shut and they all had little tears or ruptures, spots where the mesh was overwhelmed or stretched. The televisions in these rooms were always a private comfort to him. They glowed and babbled softly from one wall. The first night on this trip... He was stopped at a motor inn somewhere east of Lestmere. In his room, on the television there, he watched rays of ocean sun illuminate an attractive patrol squad. There was an investigation of some sort. An art theft turned to murder. The script was peppered with artist names thinly spliced into the story, such as it was. Rauschenberg, Hockney, Duchamp, On the show, a group of beach interlopers who were trying to force their relaxation by draping strangely enlarged cloths and pinning ironic flowers in their hair lolled. Something was stolen. Someone died. It didn't really matter. He got tired during a final scene at dusk when the detectives mused from the sand at a new moon. Next came a commercial for lawn food in an all-purpose tubular dough. He leaned back on the bed. Under his cotton shirt, he ran his palms over his belly. It felt odd, like someone else's flesh. He had the vague thought that his nerves had split a little in the sudden onset of fatigue. That was it, separate from himself, the skin not connecting. That first night, he dreamed quick, deep dreams. He could not recall colors, but did remember feeling desperate and unsupported. He was trying, mutely, to make the people around him aware of a coming danger. There were no faces, just a street perhaps, or a row of houses, in which people, he was aware, presumably dwelt. There was no sound, maybe a wind. He remembered a nagging feeling of trying to brush something away. He woke with a layer of oily moisture on his face. He'd left the television on. He turned onto his back, blinking at an errant seam on the ceiling, a shoddy patch of smoothing plaster. It seemed to shift slightly, to move. Thirst hit him hard on the flat of his tongue. There was a comment in one of those last mysterious letters. One David had lost years ago in some basement burst of pipe. He was haunted by it still. In it, his friend said something, something that resonated now, made him curious and afraid. He thought of it now. It said, you'll know soon enough when it's you, your time. You'll have to pick up the remains of your life with a goddamn glove. He set out in the morning to make it to Gerald's house. He was an old teacher friend of David's. They liked and recognized each other, which is rare in any place of employment. There were those people for whom teaching was a passion. What they perceived 
or at least had once perceived, as our life's calling. Such people are naturally as susceptible to bad days as anyone else, when they're vulnerable to pig-headed children in the classroom, to their own dark, under-caffeinated moods. But for them it was different, for David and for Gerald. They did not love it. They had never loved it. Of course, the two of them tried to keep at bay the worming, distressing thought that they had chosen the complete wrong thing. They were not good at it, this thing that they thought they wanted to do. They had put money and goodwill towards this thing, and had both, each of them, believed that teaching would lift them somehow to a different, higher plane. They thought it would get them out of themselves, would get them to reach out, in the end, they felt like dogs, perhaps, disguised as birds. David tried not to, but he thought of his ex-wife. She was like that. She loved teaching. Sometimes, when they were with people, out, or at dinner, and she had a few drinks, she started to talk about her students. Naturally, this was where her anecdotes came from where her interesting stories came from. She was, after all, a moderately attractive girl from a gently Lutheran family. She was sweet and enthusiastic about love, but she was ultimately unremarkable. He felt this, this last cruel part, in his more truthful moments, usually at night. But the thing, when she would talk about this, about her students, she came to life. She had this wonderful quality, this generousness. And within that world, within the walls of her classroom, she knew when and how to be bold, how to stand her ground. He did remember her hair. He always loved the feel of it and its impossible chameleon color. It was especially beautiful on rainy days. Some things were known. Their meeting place was usually necessarily remote and involved versions of fox hunts. Eight years ago, a man in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was hunting in a trash can outside a library. He'd been seeking drinkable solvents or foil. What he uncovered was a discarded folder of papers of a correspondence, which made its way to enthusiasts and was subsequently transcribed and read over ham radio. According to these, the order had begun hunting humans. This had interested police, but nothing could come of it. It was difficult to orient who the author was. It didn't sound like a participant an order member, but an observer who could comment in detail about the proceedings. But how? The descriptions were wild, near hallucinogenic, but also articulate and sure-footed. The man who unearthed this incomplete account, it seems, did a few local interviews for college students and moved into a shelter by the train station. There, he began to suffer nightmares and, after many public incidents, was transported to a facility near Toledo, Kansas. He died there one night when he ran into the fields with the pockets of his robe filled with burnt-out light bulbs. He ate them under the stars, the very brightness of them hurting him first, the ungodly dull white, before he swallowed the pieces, one by one, on the damp ground. David also thought about the placement of this event, or where he believed it to be. When the news of this meeting place was first moving through the channel some months ago, he discussed it with his friend Manny. They retreated to Manny's basement office and closed the plywood door. They taped up maps of the National Park. There was a variety of topography, some from close up, some far, showing the park's boundaries and its relationship to the nearby land. 
Manny angled the neck of his fluorescent lamp up at them. They sat down on the sofa bed where Manny, he understood, was sleeping more and more frequently. David nodded. I can think of a few right off. First, too constraining in the park. Too many rules. Too patrolled. Lots of regulations. Also, maybe federal offenses? I don't know the law, but you know what I'm saying. His tongue felt thick. He was starting to feel his earlobes flush with blood. And too many tourists. Inside the park, I mean. But say you're driving to it. That's your destination. Why stop to do anything? Might as well keep on going. Sure, said Manny. Less people in that area, right outside. Could be true. David ran his finger along the edge of a book. He liked the way it felt, the texture. Manny stood up and fussed with the record player. Hey, you, filled the room. Oh, God, I see it. What? David was startled. What is it? Manny ran his finger in a circle on one of the maps. Look. What he saw, what had materialized in the map, was a shape. The meeting place was nestled into a kind of craggy scoop in the park's southeastern boundary. This side was unevenly laid down due to some topography there. The mountains, a rough little valley. There was the river that spawned some smaller ones, covering the land there like spidery veins. Heavy there, wild. So, if one backed off, did not engage certain parts of the brain, it appeared like something nestled inside of an open mouth. The order had a symbol, a wolf's head, mouth open, with a wheel held there. Both things are about power in the body and the mind. The carnivore the inventor, the hunter, the innovator, the pagan, the scientist. Given how these men needed to view themselves, to accomplish, to conquer, these were two things that made utter sense to them. They made the world go round. This symbol had first been discovered, or at least recorded so, at a site in South America after the First World War. A campsite was found. There were remnants of a fire, an array of pale stones in a circle, and some partially covered bones. This timing was later highlighted as being important by an alternative historian named Harold Schmelt, who published on the appearance of secret societies as a reflection of history studying them as an outgrowth of world events. David arrived in his friend's town. Gerald had moved here a few years ago with his wife Annie, following a lukewarm teaching job. He had claimed to want something different, a change of scene. But David suspected it was really more of Annie's influence, as she was now much closer to her family. Their house was small and brown, set back from the road, and it looked squat, almost sunken, into the grass. As he drove up, he saw a little garden in front, complete with gnomes. Annie's touch, surely. Gerald came out, squinting in the mild sun. He made a visor with one hand and waved with the other. Howdy, stranger! He came up to the side of the car. David opened his door and stood up slowly, stiffly. They had a light embrace, slapping each other's backs. You find the place okay? asked Gerald. Yeah, no problems. David looked at his friend. He was growing a little fuzz on his face, and his unkempt hair swung around his neck. He remembered Gerald used to like to put chopsticks in it to keep it in one place. 
Come on in. Annie's making some dinner. He held out his hands for something to carry. David handed him his squarish blue canvas bag. That it? Yeah, for now. Other stuff's safe in there. David looked behind him. Eh, you tell me. Well, neighborhood is fine, but, you know, I don't know what kind of equipment you've got with you. David opened the back door. Eh, not too much, but, yeah, I should probably get the camera. He reached in and lifted it up by its strap. The recorder was in there as well. Later, if you were feeling nervous, he would come out and get the rest. Gerald took David inside. A dark brown carpet marked the boundaries of a living room in a rounded scoop. He looked around at the little shelves with the little things on them. This looks cozy, he said. He saw Annie coming round a corner at the end of the hall. She walked toward them with a tight smile. She was a bespectacled woman with wild hair that puffed out from her head. Hi there. Find it okay? He felt impatient. He was here, for God's sake. Yeah, you guys gave me good directions. She was preparing something that filled the house with a wet odor, a dish towel smell. It was the smell of steam and gray punctured meat, a slight whiff of bleach. David watched the two of them, Gerald and Annie, he supposed Gerald loved her, or convinced himself he did. He seemed to need her now in that way that people do, when they get used to it, being taken care of. When they don't really believe they're good enough to run their own show. They grow to need the person, and to believe that they need them, to fold their shirts or tell them they need a shave. Any shred of wildness is tamped down made small, any former animal tamed. They settled in the living room. David tried to lean back, to relax. He had not seen Gerald in a couple of years, and he seemed to him, mildly, to be trying to drum up some intensity, some fire for life. But he seemed dulled down, as if an injury had restricted his movement made his tissues tight. Gerald went to the kitchen and brought him back a soda. The ice had clumped together in the glass and it slid into his upper lip when he tried to drink. A thin jet of tan liquid fell towards his shirt. He rubbed the back of his hand across his jaw. Gerald talked. He still taught school, he said, but just substituting. He'd been working at a radio station. The kids who started it up, two former students of his, had some family money. They were impulsive, and they loved music with that stupid love that only well-off kids have, who have not met too much resistance. They wanted to put some talk on the late-night schedule. His show tackled light controversials, as he called it, cryptozoology and CIA cover-ups and the dangers of shock. After a while, they were summoned to the kitchen. David saw little gold flecks in the finish on the table. He was seated over a leaf that folded up to increase space. This did not line up exactly right with the rest of the surface, did not make a flat plane. It tilted slightly toward his lap. Annie brought a pot to the table. She gripped either side of it with potholder squares, the kind children make. David had not seen one of these for a while, and it brought back an involuntary slideshow of associations. He saw briefly ceramic dish frogs, their gullets stuffed with wads of steel wool, and the craft fair favorite, the bunwitch, nylon stockings stretched tight and made dimpled with little knots. She set out water glasses of tap with whitish, freezer-tasting crescents of ice. He tried to place his glass up beyond the tilting seam on the safe, flat surface of the table. 
Next came a pale iceberg salad with a handful of spinach leaves thrown in. She set down two plastic dressing bottles, overly designed for convenience, rounded with textured necks, Italian, low-fat Thousand Island. He wondered at that name, Thousand Island, the orangey gum of it, rendered lumpen with mixed-in sweet relish. He caught himself and noticed the amount of revulsion he felt toward Annie, which had existed before but had returned during this visit with a shocking strength. David watched her place a hard, yellowish multivitamin pellet by the top edge of Gerald's napkin, and then, from another container, a white disc of vitamin C. Gerald palmed them and dutifully swallowed. David's ex-wife, Joanna, taught kindergarten. She stood in front of a room of wiggling, inquisitive creatures. They wanted to know why. Why to everything? Why this? Why that? And she would take the time to tell them. Or she would make the effort to do that. She would try to explain to them why certain letters in the alphabet were shaped this way instead of that way why streets were necessary but could be very dangerous, why you should avoid talking while you were busy chewing, why the sun is gold, the sky blue. Some details I have to fudge on, she told David. The science, you know, plus, she added wistfully, they still want magic. He remembered a vicious fight they had. It seemed to him now This was when the unraveling of them became visible, when it was revealing itself. David had visited her classroom that day. She was telling the children about safety, about the importance of knowing who to trust. The concept of stranger was discussed. If you get lost, don't trust someone just because they're a grown-up, she told them. Find a policeman or woman. They will help you. David remembered this from his own childhood, this suggestion to just find a policeman, as if they were always around if you looked for them, as if legions of them were circling the streets at any given time, waiting and available to help little children. Later that day, he reminded Karen how he couldn't even find one when he needed one, some years prior when a convenience store thief had shot him in the leg. He dragged himself up and out of the store, The clerk disappeared to the back. He'd made it near the road, and it was comical, the calm out there. No one in sight. She'd heard this story before, and though it used to make her soften, make her see that he'd been through some worthwhile things, on that day it made her angry, the way he was using it against her. She turned to him, looked him hotly in the eyes. Okay, then. What should I be teaching him? To trust nothing? No one? Life will disappoint them soon enough. They were in the car at the time. David was driving past some farms, where the soil this time of year bore a green fur. The sun was full, exposing the shames of late winter, of early spring. I mean, what? She said quietly, looking away from him staring out her window. Would you have me do? David at that time knew a man whose wife had left him in the night during a storm. She left a note that read, Please don't hate me, but I know you will. His friend carried this note around in his wallet. It grew flimsy and soft. The fold lines turned buttery and translucent. He told David if he ever saw her again, He would kill her for wounding him that way, for dealing such a blow to his life. Why she chose that night, I'll never know, he told David. Other than it makes sense from a tracking point of view, because any traces left would be covered up, erased by rain. So, of course, on a basic level, the scent is washed away. His friend told him he couldn't sleep anymore, that when he'd finally drift off, he'd dream she was standing on the lawn in just a coat with 
necklaces other men had given her, all shining and heavy at her throat. She is watching the house and checking for autumn wasp nests in the eaves and tucked under the lip of the storm drain, which is slimy and choking on leaves. Annie gave Gerald and David some chocolate ice cream for dessert. They were papery shards of bitter walnut skin now stuck in his teeth. His tongue swiped dully at them as he thanked Annie, watching the awkward squinting smile take her face. Gerald led the way to the garage. He turned it into a room for himself, or, more accurately, a room for his model trains, with a meager margin of space around its edges. Gerald moved over to a corner and bent awkwardly down to a stunted little refrigerator. David watched the green flannel hump of his back, which, bizarrely, appeared for a moment an extension of the green covering on the train table, a sloping green mountain in the miniature world. David thought he was opening it, the fridge. He was going into it to retrieve some sort of beer, but he was, in fact, reaching behind it. Gerald grunted mildly. He pulled out a bottle of scotch. Oh, wow. Good call. Is that what I think it is? Gerald held the bottle up. He bent his wrist, swinging it back and forth like a bell. David saw the thick black band of his watch grab a skin, nudging up too close to his hand. If you drop that, so help me, Gerald chuffed. So help me. He reached for the handle of a bent metal cupboard and pulled out a half-gone sleeve of plastic beer cups. He wiggled a couple free. Gerald seemed pleased with himself, as if he had just procured, from someplace unlikely, some gold. He poured a cup and handed it to David. David smiled. He was going to say something, but hesitated, chewing it around, making it softer. She doesn't let you drink, he finally decided on. He sipped. Annie? Gerald let a moment pass. She doesn't not let me. His forehead wrinkled. He looked down and ran the flat of his hand very lightly over the train table, brushing something invisible away. I don't much these days anyhow. What about her? She ever stray from her iced tea? OJ, whatever. Gerald grinned. Well, sometimes when there's a football game on, or we have someone over, she'll kind of nip at a beer. Oh, though I did see her get really crazy at her cousin's wedding on some god-awful pink wine. She walked right past the car on the way out, and then she tripped over her shoes. Wow, thought David meanly. He raised his cup lazy. Good times. Gerald ran his trains around. The two of them watched reverently, in appropriate silence. The cars navigated through tunnels and past squat little townships. On the southeast corner, nearest the wide sink, there was a tiny bubbling up of mountains, by which Gerald had placed a figurine of a Sasquatch. The scale was off kilter, So the thing towered. It looked about two car lengths from the foot of the brown body to the head. They went out to the backyard. It was dark now. There was a steep hill leading down to another house, a weedy drop to a chain-link fence. The streets below were unevenly lit, with the enthusiastic white floodlight of a mobile home cluster on one end, A dark mash of trees around a blue water tank at the other. Come on, said Gerald. He scuttled down through the weeds. David followed tentatively, unsure of footing, fearful of his knees. His shoes sank. The weeds caught in his socks. Uh, what the hell are we doing? He halted his descent with difficulty and perched trying to balance the tension in his bracing legs. Gerald had reached the chain-link fence and was pointing at a swing set in the yard of the house. Oh, Jesus, David sighed. 
He made his way down to Gerald. That thing won't hold us. Gerald nodded wildly. It will. He forced the tip of his shoe through a diamond and hoisted himself over. David followed. Part of the top of the fence pushed into his thigh, bruising tiny striations of muscle. He jumped clumsily to the ground and swore. Gerald laughed. God, but we're old farts now, aren't we? He bent forward slightly, rubbing his lower back. The house on this part of the lot was dark, save for one one yellow porch light. Where are they? David asked. He was feeling quite drunk. His words sounded overly wondrous like a child. Oh, they're gone somewhere. I forget. Some relative or something. I'm surprised they took their car. It's a rundown thing. Anyhow, they used to have us feed their cat, but it's not around anymore. I got eaten by a coyote or something. His mouth was moving quickly. They'd gone to the swing set and stood by it, considering... There were two vinyl planks on four chains. Gerald sat down gingerly. In the dark, David could see the structure shift. He heard a creaking. That thing's gonna break. Relax, would ya? Christ. Gerald rolled his feet on the ground, pushing himself back and forth slowly. David lowered himself onto the seat of the free swing. He gripped the chains. The hard vinyl hugged his upper thighs with a weird, almost embarrassing pressure. It pushed into his skin. It was a distantly, naggingly feminine feel. It gave him a mild sensation of widening or bursting at the hips. They sat there dumbly. They weren't really swinging, just swaying in a controlled way. The hill kept going after the plateau of the yard here. They watched what there was of the town below. David could make out a few primary colors on the gas station signs. Saw some white boxes of warehouse buildings. Some cars moved along roads, no more or less real than the trains. Gerald spoke. So you're gonna blow the lid off? David took a moment. He was going to decide if Gerald was making fun of him if he was going to take it apart, tell him why it couldn't work. But he realized he was too tired to do that, to decide his intentions, and he really didn't care. He looked down the hill, to the right, toward the measured shape of a baseball field. Maybe, he said. You got fire? Gerald asked. David was not sure what he meant. Was he asking for a light? Neither of them smoked, at least not anymore. Fire. Then he understood. He knew what he was asking. They used to ask this of each other when they had passion, an appetite for knowing. He had it. He was just afraid to yield to it now, like he used to. It didn't seem to lead anywhere. Yes, I got it. He pictured a snapshot of himself bursting into flame. What's your plan? I don't know. I mean, I know. I have my camera, my recorder. You know the drill. I'm going to camp. I've heard things. They're going to make mistakes. They have to. I have to just see how things play out. You flying blind? (laughs) Hell yes. David laughed. He couldn't explain, but he didn't really need to. He knew that. You know, I just have to do this now. It's time for me. I don't know if it'll turn into anything. Gerald exhaled bitterly. God damn you. There was something a little bit sick in the air. Some sort of sweet, sticky, flowering weed letting go a scent. Turning in on itself beginning to rot. It was cloying. David remembered a lotion his wife had used. His system buckled a little. The pillows at home still smelled of this. Sometimes he was caught off guard. 
They'll kill you, you know. Hmm. Maybe. Be serious. That's what they do. You know this. What kind of trail are you leaving anyhow? Who knows where you are? David sighed. Well, I think you know where I am. Right now, I mean. There's nothing. What you got to protect, to go back to. You gotta have that. If you don't, you might not come back. Christ, Gerald, fuck all that. This is my chance, you know that. Maybe that's why, you know, because I, I don't have that. There's nothing to lose. He pulled his palms to his face, smelling the metal of the chain on his skin. He blinked his eyes forcefully a few times, blurring the stars. Gerald breathed beside him. He'd stopped swaying and brought his feet up to hit the ground with the backs of his heels. I'm jealous, you know. I don't do much of a goddamn thing anymore. It's too late for me. You really think that? Oh, I daydream, but, well, you know, actually, sometimes it stings a lot. Sometimes I have to put my mind off it so I can sleep. Other times it doesn't bother me so much. Then I just kind of accept it. It's okay. Don't go there. Don't do that. Why not? Just don't. He slept fitfully on their pull-out sofa bed. He dreamed he was with his friend. Not Gerald, someone else. In a car. The other man, the friend, was driving. The car was stopped in front of a building with some sort of rounded drive. A hotel, perhaps. There was a commotion on the street. A running back and forth. Someone said, jumper. He's going to jump. Then it seemed like there was no time to react. Or maybe there was. But there was that vacuum. The dream and the expectation. The sinking in mud. Something landed on the car. David got out and moved away from it. Toward the door of the building, whatever it was. He desperately concentrated on the door ahead of him, on not looking back, on not seeing a thing. He could not face what was on the car. A shifting then, he was floating above a large tiled pool room. He could hear the soft scrape of vocal echoes, though he didn't see any people below. The pool itself was black. That is, it was painted black with white sand at the bottom. From where he was, slowly circling near the ceiling, he could see the dark forms of crocodiles curling on the pool floor. He could see humongous starfish moving the points of their stars, displacing puffs of sand. Thin black sharks circled near the surface of the pool, bending gently like the limbs of a tree in wind. He woke in the early morning, easing off the baby blue blanket. It was a stiff, abrasive thing that irritated his skin. Annie tried to get him to sit down for breakfast. He waved it off, hoping it seemed kind and grateful, but it probably did not. Gerald padded, toddler-like, down the hall in pajama pants, rubbing his eyes. David gave them both quick, bracing hugs. He would get there today. The inn he picked out was just outside the mountains, which rose up jaggedly a few miles away. And, of course, it was close to the national park. He thought about the events of what he knew. He imagined the beginning, like any rowdy weekend, The first night was a shaking off, an integrating. The men drank, goofed off, blew off steam. Straws were drawn. There were drunken skits. They donned women's clothing and exaggerated terrible makeup. The shedding of the skin. There wasn't much in that first night, 
which would be Sunday, to indicate what was to come. Though they all knew, of course, that's why they were there. The meeting would last a week. Starting Monday, there would be a period of fasting. Monday, consuming nothing but liquids. Then Tuesday, nothing at all. This was a crucial time, as the men would be ridding themselves of unnecessary things. They would be especially vulnerable, becoming weaker, preparing their bodies and building a deep physical appetite that they would take with them into the next phase and that they could satiate there. David would stay tonight at the inn, maybe tomorrow too, then move further into camp. He would need to find a large open space near the water, the meadow by the river. The order would, historically, erect a wide circle of tents. These were appropriately fitted out with an inclusive variety of amenities, depending on the singular occupant. Each man had his own tent and a personalized approach to getting where he needed to be. David had tried to picture what it looks like, the transforming. He had imagined the pain of it, the moving from one state, one body, to another. Imagining it did no good, he knew, as it gave him nothing, no insight, no advantage or empathy. And it very likely was literally unimaginable, like nothing he could think. There have been accounts by witnesses, which are in their sheer bizarre power, unreplaceable in the brain. Of these, of the perhaps third of them that are even partially reliable, they have a common thread. They seem, that is, the tellers, to have a difficult time themselves describing what goes on with these men, with their bodies. They can't really conceptualize it themselves, let alone convey it for others. They tended to be, as a result of witnessing these things, significantly damaged. Then there are the filmic depictions, which, naturally, one gravitates toward. It being part of the consciousness of modern, civilized life. But again, these are there for certain reasons. But, ultimately, serve nothing. There is the moon, bones breaking and reshaping beneath latex skin. There are the sounds of agony. Clothes fall away. So there is this, a clutch of what he has pieced together, from what he believes. It goes on over a few days, and it's not the hasty, bone-breaking thing you might conclude. This is why, during it, they're vulnerable. They have to be protected. They have a watcher, a guardian, who delegates a layer around the men. Firstly, there's the loose border of the tents, and then the physical border of the protector's bodies. These men also know what to look for in the men they protect, as they are trained to notice signs of unusual distress. The groups are men, certainly. Men with duplicitous natures. Their work, and generally their lives, requires a wolfish nature. Their wives, if there are wives, probably remember early days, younger days of a different sort, when there was fear in the men, when they didn't think they yet knew what they needed to know, when it seemed like their world and everything in them would fly away if the women left their sides. But they had now a wolf's sense of when to show bravado and when to appear gentle when to be a different animal than they are. They learned this, this shape-shifting trait. His mother had always indulged this in her son, his love of mysterious things. She stayed up late at night with him to watch the sensational, hacky documentaries after the local news. 
They were usually about Bigfoot and the Bermuda Triangle and things from outer space. There was always a low-stringed instrument heard in the background for tension. He ate it up. One night, the chupacabra was discussed, the creature mutilating livestock, leaving them bloodless, minus organs, with strange markings on their skin. They described the sightings of the thing, and even had a grave, tired-looking man draw out some of the common traits reported which were admittedly hysterical, random, and few. They all described claws, though, big teeth, and large round eyes like an owl. David remembered the next few nights he could not sleep. He was nestled in a riot of anxiety. Something had struck a chord with him like nothing else, the image of it. It kept stewing in his head, the features growing pronounced, amazingly exaggerated, cartoon-like, beyond the real. The hotel he picked out was just outside the mountains. They rose up jaggedly a few miles away. This place was an affected log structure, though it was painted a dark, unnatural blue. According to the outdated guidebook, The petrified forest nearby was popular. The alpine meadow, the rocky cliffs speckled with white coats. He parked and entered the lobby, trying to take an even stride with his legs stiff from the long drive, trying to relax. On one wall hung a gargantuan moose head, surrounded with a half circle of more diminutive horned things, antelope and deer, He veered for a moment over to the window of a gift shop. Really a glorified little counter with some spinning racks of postcards. Some turquoise jewelry. He spotted a basket on the floor filled with objects for children. Little papooses and rabbit skins. He looked at his watch, fished his phone out of his pocket and peered at it. He approached the desk. He wanted to make sure he was situated correctly. He would need to see a map of the rooms. This request undoubtedly would give him the extra attention he liked to avoid. It would, in fact, ensure his indelibility in the clerk's mind. But he had decided his need for this could not be set aside. He needed to be where he could see the road, the approaching cars. He wanted to have a vantage point. And perhaps it was silly and would come to nothing, but he had to make sure of this for himself. He did manage to wrangle something and even satisfied his stranger more difficult wish that there be people in the next room. He wanted witnesses, just in case. Though this was not the thick of tourist season, it was waning and the inn was not full. But he still thought he could lean on and draw comfort from that extra layer of prohibition. Basically, bluntly, if the order caught on to him, discovered him and tried to stop him, it would be, at the very least, more difficult for them. His room was done in earth tones and had a hewn, faux rustic feel. Log cabin meets something gentle and Midwestern. The art above the bed was a photograph, which seemed unusual. He peered at it. It was an old picture of some people standing on a dock. There were suitcases and hats. They were looking over to the side at something off camera. A boat approaching, one would assume. He went out to the car twice more. His shoes crunched on gravel. The sky was going to dusk. Back in the room, he placed his fishing gear prominently near the little table, under the hanging lamp. The camping gear, too. The recording gear he tucked into the closet and slid the door shut. He folded back the rough bedspread. He knew what was involved there. Embedded bio-concerns too deep in the quilting for any detergent to tease out. He sat on the bed for a while, 
trying to tune into his breathing, trying to resist his usual first action inside any hotel room, which was to go for the television. Instead, he went to the bathroom and stared at his face in the mirror. He splashed water on it and patted it dry, blowing slightly out of the sides of his mouth. He tried to give his eyes a steely resolve, to move very slightly, imperceptibly, the muscles around his lips. He woke in the middle of the night and was not sure why. It felt sudden. He blinked in the dark. Listen. He got up, leaving the lights off, and went shakily to the peephole. The hall looked puffed and blurry, but nothing was visible. He watched for a minute. It did come again, some kind of a scraping noise, a rattling. Okay, he thought. Do it. Just do it fast. He opened the door and looked down the hall to the right. There was the small box of a room several doors down glowing softly from soda dispensers. Oh, Christ. The goddamn ice machine. He went back to bed and turned the television on with a sound so imperceptibly low he had to strain to hear it. It competed with the sound of his heartbeat, gently moving in his ear against the pillow. In the morning... He took some fishing gear out to the car. He didn't fish, not really. He'd obtained this gear cheaply, under close inspection by someone who knew what there was to see. This would be apparent. But he had tried to weather it, to immerse it in dirty water, knock it around a bit for the possibility of such an inspection. He knew how to make it grubby, make it believable. Damned if he would be caught on the road with a pristine, unclouded flybox, an unused fishing pole with a clean cork grip. Back in the room, he made a soft styrofoam cup of gentle coffee with a small machine on the desk. He tumbled white creamer powder in it and stirred inefficiently with a weird little straw. He went to the window, looked at the mountains beyond. Then he turned his sights closer, scouring the parking lot. The morning was muddy blue, and the lot held about eight cars besides his. Three of them, he noted, were red. The edges of the lot faded slowly, disappearing into green growth. He dressed and went downstairs again. He stopped by the lobby and selected a slightly green banana from a basket and chose from a grouping of various granola bars. He didn't linger there, but kept moving. He did take another cup of coffee, another styrofoam cup. This one breathed heat and it bent in his hand. When he opened the front door, he sloshed a tan cascade over his knuckles. He shook out his scalded fingers. He drove in toward the eastern boundary of the park, thinking of where this was, how it looked on the map. He was going right into the mouth of it, of the animal. They would need to be near a road, and near water as well. He drove along a creek that swelled fat and grew thin, a new thing around each curve. For a time, he thought he'd lost it. A thin, rocky stretch of it darted away into the trees. It did come back, though, grayer, darker than before. He wondered how deep it got, if light reached the floor. There was a big river set back from here, not seen from the road. This is where he needed to go. After a while, he tried one of the small dirt roads that turned off the main. There were many of them, and they were easy to miss. They were almost camouflaged. Unless you were looking for them hard, they didn't exist. He slowed to look. But they didn't seem right somehow. They seemed to veer off in the wrong direction or stop. Or it wasn't then a road he saw, just a hollow in the brush. 
he tried another. This road turned sharply and went right over to the creek. It seemed for a moment he would drive right in. Then it curved, and a small bridge appeared. It was so narrow, he wondered what would happen if two cars came along, crossing from opposite sides. After the bridge, it started following the creek back, moving east. He took the rough road slow, fearful of damage and noise. Then the road turned again, away, in. He drove in like this for about a mile, then pulled over to the side of the gravel road and got out. He looked down the steep embankment, down at a surprising expanse of rock. There was a lovely plank of flat stone extending under the water, where it was still visible, thinly covered by it, where it shimmered mineral-like before a jagged drop. He did a strange thing then. He lifted his head and smelled the air. This wasn't the place, not the road leading to them. Too picturesque, maybe, too likely to draw people. He wasn't sure, of course, and he'd caught nothing with his nose. But he wanted to try another direction. He realized he might be out here all day, floundering around. That would have to be okay. He got back in the car. After awkwardly turning around, he went back the way he came. He reached the paved road again and looked from side to side, like a child being reminded to do so, an exaggerated gesture. He could not see far. He made the left, continuing inward, west, going toward the park. He passed rocks climbing higher on his right, cragging up over the trees. It gave him a sinking sensation, like he was submerging, becoming mute, overtaken. The creek had disappeared somewhere behind him. His eye caught a thinning in the harsh green growth. Another road. The opening to it was soft. About 50 feet in, there was a dilapidated gate, long pushed open and held there. Any rigid fencing extended from it had disappeared. He pictured it dissolved, the ground swallowing it up. He stopped the car got out. Around the area of this gate, the dirt was a bit more exposed, covered less by small rocks or grass, and he could see some mud there. He walked closer to it. It had been freshly driven on. A lot. There was actually a small puddle here, and it bled now up on either side of it, the water pushed by tires. He got back in the car. He thought for a moment. His breath was beginning to sag in the middle, like a plank repeatedly moistened with rain. He drove back to the road and continued. He just wanted to see. He wasn't sure. He wanted to see something else. What else was nearby? In a few minutes, he found it. The something. There was an intersection up ahead where two other paved roads branched off. There was also a small store there, off the highway to the right. There was a house next to it, with log sculptures spread over the lawn, three rusted bus casings to the side of it and to the back. Weeds rained. A dampness took his hands. He turned into the lot, which was just a wide circle of flattened gravel. He drove slow up to the front of the store. It had a big window in front with a sort of haphazard display of fishing items. There were some construction paper fish pasted onto a background of blue. Some poles were displayed. A catch basket hung. The building itself was painted a peeling, graying white. There was a porch of sorts made from boards, he sat there for a moment, then went inside. The bell over the door announced him. A man behind the counter turned and nodded. Hey there, he said. How's the day treating you? He looked to be about 60, with a thick mess of hair and a beard to match. 
it didn't appear to be going away. It's that the entirety of it was wan, sand-hued, colorless. Oh, hey, fair to Midland. He strode to the coolers on the back wall and walked back and forth before them. What could he need? He picked a six-pack of beer. On the way back, he collected a bag of potato chips and stopped at the cooler of bait up front. He picked out some pale crickets. He went to the counter. I hear they're biting, said the man. Hope so. Trying to get a couple good days in. You stand nearby? I am. The man nodded as he fussed with the register. It was an old one with decals and stickers all over it. You here alone or with a group? A group, David thought. Now, why would he ask that? Oh, just me this time, he replied. He smiled. Well, thank you kindly and good luck out there. Bag today? Nah. David went back to the car. He was close, very close. He turned around. He drove back the way he came. He passed the car driving west. It was long and a shiny, rich black. Then another, a mile or so later. This car looked like a similar make. A lighter color, a sort of beige or bronze, but with darkened windows. David thought the cars might be going to the house with the sculptures near the little store. Maybe some allies there in that house. Some reinforcements. He found the patch of road again, the one with a gate, opening like a little mouth, though he nearly missed it, as it looked so different from the other side. He turned in. He was trying to will his heart slow, to stop its quick running. He began instinctually to affect a look on his face. The way he did this was to think of the situation he was claiming to be in. The person he would claim he was. He was a fisherman and was not sure where he was going. He put some friendly strain on his face, the bewildered look of the lost. He moved his head from side to side, squinting a bit. His brow furrowed. He cultivated a mask of confusion. The dirt road curved. Through the trees he could see more trees, their thin, tall skeletons, some richly covered with green fur, some bare like a bone. It was a teasing kind of growth that gave flashes, burst the sky through the branches, and you thought that you could just barely, just sometimes, see something there. The thick ground cover looked wet and riddled with fern. The plants here had the enthusiasm of the years following a killing fire. All life jumping ahead. Brazen. As he eased around the next bend, he found someone walking. David wasn't sure if he was expecting this or not. A man. The man stepped to the side, into the abrupt green. He was dressed darkly, the detail obscured. Just then David noticed how little light was actually getting through here. How the trees made it quite dark. David slowed and steered slightly away from him. His mind raced. What did he do now? Stop? The man was on the right side, the passenger side. No, not yet. He felt if he stopped now, if he asked directions to some place, the man would surely point him back to the main road. He needed to go further. It was too early. He would wait until the next obstacle, and he was starting to know there would be another, and soon. As he passed, David brought his hand up in a wave. He saw the pale shock of a face turned toward him. When the car had passed, the man stepped out into the middle of the road. He stood there, watching him drive away. He kept going, kept his speed steady. I am working off some incomplete directions. I am looking for the river. 
The road descended. Up ahead, he could make out a clearing of some sort, a widening. He slowed to a near stop. Someone tapped a knuckle on his window. His nerves jumped. A man about 60 or so was there, his face smooth and strong-boned. He wore a spotless, unwrinkled plaid shirt. He removed sunglasses. Christ, here we go. He put on a smile with threads of gratefulness. He fumbled for the button. Help you, son? Son. Wow. Puts me in my place right away. Hope so, said David. He then noticed there were two men, not one. The other man stood behind the first one, back a few feet. That one looked younger. He wore a vest, and his chin seemed to recede back into the collar toward his neck. They waited, the two men, for him to say the next thing. Okay, I'll play it. I have no choice anyway. Where the hell is Torp's Ponds? I thought I could get over to it from one of these roads. Been trying for an hour. The men looked off to the side. The older one spoke. Well, this isn't the road. Which way you come from? East. I'm staying with a buddy in Turnersville. He pointed quickly, vaguely, behind him to the back seat where the fishing gear was. Careful. Thought I'd take the day. Can't say I've made too much of it so far. Been driving around like a damn fool. The man by his window turned to the other one for a second, then looked up above into the trees. It was a slow gesture, meant to convey that Though he was surely about to set David straight, he was in no particular hurry to do so. Well, I think he got off the main road too early. The man in back, the younger one, moved up. They were both at his window now. David looked from one to the other. Turnersville, you say? Asked the second guy. He waited a blink. Yeah, he couldn't read them. Well, yeah. You need to turn back and get onto the main road, then take a right. Go. How far is it, Ed? The older one shrugged one shoulder a little. No, no. Ten miles, maybe. Twelve. You'll see a bridge. David needed to back away now, he felt it. A bridge. He had to accept this small defeat. He thanked the men. They moved off the road, allowing him to turn around awkwardly with a series of forward and back motions. Well, they didn't so much let him do this as made him. They ensured with their presence that he would drive no further, that he would stop right there. He found his way back to the paved road. There was no sign of the first man, the one he'd passed. He felt a funny thing happen to the muscles in his face. He rode the last slope of the adrenaline as it cooled. Though it was not really gone, his circuits were fried. His hands shook. He separated somewhat on the drive back, calming himself from the outside. He had one more night in the hotel. He got his maps and compass and laid them out. He would camp tomorrow somewhere close to where he had gone today, where the men had been. On this night, David permitted himself to enjoy some pleasures. He ordered room service. They brought him an overpriced roast beef sandwich, a bottle of overpriced wine. He watched the world news for evidence of bigger things, of large intention, of bravery. He drank the wine hungrily. He then dove into the other channels, wanting to get a last fix of terrible people. After a while, he thought he should set up the camera. He cleared off the table and placed the camera in front of it. He turned it on and sat, folding his hands in front of him. He spoke. Tomorrow, I'm going to try to find them. I don't know what will happen, but... I think today I found where to go. 
I went down a road, and all of a sudden there were three men all descending on me, trying to keep me from continuing. I had the distinct feeling I was approaching the nest. I'm going to try to get there from another side and see what I can get. Hopefully I can record something. He put a map on the table and tried to smooth it out with his palm. He picked it up and pointed to it, tried to describe where he was going. Then he stopped. He wanted to say something meaningful. What did he want to say exactly? He tried to continue to talk through it. Tonight I'm feeling afraid. I feel like this could be the last thing I do. If I don't make it back, I hope at least this tape is found and serves as evidence of my efforts. I don't have a computer with me. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but I don't trust some things. I think I can be tracked through it. I could be traced. I don't think they know about me, but I guess I don't know. As I've gotten older, my ideas of good and evil have changed. Nothing is that easy, I know, but we can't let the order be. It can't be allowed to make the rules. If they kept to themselves even, or if they weren't greedy, if they weren't bending the laws of nature, he stopped. They're killing people now, hunting people. When they change, when they turn into wolves, they get to hunt. He pushed himself back against the chair. The table tipped forward alarmingly toward the camera. An unfortunate thing, a clumsy thing, considering what he felt himself about to say next. Joanna, I hope you're happy. I really do. I'm sorry forever. I love you. He turned the camera off. He needed to call her his ex-wife. He knew on some level that this was a mistake, but he rejected it. He called her on the hotel phone. Expensive, but he thought he was dying. The phone rang, and then her strange, pretty voice asked him to leave a message. She used her new last name. He breathed once and hung up. He dreamed about her. There was a building which, in the beginning, was the place where he taught school. He recognized the hall and the deep brown edges of doors, lockers nestled in the toothpaste white of the walls. He was talking to a class, holding a book, waving it around. Not like him, really. He usually didn't hold such confidence in the required text. On the cover of this book was a dog. Something moved in the hall, and he looked over toward the doorway. He jumped as she leaped suddenly by. It looked like a joke, this jump by the door, but he didn't think it was funny at all. It scared him. In the dream, he knew she must have come from the basement, from the attic, some storage area of the building where she could hide, could curl up. He pictured her there, folding into a corner. So small it was like her bones were broken, if she had bones anymore. There was a time Joanna had fallen off a ladder in their backyard. Her heel slipped and she fell backward, pulling the ladder over on top of her. She broke her collarbone. He remembered how we could see the shape there, the wrong shape of it, and he tried to keep her face lifted upward. Tried to stop her looking in the car mirror on the way to the hospital. This exposure, this seeing the body naked like this, was a mistake, he felt. He felt it would shatter something in her mind that had to be held up, a certain structure. In the morning, he moved quickly. He was probably afraid not to, to slow down and let the anxiety pool in his chest. He checked his equipment, his camera and recorder. 
nestling them into their cases like eggs. He had a gun, too. A small handgun his friend taught him to use. They'd gone out in a field, and they shot at slabs of wood balanced on a card table. He also brought a flare gun, which he wasn't at all sure about. Wasn't sure in what circumstance he would use it. He drove in, like the day before, toward the park. He chose one of the roads he tried yesterday, the earlier ones, the ones he dismissed. There was the one he tried first, the one that he rejected. He stuck with this one today. He drove up an incline, which was, for a substantial moment, treacherously steep. He thought even of stopping, of reversing, but didn't think he could. The car went up. He gripped the wheel. When it leveled out, he stopped and looked around. There were wild trees with weird purple leaves above him. He got the idea, in that instant he saw them, that they were gorged on blood. He drove beneath them, mesmerized. He found a place after a while. He unpacked the tent and struggled with it, trying to find the flattest point. His muscles seized and squelched. His hand went involuntarily to his low back. He squinted at the sloping pines. He thought they were over there, to the west. The river was there, and the small lake. The late morning had passed, and it was early afternoon. A breeze had come up, and he wondered about his scent if it was traveling to them, if they were able yet to catch it. The spot he had found was just off the ending of the dirt road, where it widened into a circle. It looked like an area meant for camping, at least at one time. There was a cement table and a little water pump. He tried it. It didn't work. The handle was rusted and immobile. He left most things in the car and kept it locked. He arranged his sleeping bag and pillow in the tent. He wasn't sure what to do now, what the next step was, and was suddenly very tired. He needed to lie down or try to think. He stretched out on his back. The ground seemed welcoming only for the first minute or so, when it was still finding the limits of the mat, the soft of the bag. Then it got to his bones. He thought of the upcoming night of the impossibility of sleep. He tried, for just a few minutes, to shut his mind off, to clear it. He'd flirted with meditation some years ago, and there was something he remembered and tried sometimes, when his body seemed far away from him, to be suffering alone. He tuned into his skeleton, imagined its strength, its capacity to hold him together. Then he imagined his muscles, the softer tissue holding tension, and tried to get them to let go, to yield, to allow the bones on the firm ground to do the work. If he could not stop his nervous mind right now, at least he could try to calm his body. He set up his camera, positioning it just inside the opening of the tent facing out. He sat on a small folding chair. I've made camp near the meeting, or hopefully near enough that I can approach the meeting place. The order is here. I've seen enough to be sure. Nothing concrete, of course. Nothing I can prove yet. No evidence as such. But this obviously is minimized by the great efforts of its overseers and attendants. But believe me, I've had plenty of signs indicating activity. Prior to this, I had numerous and extended conferences with anonymous sources. Over the next couple of days, I'm going to try to get close enough to film. I'm not sure right now how close I'll be able to get. Moreover, I don't have great equipment, but I need to use what I have. I'm working on my own 
with a small budget and limited resources. But, that said, I do believe I can come away with some material powerful enough to overcome these hindrances. David stopped filming. He thought of the hat he was putting on already for a vague, invisible audience. He would try to be that, to be that man. He would try to scrape it up. He wanted to go, wanted to see, wanted to take what he could of what he had come for. He got some things together, some water, a flashlight, his recording devices. He had tried to keep the bag as light as possible, but he needed to have these with him. The plan for right now was just to head toward them, perhaps get a path mapped in some way. There was daylight left. He knew night brought its protections, but he didn't know the ground here, didn't know the way. And come night, there would be wolves. Again, he caught the swell of his feeling, this fear of deep ineptitude. He took hold of it, tried to quiet it, much like one would an animal, a small one or a baby. He also put a gun in the bag. Starting out was difficult. He knew there would be nothing resembling a path, so any way he chose would be slow going. He stepped carefully. The brush was thick and green, with a tough, bone-like undergrowth. He looked up. Through tangling layers of branches, he could see the odd shard of sky. Some birds were making crying sounds back and forth from somewhere he could not see, could not orient. He moved through the ground cover, which had mercifully smoothed and become easier to navigate. He remembered old things. One summer, what age he was, he didn't know. But he remembered how he was trying on things, like many children do. He was trying on personality hats, obsession hats. He was fascinated with treasures then, the ideas that Books give you about hidden treasure buried in some spot. He tried drawing primitive maps, wondering subconsciously if he could will one into being, a secret bounty, buried somewhere nearby. He liked that it could be anywhere, hidden, languishing because its bearers or retrievers were killed. David now supposed it was more the mystery and the hunt than the actual concept of riches, which to a child is a vision displaced. As a child, not fatigued yet by daily traps, has a delirious, incomplete idea of the reliefs that money can bring. One summer as well, maybe it had been that particular one, he tried to dig to China. He wore his mother's gloves which were pink and light green. They were canvas and had little white grip dots along the fingers and thumb, circling the palm. He went out to the backyard, to their modest, underused garden. He dug clumsily with a shovel and moved the dirt aside. And if his mother was irritated by this, she did not say anything. She just let him go. She must have known he would give up eventually when the displaced soil slid back into the hole, or when he hit the firm layer of compressed dirt that turned into rock some feet down. But she said nothing, just watched him out the window, noting his increasingly frequent pauses where he sat and put his hand down into the tiny pit he'd created, measuring the space on his arm, his most familiar ruler. He kept going northwest, stopping frequently to listen to sounds. He heard things, leaves shifting in wind, the clicking of insects in brush, the crying birds and some dozen others with different sounds, like moaning or bells. His nose was going wild here. One moment he smelled a dry clay smell, 
the next a wet green moss. The ground was sloping down. He felt his legs fighting to stabilize as he descended. He thought of how long he had been walking and how much light he really did have. He was starting to think he should go back. Ahead, at the bottom of the hill, the trees stopped. He recalled suddenly the road where he encountered the men. What happened to it just beyond where they'd stopped him? It had also descended and flattened out, the edge of a field. He kept going to the end of the trees. He slowed, looked. There was a wide expanse of tall grass, no signs of men or tents. About a mile away, off to the left, was a jutting hill. The field continued around it, beyond. Over to the right of the clearing, a little farther than the hill, he could see a grouping of trees, and they had a different shape, not pines. The way they lined up, in a wall shape, it looked like maybe the river was there. He needed to go over there, go up the hill, and look down. But it was too far. He was losing the day. He couldn't afford it. He needed the light to get back. He struggled with this, but then thought of tomorrow. He had his path. David turned around. He would have to go back up the incline. He took off his pack for a minute and leaned over carefully, trying to pull out the tension in his lower back. He took a drink of water. Looking up the incline into the trees, he could see now that the light was changing. He had to get going. He'd been working his way back up the incline when the air seemed different. There was a smell, a broad sulfur odor, and then he heard the flies. Just to his right, not really hidden, but next to the large trunk of a tree, was a huge mound of entrails. Shock took his whole body with lightning speed, He stumbled. His hand flew up to his mouth. He moved himself away from it a few steps and turned around. He tried to take hold of himself. He made himself use his ears. He could hear nothing. No movement except for the flies. He had to deal with this. He had to record it. He took his pack off again and removed the camera. His hands shook. He walked back over to it. The pile spread out four or five feet. He couldn't take it all in. He put the camera to his eye. He did not want to talk yet. He would do that later when he got back to camp. He still felt the instinct to be quiet here. He used the light on the camera. Through the lens, it was difficult to see detail. He adjusted the focus. There were not just entrails, but other organs, too. Though we could not tell what they were, as they held a little color still, but no shape. He wondered about the scale. He didn't think he could pick out, visually, human insides from, say, a deer's. He walked around the pile silently, filming. His shirt was damp with sweat. He realized he had been blushing violently and felt a coolness as the blood drained rapidly away from his face. Flies scattered and reconvened, moving over the feast. He made it back before dark, but barely. He sat on the trunk of his car for a moment, listening again. He fished for his keys and got his lantern out of the car. He crawled in his tent with the camera bag and zipped shut the door. It felt stupidly prophylactic, as it would only really keep out bugs. On the camera, he watched the footage he had shot. It was tough to see with the weak light, but it was there. It was what he had. He positioned the lantern and camera at himself. 
Today I walk toward the area where I believe the order to be. I made camp and walked toward the river, but I didn't have enough daylight, so I had to turn around. When I did that, I found he didn't know what to say. I should have collected some of it, I'm sure, but, but I didn't. He looked down in his hand. He can talk about that now. Tomorrow I'm going back. I know where they are. He moved objects around in the tent, forcing himself to ingest something. He drank a bottle of water, ate a granola bar, and crawled into the back seat of the car. He took his bottle of whiskey out and put it in next to him on the floor, along with the gun and the flashlight. He unfurled his sleeping bag all the way so that it was a quilt shape, and he got under it, curling onto his side. He left the tent up. He couldn't sleep outside. Not now. David was becoming confused. He knew only that he wanted to want to sleep. Of course, he had known about the fear. He had thought about it ahead of time. He'd not been completely positive of the timing of its arrival or the strength with which it would appear. But he could not have fathomed what it would be like. It would have been impossible. So he could, in no real way, prepare for it. There was nothing he could have done. He must have fallen asleep sometime. Or if not sleep, his body and mind must have entered a place of limbo, of holding, of keeping him preserved. Sometime in the night, the movement he waited to hear did arrive. And instead of it being soft, building over minutes, it was swift and bold. He pulled up slightly, just enough to see the gray top of the tent get pulled violently down. All around, coming from all sides, they were moving. There were no words, just their collected breath, just the flickering over the light of the moon. As they came to the car, he scrambled for the gun next to him. The air seemed to change, to be pushed in all directions. It was as if he were set upon by a great flapping flock of birds.